there's something about the stealth genre of video games that has always piqued my interest. You've got games that use stealth occasionally to liven up their experiences, you've got ones that avoid it entirely, and then you've got ones where staying covert is the main mechanic, the main draw. Nowadays, we think of games like Hitman, where you go through scenarios dressing up in numerous costumes and navigating these tight nooks and crannies to eventually reach and eliminate your target. But the genre goes way back, even before home consoles were a thing. They may not have popularised the stealth genre, but I think it's important to see where these foundations were set up, to see what aspects inspired the games we cite as being the most important stealth games of our time. And the first game that really comes to my mind in terms of sneaking around in the past will always be Pac-Man. It's obviously not a full-blown stealth game, but it definitely has elements which feed into the genre. Toro Iwatani, the designer of Pac-Man, created the game as a response to some of the more visceral experiences which were being released at the time. Hilarious to think about today, considering these violent experiences he would have been referring to are games like Space Invaders. But you can see in the way Pac-Man works, it definitely stays true to its word. It's a game primarily focused on evasion. You aren't given the option to fully avoid the ghosts, considering how they're always aware of your position in the small box grid we're placed in. But the idea is to stay away from them as you pick up the pellets from around the level. The main point is to not engage in any kind of combat, at least not until you pick up one of the power pellets, where you can then go after the ghosts and gobble them up. Somewhat going against the violence element the game was trying to avoid, but comparing this process to a game like Hitman, the foundation is still pretty similar when you boil it down. You're trying to lie low and avoid the threats until you get the right opportunity, where you can then pounce on your targets before going back to lying low again. Pac-Man was released in 1980, but there were games even earlier than this which have been referred to as the first examples of a stealth video game, the earliest of which I'm aware of was a game developed by Hiroshi Suzuki for the Commodore PET, referred to as Manbiki Shonen, or rather Shoplifting Boy. The concept is obvious from the title of the game, you're a boy who's trying to shoplift from a convenience store, and the only thing which stands in your way is the clerk which can be seen wandering around. In practice, it's a game very similar to Pac-Man in many ways. Instead of pellets placed around a maze-like level, you're collecting dollars signs from the different rows in the store, where if you collect everything without being caught, you complete the level, and if you're discovered, the police take you away. The big difference here though, which surprisingly a lot of stealth type games end up avoiding in the near future from this point, is that the game doesn't work on actually being caught, instead merely being seen by the store clerk results in your failure. That element alone does make me think this game is the first true stealth game. It's not merely about avoiding a threat, but you've actively got to stay out of their line of sight. Your presence in the building can't be acknowledged at any point. Suzuki ended up presenting this game to the game developer Taito, in which they pretty much used the game's core mechanics for their game Lupin the Third, which was released in arcades in 1980. A game which still has us collecting up money bags, but slightly misses the mark in terms of the enemy's functionalities. Being seen no longer has a fail state, and the guy with the stick that we can see wandering around is almost always aware of our position. Compared to Shoplifting Boy, this is a game that's more in line with Pac-Man, which we saw release earlier that same year. So despite Lupin the Third and Pac-Man being far wider releases of a game that could be thought of as stealth, Shoplifting Boy was still the only one that had true consequences for actually being discovered, something I think is vital for any stealth game. Outside of that, you're merely looking at some kind of cat and mouse game at best. Finally, I want to touch on a game released by Sega, referred to as 005, being an obvious spin on the codename of another covert operator, 007, otherwise known as James Bond. The Guinness Book of World Records refers to this as the first stealth game ever created, which as we've just seen is blatantly untrue, but what we see presented here definitely pushes the stealth medium forward in terms of video games. Games. This game's a lot more ambitious than any of the previous ones we've touched on, with there being a central hub that we get placed in by a helicopter, which allows us to enter one of many warehouses. Just like Castle Wolfenstein presented, with its multiple different rooms we enter, all of which vary in terms of their layouts, 005 has two different types of buildings which have slight differences to liven up the experiences. First of which is the warehouse areas, which fantastically uses the idea of darkness to more explicitly show the enemy's cones of vision, having their flashlights let the player know exactly what direction they're looking, and how far they can see in that direction. Combat is also featured here, in terms of the gun we can use to take out enemies, but is also featured in the helicopter sections, where we have to fend off against another helicopter dropping down missiles from above. The important thing to observe there being that just because the game's based around staying hidden, doesn't mean the entire experience also has to adhere to that. Livening up an experience may also mean that you have to break certain foundations at points to achieve an effect that would otherwise not be possible. And considering we've just talked about a game that has clear inspiration from the character 
James Bond. Let's now head into what we'll be focusing on for the endurance of this video, that being the most well-known stealth series ever created, Metal Gear. The series is heralded as one of the best gaming franchises of all time, with the series director, Hideo Kojima, being referred to as one of the true auteurs in the gaming landscape, and the reason for that becomes very clear when looking into Kojima's past. From a young age, Kojima found himself fascinated by films and film production, with his first aspiration in terms of his career not being anything revolved around games, but instead films, hoping that some of his fictional creative writing would eventually lead way to directorial opportunities in the future. However, since this ended up not going to plan, he instead turned his attention to game development, aiming to be a game designer for the company Konami, attaching to this publisher in particular due to it being the only one which was listed on the Japanese stock exchange. There was only one problem though, Kojima was placed on the MSX division of the company, the MSX being a home computer developed by the ASCII Corporation, which was especially popular in countries like Japan. Kojima wasn't a fan of the MSX due to its very restrictive colour palette compared to other consoles at the time, like the NES, but he eventually ended up making his video game debut with the game Penguin Adventure, where he took on the role as an assistant designer. And looking at the game, the only inspiration I can see garnered by future projects are games like Subway Surfers. This is literally identical to those kinds of running games. There's nothing here that we can really pinpoint as being distinctly Kojima, obviously. He was still finding his footing in the company, and hadn't been given the chance to work on something that he was truly passionate about. And although one of his own projects, known as Lost World, was cancelled due to it apparently being too complex to run on the MSX, Kojima was instead told to take over another project from one of his associates, that being a game referred to as Metal Gear. That's right, although Metal Gear and Kojima are synonymous at this point, Kojima wasn't actually the one to birth the idea, instead taking over the project and channeling his own vision into it. Firstly, it's important to note that I'm playing on the Metal Gear Solid 3 versions of both Metal Gear 1 and 2, with me not having access to an actual MSX computer, and MSX emulation not being as convenient. I'm recording the ports of the first two Metal Gears on the Metal Gear Solid HD collection for the Xbox 360. There's nothing that's substantially different to be honest, but there are things like certain character models which can be seen between both games which differ at points. Most other aspects are pretty much identical to their original releases though. Starting from the menu screen, we can see straight away we've jumped very far back to a point in the past, where games were still basically weaning themselves off the stigma of money-grabbing arcade machines. No kind of music, no interesting visuals, just a straight silent black screen with the title, which I've always found interesting. Not many arcade machines had actual menus, instead constantly showing a demo on the screen to further entice people to spend their money. In terms of any aspects about this game we can garner before hitting play, the instructions do almost nothing in this regard, merely telling us the controls and nothing else. This was much different for the actual MSX release of the game, which which featured a highly detailed manual, laying out certain key details which either get glossed over in the game or are merely talked about like the player should already be familiar with them. For example, in the opening conversation we have with Big Boss, we're told about our mission briefly, and are told to infiltrate the compound, make contact with Grey Fox, and destroy the ultimate weapon, Metal Gear. That's all the information we get in-game, but looking to the manual, we see that the character we're playing as, that being Solid Snake, is part of a special operations unit referred to as Foxhound. This immediately gives more context to the stealth gameplay, merging the game's mechanics and story very well. We have to avoid discovery at all costs, because the operation we're embarking on is one that should never be known by the general public. In the manual, we also discover that enemy base referred to as Outer Heaven in-game isn't merely a base, but an actual nation that's now been established in South Africa, with the aforementioned Grey Fox being another member of Foxhound, who was sent in before us and eventually lost contact when encountering the titular Metal Gear. Once again, we wouldn't have actually known about Grey Fox's significance, or even our location if it wasn't for this manual, so I'm glad there's still copies online that can be sorted out. Jumping into the actual game though, we'll try not to get too ahead of ourselves in relation to all the elements which are introduced here, but let's just say a surprising amount of things we see in this game are carried over to essentially all of the Metal Gear games, this sentiment being shown off immediately, with the first thing we're made to do being to listen to a radio conversation between Solid Snake and Big Boss. Big Boss is set up as almost our guidance throughout the game, being rather limited in terms of the interactions we have with him over the radio calls, but still giving us some important tips along the way in regards to certain equipment we pick up, and scenarios we're placed in. As you saw when I was talking about the manual, Big Boss's initial call with us gives a basic rundown about what our objectives are, that being to infiltrate Outer Heaven, locate Grey Fox, and destroy Metal Gear. And upon ending the radio call, Snake climbs into the compound and the iconic Metal Gear music starts up. It 
something which started off fantastic, but due to its almost constant playing during the entire game's runtime, inevitably ends up with it becoming pretty stale by the end. Heading into the second room reveals a few things, the immediate one being the sudden call sound that we receive from our radio. this informing us that someone's attempting to get in contact, which we can either answer or ignore. The first time, I'd say definitely answer it, as you could potentially be skipping over details which will notify you on where to go or what to do next. But you'll find that in cases like this first example, these more optional radio calls which require you to actually answer them end up repeating themselves every time you enter the room again, being quite a pointless and annoying addition overall. Considering as well that although I mentioned how they can guide you to your next key objective, there's also plenty others which don't inform us on anything significant at all. Something else we can witness when entering the compound is the lethality of our enemies being reflected in our environment. From the outside, we saw several tanks lined up in a row, which could hypothetically be a scare tactic to dissuade anyone from attempting to enter, much like we do. But then, actually heading inside, we see there's even more tanks lying around, and what we can assume is crates of weaponry and ammunition piled up on each other. Even though tanks aren't something we're commonly going up against, having these sorts of weaponry be the first thing we see here makes the player feel even more out of their depth, something which only gets further reinforced forced when encountering the hostiles here. These first two rooms we enter are almost like a testing area for the player to become accustomed with the movement. Luckily, despite quite a few elements of this game seeming outdated, the movement is definitely not one of them. In terms of running around, you've got your typical right, left, up, down control scheme, with no kind of diagonal movement, which is fine considering how the game's laid out overall. Outside of the movement, we have buttons to open our two inventory screens, one of which being for our equipment and the other being for our weapons. We also have a separate button push to use our weaponry and another one for a standard punch. That's it. The most important thing I'd like to point out in this regard is the convenience of having two inventory screens. Well, somewhat of a convenience. It might sound initially cumbersome, but ends up persisting throughout most of the Metal Gear entries in the future because how it works with certain Metal Gear conventions. Key cards are something we use a lot in this game, which reflects both the best and worst aspects of the inventory system here. At its best, you're running away and firing at enemies with both a gun and key card equipped, and instead of having to switch out your gun for a key card, you've already got it equipped in the other slot so you can open the door, thus not slowing down the gameplay and also not leaving us open to any unnecessary damage. But then there's the flip side to that in the fact there's also multiple kinds of key cards for numerous different doors, which as the game goes on presents a mind-numbingly annoying issue where you never know what key card to actually use for each door, considering all the doors never actually inform you of what key card they need. Well, that's unless you want to go real old school and start drawing out maps and noting down which doors you need to come back to with higher tier key cards, but that's not something I personally wanted to do while playing a game. Heading up or right presents us with some enemies, giving us a good chance to look at both the stealth and loud combat of the game. Much like many other Metal Gear titles to come, we start the game off with no equipment whatsoever, with the phrase OSP or on-site procurement actually originating from the Metal Gear series. This referring to the idea that by bringing no equipment with us to the mission, there's no chance of having anything traced back to America, which is where Solid Snake's being sent from. A detail that seems important merely for gameplay reasons in these earlier titles, due to there being an overall lack of any substantial narrative here, but it's definitely an idea that becomes a lot more prescient when the series begins focusing on and breaking down certain real-world conflicts, which have shown countries reportedly employing these same kinds of tactics. Ones which aren't only disrespectful to the soldier by essentially leaving them for dead if anything goes wrong, but also leaves whatever invading country that's doing this blameless. So it's up to us to acquire the equipment ourselves, and with no direct information about where we should actually head, the players made to roam about by themselves for a while. In which I should add, these first two Metal Gear games seem to have more in common with games like Zelda compared to anything else, at least to begin with. I mean that in the sense there's more reliance on the player to remember things and figure out where to go. It's not like Mario, where we start in one place, travel to the end, and then go to the next level. This game is like an interconnected, weaving maze at points, which despite being interesting in terms of expansive and open level design at this point, definitely hasn't aged well. I haven't been this confused playing a game for a while. But taking a step back and looking at the enemies for a second, from the first area we enter, heading up or right presents us with a group of enemies, which as we can see have AI that is fine tailored to the environments they've been placed in. So for example, heading into the area on the right has two soldiers which are always walking up when entering, the one on the left looking down after he's reached the top, and the one on the right looking right. Then looking to the room above, this one has slightly more options depending on where you enter the room from. Entering from below has one guard in the middle and one at the top. Entering from the right hand side has one in the middle and one at the bottom, and entering from the top has the same effect. I think there's a good blend of switch 
switching things up while also staying familiar here. Observing the guards' behaviours when entering the room for the first time will render them entirely predictable upon entering that area from the same direction in the future. I'm not saying the player will remember their movements beat for beat, but you know what I mean. Once you see it enough times, you will remember it. But as we can see, certain areas also adapt to where the player's coming from. Not just changing the positions of the enemies, but also changing where they walk, giving you a higher chance to be detected if you're not familiar with their patterns. Overall, the guards themselves are pretty basic. They wander around each individual section in a set pattern, and occasionally turn swiftly in certain directions while standing still to catch the player off guard, almost like they're quickly looking over their shoulder before continuing their route. That's about the best way I could see these guys pulled off considering the technical restrictions that Kojima was facing with the MSX. I'm not expecting any kind of dynamic AI system at this point, which will naturally adapt to your actions in the future. It's the basic kind of detection we saw from previous games like Shoplifting Boy. If they're looking in a particular direction, you better be out of their gaze or hiding behind some cover, otherwise you're getting spotted. There are some slight inconsistencies which permeate for the endurance of the game. Things like guards not noticing you when you're obviously standing right in front of them because you're just a tad out of their field of vision, or having certain points where avoiding the guards is completely unavoidable, which kind of destroys the whole stay hidden at all costs aspect of the game. But on the whole, they're pretty good. It's not just their walking and looking patterns you've got to adapt to, you've also got to take into account aspects like how long it will take you to knock one of these guys out, and if you'll be able to get to a safe position before another guard comes round and spots you. And when you start getting a little bit deeper into the game, if you want to avoid combat against these guys, there'll be a lot of rooms where you'll have to time your movements to very narrowly escape these guys, the hardest ones being rooms with upwards of 3 to 4 guards, all looking in separate directions. Timing becomes essential in scenarios like that. Of course though, we haven't actually talked about the guards main role yet, that not being to spot you, but to also eliminate you. Upon being caught by one of these guys, you enter the alert phase, with the soon to be iconic alert sound notifying the player that they've been spotted, on top of the bright red exclamation mark which appears above the guard's head. The first thing we should acknowledge is that there's actually two different kinds of alert states in this game. One which stays strictly to the screen that you're on, making it so that when you run onto another screen the alert dies down, and also another one which shows up in yellow with two exclamation marks, which indicates the enemies will keep persisting until you either kill a certain amount or enter an area which removes the alert phase, although the latter is few and far between in most instances. I never actually noticed what triggered each individual alert phase. As I got further into the game, I definitely had a feeling that the permeated alert phase was more common but I'm not even entirely sure. It just seemed to me that certain rooms were set so that enemies would follow you and others weren't. And by god, were the alert phases hell in the earlier stages. I think more than anything in this first game, you get the sense they've gravitated to a concept they haven't really perfected yet. The visuals and sound in relation to it, fantastic. I think there's a reason they never end up dropping it in future entries. You hear any kind of alert sound like that, or hell, even see the bright exclamation mark, and you immediately think of Metal Gear. There's only one problem though, the AI really start showing its flaws during the alert phase. When they're locked into their set routes, they're fine, but the alert phase requires them to break that and proceed after you instead, something they achieve to varying effect. More often than not, you'll witness these guys just wandering about at a fast pace, occasionally coming into contact with you when you're presumably trying to make a run for it, and perhaps giving out some damage that way, either damaging you directly when walking into them, or with the white bullets which shoot out of their guns. But I'd say the alert phase here is definitely lacking a punch, solely due to the AI's incompetence. In many areas, you can merely block yourself into a corner and wait until the guards eventually decide to come near you, in which punching them will result in them being locked in place until you defeat them. This also being possible for multiple enemies at the same time, making your punch incredibly effective due to enemy stacking being quite prevalent here. Regardless of where you are, I don't think they're programmed that great to come after you. But I definitely say in particular rooms which are more densely packed and feature long hallways, they're more threatening merely because their sight lines are greater, making it easier for them to get damage off on you. It's mostly the variety which I really enjoy from these guys. Every room has a different layout in terms of the objects we can hide behind and the enemies scattered within it, meaning that each sequential room requires a new style of approach, one that may be simple in this game, but lays the foundations for far more complex and satisfying navigation in the future. Taking a back step and looking to the actual events of the game here, we of course started off with our infiltration into the compound. So it's now time to both get our bearings slightly, gather up some equipment and make our way to Grey Fox. Our first priority would likely be to acquire equipment. We won't be able to get far without any kinds of self-defense or healing items, and the first instances of these things will likely be found just right of the starting area with the three trucks, each one containing items we'll find ourselves using quite frequently throughout the game. 
The first one includes a ration, our primary way of healing here. These can either be used on our own accord, allowing us to replenish our health regardless of how low it is, or if left equipped during gameplay, it will automatically heal us when our health drops to zero. Self-healing becomes more practical as we discover more useful items like body armor, which should almost always be equipped once we find it. But the automatic addition in itself is a nice quality of life addition, which could potentially save you from some tight scrapes at points if you're not keeping an eye on your dwindling health. The only somewhat negative here is the fact that much like other usable items like ammo and missiles, you'll find that once you exit the truck, stepping back inside reveals another ration in its place, making the trucks a renewable source of rations. I say somewhat negative, as in terms of the game design, I don't like this addition. I think rations should have been a finite resource so that players have to think more carefully in relation to their actions, as they might not know when they'll be able to heal themselves again. You might argue that the further you travel, the further you're going to get from this truck, and although that is correct, there is of course other rooms we'll come across that also feature rations, with the exact same effect taking place in those two. And to be honest, if you're really dire for rations, there's rarely a point where you're blocked off from going right back to the start anyway. Sounds extreme, but with how hard the game gets, I can genuinely imagine some people doing this. And that's the only positive I really see. There were several points where I was playing for quite long passages of time with no healing, so to finally find a ration, I did like the fact I didn't just get one, but instead multiple with what I see as this exploit. Overall though, I would have preferred for this to be removed, even if it meant balancing out other aspects or merely making rations a more common resource to find. In the second truck, we've got our first keycard, which will give us access to certain doors which are initially locked off to us. And finally, in the third truck, we've got binoculars, an introduction to the idea of equipment that isn't merely used for context sensitive occasions, but can be used freely while playing to get you more acquainted with your environment. As you could assume, these allow us to look at another screen around our position in advance to observe what threats may be waiting for us. It can be slightly buggy, there's been multiple times where I've pulled out the binoculars while being chased, only to see all the enemies in the room be replaced with a static image of the guards which were previously patrolling, but in general it can be a useful tool to plan out your strategy going forward. Before actually heading into the building, we're also able to find mines, which of course can be placed down strategically to take out patrolling guards. And there's also a gun which can be found here, although there's no ammo at the time of us picking it up. You would have found though if you were stealthily taking out enemies on your way up here, guards have quite a high chance of dropping things like ammo, which we can use not just for the pistol, but the fairly wide arsenal we end up acquiring throughout the game. Heading into the complex though, which for some reason is always met with an unavoidable alert in this section, for whatever reason, we reach one of the many elevator areas in the game. You'll notice this one starts off simple, one elevator allowing us to go up and down. But as the game progresses, they needlessly make elevators, of all things, a convoluted process. We'll see more when we actually get to it, but let's just say the level design does not make any of these frustrations excusable. They literally have elevators which only go one way at points, meaning that one little tap upward could lead you to a place you didn't actually actually want to go, which then means you'll have to find a whole other route that you might not remember just to get back to where you were actually trying to go. The elevator room's greatest function works as a checkpoint, whereas if I was playing on an emulator, I likely wouldn't have experienced this because of save states. It's nice to see that even when forgetting to save beforehand, we're always brought back to wherever we last entered the elevator room. The first thing we're presented with when coming out of the elevators though are the surveillance cameras, basically like the guards with how they appear to have limitless sight lines, but slightly less dynamic in how they only move in one vertical or or horizontal direction. My only issue with these are the pace they move at. With the removal of all the kinds of turns and different movement patterns the guards present, the cameras can sometimes be arduous to wait for, but especially in rooms like this where there's no other kinds of threat, and all we need to do is wait for the camera to move downward. It's a nice initial presentation of the idea to newer players by forcing them to go in a certain direction to avoid being detected, but you'll unfortunately find that a lot of surveillance cameras here also adhere to this. Dodging the camera and heading down the left hand side will eventually present us with another one one of the vital mechanics in this game, that being the prisoners. This isn't only an idea that can be important towards your gameplay, but was one that was seemingly key to Kojima's thought process when making the game. Although Metal Gear is a series that's been touted as almost being the best video game equivalent of the character James Bond, Metal Gear 1 was actually more based in other media, the prisoners being a key aspect that Kojima focused on, with this idea originating from the film The Great Escape. And although it's not essential for us to save these hostages, it's not only a liberating feeling to quite literally free these prisoners that are locked up, but you'll also notice in the fairly intuitive HUD that is present at the bottom of the screen, there's a tab referred to as class under our life bar. You would have also noticed at this point the life bar only seems to be half full, which isn't merely an error on my part for not using rations, but is actually how it's presented at the start of the game. Where the two tabs link however, is that once you save five prisoners, your class will raise by one star, and your maximum health will gradually increase alongside it. However, losing class stars is also a possibility, if you're either reckless or sadistic and end up 
up shooting one of the prisoners. This system not only encourages players to explore these levels to their max potential to get their health up, in turn making what is a fairly challenging experience slightly easier, but also encourages the player to not be a straight up sadist and kill everything and everyone, something that once again might sound minor now, but definitely becomes another key component to the series down the line. As we enter the next room from the prisoner, you'll notice that you'll rapidly start losing health, with the radio call from Big Boss informing us that, quote, I forgot to tell you, you'll need a gas mask for the gas room. Wow. Yeah, thanks a lot, but I mean it might seem funny at the time, and for newer players will inevitably lead to one of the first backtracking moments, where we have to go back outside the building and acquire the gas mask with our level 1 keycard. But this happens a few times throughout the game, where the joke just becomes ridiculous. Big Boss ends up forgetting to tell us several things which could result in us just straight up dying, making you have to do everything you've just done all over again. The backtracking is arguably the more important aspect to acknowledge here though. This is something you end up doing so much of in this game, and it's almost never fun. I don't really see the intention of why it happens so much throughout the game, apart from prolonging an experience that could otherwise be wrapped up hours beforehand. You might argue this backtracking was put in place so that we become more acquainted with certain environments. And to that, I say there's definitely an element of that. You will genuinely feel particular areas being mapped out in your mind, which could hypothetically lead to you tackling them in a more efficient manner than you had earlier in the game. But just using this fairly harmless gas mask backtrack as an example, remember that not only will you be doing this kind of stuff way more in the future, but also increase the distance you have to travel at points tenfold, added to the fact that with the increasing amounts of areas and ID cards you'll be accessing, unless you're writing a detailed list of things like doors you haven't accessed yet and where precisely these doors are inside these facilities, you'll end up completely lost to like I was at points, and then add that to the fact you're still dealing with all the same enemies you were previously. It's not like once you remove them they're gone for good, you could clear a whole room of enemies, go into another, come back and they're all there again. It's hands down one of the worst and most convoluted aspects of the entire experience, and it led me to do something I hadn't done in years, and that's pull out a walkthrough. That's right, this is a game that can leave you so stranded at points because you didn't pick up a certain item or enter a certain room at the correct time, that you could be completely stumped and not know where to go or what to do. And yes, I attribute most of that with the backtracking, as more often than not, the reason I got confused was because after progressing to a certain point, none of my keycards would work on any of the doors, meaning I was basically being told I forgot something and I was going to have to explore almost everything I'd already explored beforehand just for a chance at progressing forward. It's way too much of a nightmare to deal with. This is as outdated game design as you can possibly get in my opinion, and with the unreliable ration output in certain locations, teeters on a full-on soft lock if you aren't careful. Continuing on through the gas room, the first thing I want to point out is one of the incredibly obscure elements we're told about in this section, and that's the resistance leader, Schneider. The thing is, although I personally went and found the gas mask myself, Big Boss actually advises us to call up a guy called Schneider, but there's one issue, we don't actually know his radio frequency. On the radio screen, pressing down reveals a box where all your pre-existing contacts are held, but we can actually tune into any number of frequencies by pushing left or right. Most of these of course result in nothing, but there's also other ones like Schneider's radio signal which we do actually need to know here. Only thing is, we're never told about it, and from searching up online, the only way to actually get a call from Schneider is to go to a location nearby an elevator, scroll past a certain point on the receiver, and you'll eventually get the call. I mean, this is actually past the point where we would have needed the gas mask anyway, but it's weird to know this is the only way to activate Schneider's call. It's almost like there was some kind of bug which prevented a call from actually happening in the first place, which some people have speculated is actually the case. Whereas the process to acquire his signal was annoying and convoluted, it's only because in the context of the game, getting his call was almost painted out as essential. If we don't get it now, we might be locked out of other useful information in the future. Funnily enough, when employing this same method in future games in the form of easter eggs, albeit in a much more intentional way. This actually ends up escalating the Metal Gear experience for a lot of players, with all the different kinds of quirky outcomes we can eventually witness, giving the series an even more distinct personality. Right, do you actually enjoy abusing helpless animals? Going past the gas room ends up leading us to another prisoner, who unlike the previous one, who merely thanked us for saving him, actually gives us some information about Grey Fox. This is something a lot of the prisoners do throughout the game, some of their dialogue merely being a way to give us some information on the actual narrative, but other times actually being quite useful for our progression. For example, one of the next prisoners we end up rescuing gives us the radio frequency to a woman called Diane. Calling her up in the same room leads to a guy called Steve picking up while Diane's apparently out shopping, but calling her in the future will give a few insights to 
more specific things, like an antidote we may need if we get struck by the scorpion enemy we come across. By this point, if you're going through all the accessible doors with your keycard, you would have eventually found card 2, which we can use to acquire the RC missiles for the upcoming room filled with electricity. We're once again told to contact Schneider to identify the missile's whereabouts, but of course we still can't access him. Well, not unless we cheat and look up his frequency online anyways. But luckily the missiles are only a short way back, and with them in hand we can use these to blow up the power panel at the end of the room and make our way forward. As I mentioned earlier on in relation to the backtracking though, this is where the card issue begins, and it's one of the most annoying aspects of the game if you haven't got a strategy guide. Already in this section, you'll notice that certain doors you could once access are now locked off to you if you attempt to use the card 2 on them. For example, if we tried to enter back into the gas room, we wouldn't be able to open the door with card 2 equipped. The card's access levels don't stack here. Doors which require card 1 will only open with card 1 equipped, which of course goes for all the other leveled doors throughout the game. What may seem like initially a small hindrance becomes a nightmare upon acquiring your 6th or 7th card, and it doesn't help that the areas you journey to don't actually escalate with your card level. You could be at one of the final areas in the game with all 8 key cards, and still need to use a level 1 or 2 to open certain doors. It's just an unnecessary hindrance that's frustrating even when you're not being hounded by enemies. Using the RC missile to destroy the panel, we can keep heading forward. In this area, we can find a prisoner, a cardboard box which will soon become legendary for the franchise, and my favourite part is that upon making your way left and using the level 2 card on a previously locked off door, we unlock an easier route back to the first segment of this floor. I love that kind of interconnected level design, it's just a shame that outside of this moment, I can't remember many other moments that actually achieve this to any greater effect. There's things which are put in place so that you don't have to travel long distances on foot, but as we'll see, these don't really have anything to do with level design, but instead resemble something akin to fast travel points. The cardboard box we just mentioned is an item where we can literally hide in plain sight. Well, sort of. For as much as it can do in terms of avoiding the enemy sight lines, it's also very easy to get yourself stuck in a precarious position when you've got no other choice than to be caught. For example, if you end up getting stuck between multiple enemies all looking different directions, once they start patrolling, you're almost doomed. Any movement they see from the box will result in you immediately being detected, and if the box gets in the way of their patrol, they end up firing at you and detecting you as well. If we actually head back on ourselves through that door we can now access, we'll find another door close by, which leads way to a grenade launcher. On our way to it, there'll be a room filled with enemies that actively try to attack us from the moment we step in. This being different to the alert phase, and merely being a singular room which works as more of an action-oriented set piece. Which I mean is fine, although you'll have a much easier time just running around these guys because of how combat works in this game, but we'll get onto that in a second. Luckily, the grenade launcher, and essentially all the weapons in this game, don't require separate ammo resources. Those ammo crates that we picked up to get some bullets for our pistol will now in turn give us the bullets and also some grenades for our launcher, and when we eventually get new weapon types, they'll end up dishing that ammunition out too. Nothing too big, but once again, just a nice quality of life addition here. To progress to the next story beat though, we first have to enter the new elevator we've unlocked and head down to the first floor, in which one of the prisoners we save here will tell us that we have more chance of rescuing Grey Fox if we purposely get captured by the guards. It's the dialogue that's given out here though that made me think about game design during the period this game was released. The instructions that are given from this prisoner are blatantly obscure. I know that we're technically killed by the guards every time we die, but that begs the question, why would they ever end up imprisoning us anyway if this is their first reaction? Hypothetically, you could possibly think this is the guards' way of capturing us. We're attempting to get close to Grey Fox's secret cell in this way will set you back to the elevator. The other aspect I thought about was the complete lack of direction that continually persists throughout the game. The only way to get close to the secret cell is to get caught. Okay, how? There's been no mechanics so far that relate to being captured. The guards seem perpetually hostile, and there's also been no sign of any unique types of guard that would only capture you and not try to kill you. They leave everything up in the air with this singular message, leaving us to once again wander around and basically try to figure out ourselves what we're actually supposed to do. It's a yin yang kind of thing. I can appreciate this old kind of design when looking back on it, as compared to back then when I think there was too little direction given to the player. Nowadays, I think there's far too much direction given to the player. Objective markers, hints, tips, everything involved in modern day video game design seems to revolve around keeping the player on a certain track. The experience, in turn, becomes more linear. Exploration is thrown to the back of players' minds, because they're literally being told to not go where they want to go, but instead, go where the developers want them to go. And it's not the player's fault they end up missing fun little easter eggs or extra supplies because of this. So many games nowadays are actively training their brain to ignore that in favour of whatever main quest they're following. I love Red Dead 2, but I think it's one of the best games ever created, but the story missions do show flaws when you go slightly off the beaten path. Characters yelling at you because you're taking a bit too long or wandering around 
around. The game actively failing you if you wander too far out, which I should mention is usually not that far at all. And using myself as an example, over time, this has definitely trained my brain to throw my own aspirations in the game to the wayside in favour of what I'm being instructed to do. But saying that out loud just makes me realise that's the polar opposite of what I want a game to be. Games are all based on interactivity, it's all based on the player's input, and I think having the freedom to do what you want without being hamstrung is one of the most gratifying feelings one can feel while playing a game. There's a reason why people think so fondly of games like Oblivion or Skyrim. Yes, they do have main and side quests which are marked at the top, probably my least favourite aspect of those games. But the world itself is entirely open, and not just that, it's been designed in a way where they're actively encouraging you to go out and explore. Certain landmarks being placed which will surely catch the player's eye, uncharted areas on the map which are begging to be explored, and upon travelling to these locations you're oftentimes rewarded, either with some useful equipment or some interesting combat encounter. And then bringing everything back to Metal Gear, I perceive a game like Skyrim as one of the most perfect in-betweens of the restrictive game design I see nowadays, and the far too obscure game design I see here. It gives the player the option of following the story, and upon doing that you won't go far wrong, but if the player isn't interested, going off and doing their own thing will lead to brand new discoveries that'll also end up doing things like giving equipment and levelling up the player. Anyways, the prisoner was correct about being captured, it's just the fact we can't activate this capturing ourselves. Instead, we have to wander onto a random screen which presents a dead end, where we then get surrounded by enemies and thrown into a cell, with all of our equipment also being removed from us. I think this moment could have had far more potential if it was expanded on and used slightly later into the game. The removal of our equipment is ultimately a minor inconvenience, we end up reacquiring it in only two rooms time. But the fact is, this could have been used later into the game when players have become more reliant on all their equipment, having you go back to basics, almost as a test for how much you've learned over the course of the game. But it's merely used as a transitionary moment here so we can rescue Grey Fox, which I think is a missed opportunity. There's a weird trend that begins to occur from this point on that seems to resonate with the Zelda comparisons I was strongly feeling from the very start of the game. Not only does the top-down layout look very similar to Zelda of course, but there's also several design choices which are made here that heavily remind me of some of the dungeons in Zelda. The guards first of all reminded me a lot of the patrolling octo rocks and moblins that we see in that game, although that could ultimately just be a visual comparison once again. But in terms of mechanics, we then start getting rooms featuring traps, although I really didn't like these at all. One of the first we stumble across is the room with what appears to be some kind of large metallic rolling pin going back and forth. These would be fine if they solely dealt out some damage, but although I thought the movement is generally fine when doing most things in this game, trying to pull off these tight swift manoeuvres when trying to avoid an object that will kill you immediately upon touching you, that's when it falters for me, and in quite a major way. Remember, one wrong move here will send you right back to the last elevator you've entered, which could end up losing you quite a bit of progress, and the movement just isn't tight enough to warrant the inclusion of these. I don't think the rolling pins are warranted in a stylistic sense. Why has this military base just got a random connecting room with one of these constantly smashing about? And I don't think the severity of them is warranted either. Another environment based hazard are these infrared sensors which we stumble across, although once you find the infrared goggles and their red beams are illuminated, they're not that much of a struggle to get around. Certain rooms with these in also have the sensors swapping between different patterns, which I think works very well in making the players take their time, dash between each individual section when they get the opportunity, and ultimately to familiarise them with the capabilities these sensors hold. Remember though, we've actually just been locked up in a cell, but luckily a radio call from Big Boss informs us that we should check the walls, and upon hitting the left one we see a question mark pop up above our heads. Continuing to punch it eventually destroys it, but this leads to a bigger issue in this game, and that's how there's multiple moments just like this which occur later on, which unlike here, go completely unsaid. I mean, we were just talking of Zelda comparisons, there's several times in this game which are the exact equivalent of that hidden bush which you can burn to access the shop with the cheap magic shield, and I don't really have much to say about that, but I think it's dreadful game design to have players constantly paranoid they're wandering past something important, even though it looks identical with everything else we've been seeing throughout the game. I hate that kind of thing in older games, just expecting players to know these things despite there being no indication whatsoever that anything's actually there to be found. When rescuing Grey Fox, we get more context on what Metal Gear actually is. Remember, we haven't actually seen Metal Gear at this point, but only briefly heard about how important it is that we destroy it. Grey Fox describes it as a nuclear equipped walking battle tank, some kind of ultimate weapon that's being constructed, with the capability to launch nukes to anywhere in the world. Brute force apparently won't work to stop this thing, as we're told the only person who knows how to destroy it is the Metal Gear developer himself, Dr. Drago Petrovich Madnar. And like that, it's time to get moving once again, although a roadblock is introduced almost immediately after, in the form of our first boss encounter here, that being the shop 
maker. This boss fight is ultimately fine, but there are slight inconsistencies here which don't match up with the rest of the game. For example, despite having none of our equipment, we can actually open up one of the doors at the bottom of the screen by hitting them, something that isn't possible to do with most, if not all, other doors in this game, which did lead to me dying a few times while trying to figure out what to actually do here. But we're given a checkpoint right back in the prison cell, luckily, so it wasn't that big of a deal. Inside one of the rooms at the bottom is actually all your equipment, meaning that we can now take the fight to the shop maker. It doesn't take much to put this guy down, and like most bosses in this game, they can be exploited to a certain degree where you're able to just wipe them out without even giving them a chance to get shots off on you. The shot maker appears to have some kind of shotgun with a wide spread of bullets, although one thing you'll notice about this guy is the almost unfair nature in terms of how he can fire his weapons compared to us, with the same going for all the other enemies in the game as well. The combat in this game is something that's arguably aged the worst out of most other elements here. I mentioned our punch being a very effective way of eliminating our enemies earlier, but what I was also implying is that this also goes for the weaponry as well. You'll pretty much only be using weapons like the pistol or submachine gun when you've already been detected, as attempting to use them any other time without a suppressor will immediately notify the enemy of your whereabouts. <laughs> The only thing is, compared to the enemies, which you'll find can shoot in diagonal directions, you're only able to shoot in the four static up, down, left, right directions, heavily impeding your chance of getting shots off, considering how fast enemies can move in these alert phases. Not to mention, the bullets which get shot out from these weapons oftentimes move incredibly slowly, meaning that even if you have got a shot lined up perfectly, they could quite easily move out the way while the bullet's actually travelling towards them. There's a fundamental imbalance between you and the enemy here, which I really didn't like. It seems even these low-ranking grunts seem to be more apt at using weaponry compared to a specially trained special forces soldier. This of course also applies to all of the bosses here that used bullet-based weapons, the shot maker being a particularly difficult boss for newer players considering the bullets widespread as well. The only positive I could really garner from this is the fact it makes you feel rather weak compared to your enemies, which will only further encourage you to stay undetected, which I suppose works quite well in a gameplay sense considering stealth is the name of the game here. But ultimately, it does make Solid Snake seem rather inept in combat, something which narratively doesn't fit that well at all. Overall though, once you've got to grips with the shotmaker's patterns, he's not that difficult a boss to get past. The fact he rolls back and forth at the top of the screen stops us from merely shooting him at the side, considering contact damage is also a thing here. However, even if it takes a few rations, using a weapon like the submachine gun can take him out pretty quickly due to the fact enemies don't have the same invincibility frames that we have, meaning that you can essentially spam them with attacks and take them out in a matter of seconds. Our next main objective from this point on is to get onto the roof, something which is impeded immediately when trying to go up due to another piece of information Big Boss conveniently forgot. There's a wind barrier that's stopping us from entering, meaning that we need a bomb blast suit to bypass it. Throughout the time where we're looking for the bomb blast suit, we can utilise the level 3 card we acquired from the shop maker to get items like the infrared goggles, which now illuminates the sensors we would have previously been unaware of. Exploring the areas running up to these items, you would have also noticed a nice progression in terms of the intensity of the enemies here. There's certain rooms here which which are far more densely packed with both enemies and large objects, making manoeuvring around them even harder. It's nice to see this is actually intentional though, which might sound like a given, but of course not all rooms in the future adhere to this, and we can mainly see that not just from how the room's laid out and the fact we've only gained access to this room after going through more intensive combat sequences, but it's also shown through the enemy's clothing. Although I didn't notice any substantial change in the enemy's behaviour, you'll notice that the enemies at the start of the game, which remember, are the ones laid out in an easier way for players to become accustomed with the stealth gameplay. These ones have a light brown uniform, whereas later on you can see that enemies can also be found in darker brown uniforms, blue uniforms, and also green uniforms, with the green ones cropping up the latest in the game's runtime. As I said, nothing substantial for how the game actually plays out, but a nice visual escalation of how things are gradually getting more difficult as we progress. Thing is, we don't just need the bomb blast suit to access the roof area, but we also need to find a parachute so we can actually jump down to the area we're trying to get to, which takes us to another boss encounter, against the machine gun kit. There's not much to really say about this guy, his functionalities are almost identical to the shot maker, with how he primarily stays at the top of the screen, rapidly moving between these pillars to avoid your shots. <laughs> Getting the bomb blast suit and uniform items were a far more arduous process compared to the parachute however, as this is one of the instances where we're supposed to find a random wall in this spiral courtyard section just outside the shop maker's arena, and blow it up using a plastic explosive. As I've already said when making comparisons to Zelda, this is an inexcusably terrible design choice, leaving absolutely no indication there would be anything hidden in this substantially large room with dogs patrolling in it. Bear in mind too, the only way to find these comes from actually punching the wall 
much like we did when we were imprisoned. So is the intention here to have players going around this huge room and punching every wall tile? Or how about going through the entire game punching every single wall tile, just in case they've missed something? Just utterly insane. But there's a reason this stuff has been left firmly in the past, and only really emerges in modern game design in the form of easter eggs. What I was mentioning is how you acquire the uniform, which will be used later on, which just like the bomb blast suit is mandatory. You won't be able to progress past a certain point if you don't acquire this. You actually get the bomb blast suit in the same courtyard section here, in a slightly, but just slightly less confusing way. This piece of equipment is locked up in the centre of the spiral maze that we've been running around, and to get it we merely have to perform the exact same process that we just did, but instead with multiple walls heading further inwards to the structure. The tedium's only lessened, because once you find the entrance, the maze has several dead ends which you have to blow open, making the search area much smaller. I'm still not a fan though, obviously. With both items in hand though, we can finally head up to the roof. The way forward has us travelling across a rickety bridge. But I mean Jesus, who made this thing? It's literally blowing all over the place. Of course, this is supposed to be some kind of obstacle, which despite thinking it's quite unnecessary, can lead to you hilariously falling off and dying. Upon getting on the other side, we're greeted with a brand new enemy type, that while not being too common past this point, I found to have an interesting concept, but a lacklustre execution. These guys are just like the regular guards, but have jetpacks, initially making their sight lines more unclear, considering that if we use real world logic, if they're higher up, they surely have a wider field of vision. I was immediately caught by these guys, although there was never any alert sign that actually popped up above their heads, making me think going through this section without being discovered might be nigh on impossible. And as you can see, these guys can pretty much fire all over the place. Their bullets aren't prevented by any sorts of objects, and the fact they can fly above objects too makes them an even more dangerous threat. I like their design. I like the higher level of technology they're using compared to what we've already been seeing. The only thing I don't like is the confusion of their shots. I found that solely because their bullets didn't stop when hitting objects, which implies they're travelling above them, I ended up having perspective issues in relation to their shots, where I never knew if they were headed right for me or if they were going to fly right past me. I'm pretty sure how they function is that if you cross over the bullet at any point, you'll be hit regardless, but I still found it slightly confusing. You'll want to be finding the landmine detector in this area, as it eventually becomes very useful later on. But the next substantial encounter we have is the battle against the Hind D, what I perceive as one of the best boss fights in the game. It's nothing substantially different from the previous two boss fights, one enemy at the top of the screen firing down to us below. But what I really enjoyed in this one was how the battle flowed. You're advised to use the grenade launcher during this encounter, a weapon that compared to the bullet based ones not only fires out grenades very rapidly, which gives us more time to actually start moving again, considering we're never able to actually move and shoot in this game. But the grenade launcher also presents a crosshair on screen, indicating the range of the weapon and how far the grenades will actually travel. Pair this up with the fact the hind D is in one static position, and the battle immediately becomes a lot fairer compared to the other ones. The diagonal shots it can perform, which we obviously can't, are all coming from one centralised area that we need to avoid, which might actually make it sound easy, if not for the fact the shots come out at an even faster pace in higher volumes, so getting caught in the crossfire could be even more fatal. It's just got a really great back and forth here. Once again, nothing too difficult particularly, but a far more satisfying encounter than most others. Parachuting into the next area, we're not just presented with numerous dogs when landing, but also two more trucks when heading downwards, which presents a horrendous troll from the game, where if you enter the truck on the left, it'll start moving and you'll be brought right back to the start. Again, why this is here, I really don't know, but dying puts us right back to where we just landed, so I can't complain that much. Entering one of the rooms nearby reveals a message on screen, with Snake questioning if he was too late to save Dr. Madnar, with this room presumably being where he was held. Although entering another nearby door and rescuing a prisoner, we're told that Dr. Madnar has actually been relocated to building 2, meaning it's time for us to use our level 4 card and cross the desert. Although journeying upwards, you'll end up seeing what appears to be several missiles flying onto the ground. It's not that much of a dangerous trek, the area is big enough to where you'll rarely get hit by the missiles anyway. And also, if you were being extra observant, you would have also remembered there was a door way back in the courtyard area that wasn't able to be opened. However, with our new level 4 keycard that we acquired after parachuting down, we can now open it up and grab the body armour, which I'd say is almost essential to keep on your person at all times, considering the damage reduction it gives is pretty substantial. Last time I mentioned this, I promise, but an item this good shouldn't really be left for players to discover by themselves in my opinion. With the labyrinth-like layout of everything here, I wouldn't blame anyone for leaving this behind, and 
because it's such an effective defense item, actively punishing players for not remembering which sole door they forgot to open in the vast number of rooms and floors which are featured here doesn't feel all that fair. Continuing to head forward through the desert area, we eventually reach a boss fight against a tank. Although, because I think it's arguably one of the most boring encounters we witness here, but I want to talk about the sound for a second. I've already brought it up a few times in relation to things which will end up becoming staples for the franchise. The alert sound for one, which plays when you're spotted by an enemy, is great. It really captures that deer in the headlights feeling, especially because it always cuts out all other sound. In that moment, being spotted is the only thing that is being focused on. But the thing which pairs up nicely with the alert phase is the soundtrack. Another aspect that I think for the series as a whole has its foundations built here, but isn't perfected yet. My biggest issue with the soundtrack is that for the majority of the game, the theme which plays at the start genuinely ends up playing for the endurance of your playthrough. It's obviously broken up slightly by things like being spotted and boss fights, but even then, all of their themes are repeated too. Boss fights all have the same music, getting spotted always has the same music. Despite not hating the sound of these at all, they do find themselves becoming stale by the end of the game because they lack variety. The main theme does fit nicely with the actions we perform throughout the game though. For me, I felt a sort of call and response from it, which replicates how we deal with sneaking past enemies throughout the game. The high stabs we frequently hear in the track almost emulate an enemy looking around for our presence while we're hiding in the shadows, and the low bassy sound that plays for a lot of the track reflects our ongoing ghost-like excursion. The alert music might be a bit too uplifting a theme for something that should really have negative connotations with it, but the act of switching up the main theme for one that's much more up-tempo upon being caught is a very wise decision. It makes the player realise they'll have to get a move on or fight back if they want any chance of losing the guards. I'll admit though, everything outside of the music is very bog standard, which I assume is mainly due to aspects which we saw Kojima become frustrated with earlier, like the MSX's limiting capabilities. There's no kind of footstep sounds to be seen here, but all the bullet based weapons sound identical, but only varying in terms of the speed the bullets get shot out. But looking at it as a product of its time, and a product of the MSX, I don't think the sounds too bad overall. The soundtrack is admittedly still my favourite part. The atmosphere the game garners from these tracks alone bolsters what could otherwise appear like a fair fairly generic affair off the bat. And despite the repetitive nature of the tracks in this game, there is a separate argument to be had in the fact these do also result in them being stuck in the player's minds more, thus making the experience of Metal Gear even more defined. Sound on the whole was bog standard for me. Nothing particularly bothersome, but nothing that really stands out either. Oh, and that tank boss fight we left off on, you literally just put mines down and wait for it to come forward while dodging its bullets. That's it. Although because we were just talking about sound, I do feel the need to say the sound which is given out when damaging all the bosses is very satisfying. Getting to the front of building 2, we finally need to use the uniform that we collected earlier to get inside. And despite generally liking the idea of fooling the guards here, the situation is just a bit too static to be seen as anything but another potential roadblock. That'll make players go all the way back to building 1, find the hidden wall, and in turn stretch out the playtime of the game to an even more unnecessary length. Even comparing the addition of the disguise here to games like Castle Wolfenstein shows the uniform's shortcomings. As unlike in that game where the disguises are multi-purpose, meaning that once it's on, no enemies wearing that same uniform will recognise you. Here, it's only used for this one instance. Attempting to use it on any other enemies will result in them immediately spotting you. Although, thinking about it, these pitfalls may have been the building blocks of how Metal Gear starts to use tons of elements for multiple functions. Regardless, getting inside presents us with a building that ultimately doesn't have any distinct differences to the first one. The music is the same, the layout can't really be distinguished, as per usual. But even then, all the same floor and wall tiles are reused here, most of the time merely having their 
their colours change to give the illusion of variation. The only substantial differences I can recognise in this building would be the one-way elevators which I mentioned earlier, this only ever being a negative for me, and also the water which we occasionally have to wade through. Which I mean is fine, but the idea I really liked about the water is one that's hardly even utilised, and that's how we're eventually able to swim under the water when acquiring an oxygen tank. What seems like a perfect idea to broaden how we can avoid our enemies never really gets used unfortunately, the underwater swimming mainly being yet another roadblock which locks us out of a boss fight. It is here though where the confusion started to become extreme in terms of what I actually had to do and where I had to go. Doors that are accessible with all kinds of varying key cards, ones with essential items that you might totally miss due to how bloated and confusing the key card system already is to begin with. It's from this point on where I started to not become a fan of this game at all, attempting to do things by myself but swiftly becoming lost and having to consult a guide once again. I'm not labelling this as a full on criticism as I'm not going to assume that everyone else playing this game will be as confused as I was, but in my personal experience this was where things became beyond convoluted and in turn destroyed any kind of immersion I was feeling to begin with. The first thing we do in this section, aside from collecting some ammo, is have a very minor boss fight against this sweeper machinery. The only reason I say it's a boss is because the boss fight music starts up during this encounter. Take that away and you've got a combat equivalent of those rolling pin rooms we've seen before. Literally nothing. If you've forgotten, our main objective here is to locate Dr. Madnar, with us being told about his whereabouts from a prisoner on the roof of the building. Much like earlier when we acquired the grenade launcher, the roof of building 2 is an area that's always on high alert. Whenever you come up here, enemies will know where you are and actively try to kill you. Something which on the first go round is genuinely surprising and fairly exhilarating, but you'll find that coming back up to this area any subsequent times, the scenario will play out exactly the same every time, dampening it to a certain degree. It's things like that which I see as quite vital in terms of game design. Once a moment occurs that breaks the norm from the general experience of the game at large, I don't think it should ever be repeated. So, for example, fighting the shot maker for the first time was a surprise, because it wasn't just the first boss we come up against, but also the only boss in the entire game that has the exact functionalities that he specifically has. If later in the game we came up against the shot maker again, not having any of his attacks or moves changed, it would not only dampen the first encounter by making it seem more inconsequential, but it would also remove any intensity from the second combat encounter right from the very start. We already know how he works, it's merely treading water. I'm not saying this is a bad encounter of course, I just wonder why these things are actively repeated instead of being removed when the player comes back to them. It's also up on this roof where we find keycard 5, and by using the elevator at the end of this section, one which unlike the first one only allows us to head down, we're able to find Dr. Madnar in the underground courtyard. But of course, things don't go to plan. Not only is the courtyard filled with gas, something which I should mention is always annoying to deal with, because of the fact we have to actually take off the gas mask to unlock doors, meaning we'll always be taking some form of damage regardless. But when finding Madnar, it turns out to actually be a trap, being told the real Madnar is actually on the second floor, and also opening up one of the most annoying traps in the entire game. We'll focus on that more in a sec though. Heading into a nearby room presents yet another boss fight. Like a lot of other instances in this game so far, you might already start drawing comparisons to future games where Kojima has blatantly taken inspiration from his earlier creations and implemented updated versions of things, the fire trooper in particular being very similar to a boss featured in Metal Gear Solid 3. Just keep your eye out during these earlier games, you end up appreciating that a lot of the core foundations, even going all the way up to Metal Gear Solid 4, all stem from these first two MSX titles. This boss fight though is nothing to write home about, but as per usual. I like the unique fire attacks this guy has, which are pretty striking visually, but it's another boss that can be exploited very easily, where by going to the top right you can completely avoid his attacks, giving you the chance to run up to his position and take him out incredibly easily. We wrap up this section by acquiring a few more things, one of which being an antidote and another being a compass, both of which we'll need to cross the upcoming desert. But we're also able to acquire a rocket launcher by calling up someone called Jennifer, with this information only being given out by a prisoner that we can rescue. There's more confusion here in the fact that much like a lot of the other more optional prisoners, we can miss this guy pretty easily in this ongoing labyrinth of near identical rooms and passageways. But also, when calling up Jennifer, she tells us she's prepared a rocket launcher for us and to come get it, but never actually informs us of where that is. Luckily, it just so happens to be placed in a room right nearby the prisoner, but there's once again no information that actually indicates this is where we need to go. This confusion also continues in terms of how we acquire the level 7 card that lets us get to the desert. We get it from these two unique guards which walk back and forth in a certain room of the building, these guys being known as the Arnolds, or Bloody Brad in this version of the game. That name not making that much sense considering there's two of these guys. Interestingly, they aren't actually humans, but instead cyberoids which use artificial intelligence. 
intelligence. My only issue with them not only stems from the important keycard they're holding, but also from the fact they're painted out as an entirely optional enemy. Usually we get keycards either from exploration or boss fights, but here the game once again switches up its rules and makes it so that killing both of the Arnolds in this room gives you the keycard. The only possible inclination you'd have to kill these guys, considering avoiding them is way more convenient, considering they don't shoot at you and don't enter an alert phase when they see you, is the fact you don't see these guys again after this point, although at the time you obviously won't be sure of this. As the fake Madnar also mentioned, the real Madnar is also on this floor, but upon finding him, we're told that we first have to save his daughter Ellen, requiring us to backtrack once again to the first building and rescue her. Annoying once again, as although we know she's in the first building, most players would have most likely forgotten the sole door that was unable to be opened in the basement, which actually holds Ellen. But once we do this and head back to Madnar, we're told the only way to destroy Metal Gear is in the form of a specific pattern of explosives that need to be placed on the right and left legs. And you'll definitely need a pen and paper for this. The list of rights and lefts is so long it's ridiculous. Even before the boss fights happened, the process of elimination already seems underwhelming and convoluted. One thing I failed to mention though is that when rescuing Ellen, it's actually encouraged that you take a small shortcut to get back to building 2 faster. I say it's encouraged because this supposed shortcut is found directly above Ellen's cell, but this is where the pitfalls come in. To use this shortcut, you not only need the flashlight item, which is found in building 2, using anything but the flashlight here will literally result in a completely dark room, but when travelling across these several rooms, you'll find that pitfalls will be set up in many locations. Sounds fine on the surface, it's a shortcut with the additional risk of death in compensation for the time that will be saved while using it. The only issue is that the pitfalls are just plain infuriating to get past. They open up so wide that you have to be incredibly precise with your movements, but also swift as well, which again, might still sound fine for the most part, but the biggest annoyance is that falling down these is also very finicky, mostly going in the favour of you dying and having to restart. For example, there were several times where I'd blatantly dodged the pitfall, but I obviously didn't make it clear of quite literally a few pixels, resulting in my character apparently falling down, even though they're still on the surface. I can't describe how annoying it was to continually start this room over again just because of some crappy hit detection by the game. If I knew at the time this wasn't the only way back to building 2, I would have entirely avoided this room and just gone the longer way, because ironically, the longer way actually ended up being far shorter in my case because of these pitfalls. Luckily though, this is about the worst the game gets with these. They still crop up later on, and even during a boss fight, but the sheer amount of them here, mixed with how tight your movements need to be, doesn't get repeated to this extent again. It's finally time to head across the desert once again, which as I mentioned earlier, is now crawling with scorpions. It's quite hard to actually avoid these, considering they move quite fast and sway in all kinds of directions, which is why the antidote is almost essential. But of course, if you don't end up getting hit, it won't be necessary. Heading into the final stretch of the game, we arrive at building 3 with an ambush of enemies, once again serving as quite a nice set piece which unfortunately gets repeated every time we come back to this area. The many trucks that we see here do genuinely hold some useful equipment, however just like earlier when we parachuted down and found a truck that sent us back to the start, there's also a truck here that upon entering takes us back to that location itself. Yet again, I'm unsure if this was supposed to be some kind of fast travel, but all it felt in my case was just a trick that is only ever annoying. Getting inside the building has the enemies continuing to pursue us, which is slightly frustrating considering the fact we have to locate another hidden wall while the enemies are continually firing us, but due to the scale of the room being much smaller compared to the courtyard section from earlier, it's less of an overall issue. The final bosses of the game are located in this building, and they're not too far away from the elevator that we come down, but unfortunately there's one final backtracking moment that occurs here, due to us not being able to open one of the doors in the building. We end up finding an oxygen tank in yet another hidden room, which upon reflection is where I realise the whole idea of these indistinguishable hidden walls that we need to blow up have far overstayed their welcome, but the oxygen tank itself was actually quite intriguing, due to the fact that in the second building there was blatantly an area which was inaccessible because of the deep water, which would lead to us drowning if we stayed in it for too long. Using the oxygen tank however negates all damage that we were previously taking, letting us head upward from the main bulk of the water in this section and eventually discover another boss, this being Dirty Duck. Unlike a lot of the other bosses in this game, which are all quite similar to each other, either being a human that you need to kill with bullets or a piece of machinery you need to kill with explosives, Dirty Duck sets himself apart by using hostages, making timing and accuracy a major key to beating this fight effectively, which is ultimately the last thing you want when going into the final and assumedly hardest encounters of the game. Don't get me wrong, Dirty Duck is still quite standard in terms of his actual attacks. He's not shooting a gun this time, but instead throwing boomerangs, which have a large range of effectiveness with how they sweep across the arena. However, despite the pitfalls which open up in the centre of the arena, presumably being put in to be a countermeasure for players
players trying to get up close with this guy, you can just head around the left side and go right behind him, removing quite literally all the threat from this guy due to his boomerangs not being able to reach it. After you've done this, it's merely a matter of shooting him without hitting any of the hostages, a task that isn't too difficult at all. One thing I also liked here, which was majorly lacking from a lot of the other boss fights, were the highest stakes that were set up. Not just from killing one of the hostages which are tied up, but also the call from Jennifer that we get during this fight, telling us that one of these guys are her brother and that she won't assist us anymore if we end up killing him in the crossfire. Mere things like that can truly elevate encounters. Although I didn't feel like I had any actual connection to characters like Jennifer because of how sporadically we interact with her, the sheer fact I was being told someone who helped me out in the past has a request which may not be achievable raises the stakes. It's less important for this game because as I say, I felt near to no connection with all the characters here, but definitely something that will be important in terms of how certain key encounters are set up in future games. With Dirty Duck dealt with, Card 8 in hand, and Jennifer's brother saved, it's time to head back to Building 3 and deal with Metal Gear once and for all. Due to there being no actual guards in this underground section, the cameras are now equipped with lasers that shoot out upon them seeing you, something I think is both handled effectively in terms of how you're able to dodge them without much hassle, but also quite an intuitive way of dealing with the lack of guards and alert states here. The biggest revelation which happens here though comes about when we rescue one of the nearby prisoners that can be found here, telling us the leader of Outer Heaven has actually been the Foxhound commander Big Boss the entire time. Several questions can be gained from this. The immediate one that comes to mind would be if Big Boss truly is the leader of Outer Heaven, why has he sent us on a mission to go and take himself down? Surely that would be totally against his own interests. Another question would be that if this is true, what does that actually make the organisation we're working for? We can assume that Foxhound was set up to counteract potential world-shaking operations like this. But once again, if Big Boss is both at the head of Foxhound and Outer Heaven, why would he set up this organisation which would have the potential to stop what he's trying to achieve? Some kind of power play, perhaps? Or maybe a test on one of Foxhound's greatest soldiers? But although we can theorise about this in the moment, I think it's one of the moments in the Metal Gear series that was made at the time, due to it being an interesting twist in terms of this sole game, which, in turn, has to be painstakingly explained later down the line to make any semblance of sense. This happens a few times throughout the series, where Kojima makes a choice in one game that either gets explained to a ridiculous and convoluted extent in the future, to make something which was supposed to be left open-ended make actual sense, or there's also times we see quite vital elements to certain entries be entirely ignored, with all of these potential plot holes stemming from Kojima's want to end the series quite early on. It becomes even more blatant with particular games in the future, but of course we'll focus on that when we actually get to them. Just keep this in mind though, as Kojima progressed with the series, and in turn progressed as a writer and storyteller, you can definitely see he becomes more fascinated with ideas and themes compared to the literal plot of the games, and pairing that up with the fact he wanted to end the series several times after many of the future entries, you begin to see that these themes and the subtext of the plot is the most vital thing, and continuing the series after certain things have occurred in the plot results in many elements which don't quite match up, don't make much sense, and are blatantly ignored because Kojima wrote himself into a corner and can't explain them away. Anyways, we eventually can see that something's off when heading to the left of the prisoner's cell, as we get a panicked call from Big Boss telling us to turn off our console. Of course here it says Xbox 360, but as you could assume it would have been replaced with MSX on the actual MSX console. Still quite cool they changed the dialogue here though. And not to mention, the sudden unexpected fourth wall break is still quite spine chilling even back here. The entire game we've been in the shoes of Solid Snake and spoken to accordingly, but all of a sudden we're getting a finger pointed directly at us, the player. We're the ones being told to switch off our consoles and break the connection with this virtual world. There is a certain amount of leeway you've got to give with this kind of stuff with Metal Gear, as despite the fourth wall breaks taking place, I don't believe that these characters are actually aware they're in a computer game. I wouldn't say it's a gimmick though, it's a defining, albeit quirky element of the Metal Gear games, that's oftentimes used to great effect, just like here. In this instance for example, I think the effect is meant to be intimidating, showcasing the power of Big Boss before we've actually even seen him, by letting us know he's not just aware of Snake, but also is aware of the person who's actually got him up to this point, and made him the stealthy, lethal soldier that he's perceived as in this game. I won't deny, there's a big possibility that I'm finding these connections because of my strong knowledge of how the future games handle this kind of stuff. Back here, I do truly believe that the idea of acknowledging the console we're playing on is mainly supposed to be a mere wink to the player. I think it's surface level, which is perfectly fine in this case, but just remember, this fourth wall break effect isn't forgotten by Kojima, and is recontextualized in the future to convey some much deeper ideas than we see here. Defying Big Boss's request, we go through several rooms filled with pretty much all of the environmental threats we've experienced throughout the game. The laser cameras, the pitfalls, landmines, and the gas. There's even a room that I think is somewhat of a cheap shot, which has electric panels which can't be switched off, with our only option
option being to run right through them and heal ourselves with some rations. This room in particular seeming almost like a resource check in my opinion. If we haven't stocked up on rations before these final bosses, we won't be able to progress. So in some ways, things like this are almost informing the player that to have an easier time, it's better to go back and get stocked up on supplies. And it's after this room where we come up against the much talked about Metal Gear mech, which despite liking the design, was arguably one of the most underwhelming moments of the game to me when observing how we've built up this idea of Metal Gear in our minds. The game literally opens by talking about how we need to stop Metal Gear due to its nuclear capabilities. But during this fight, you're able to see we don't actually fight Metal Gear itself. It's more of a fight against the laser cameras. And to be honest, the main reason it's underwhelming is because there's no real surprise here. The only strategy we have to employ is what Dr. Madnar told us earlier, placing bombs on the right and left legs of the Metal Gear. As long as you've written it down, or somehow remembered the exact order of this ridiculously long list, it's just a matter of avoiding the cameras, something that I didn't find that difficult at all. Literally all you need to do is head back and forth between each leg while baiting out the cameras from the furthest position, giving you time to place the bomb, detonate it, and head to either side of the arena, rinse and repeat. The one thing I can appreciate is the variety this encounter brings. It's definitely refreshing to not have another one-on-one -on -one with someone who's firing weapons at us. I just think for a game called Metal Gear, the actual fight should have been against the Metal Gear. As I said, it feels more like a battle against the cameras, while trying to destroy a Metal Gear that's inactive. Again, stakes are very important for these kinds of encounters, and Metal Gear possibly had the greatest amount of stakes in the entire game. A mech that has the potential to launch nuclear weapons to any place in the world from anywhere in the world, reduced to a series of rights and lefts, where the mech itself doesn't even particularly matter. Right after Metal Gear is destroyed, there's another good example of stakes getting set effectively, these ones being immediate, with how we're told a self-destruct sequence has been set in motion, with there only being a short amount of time before the entire Outer Heaven complex goes up in flames. This would be intense in itself, as the time we're given isn't only quite short, but also counts down pretty rapidly. In the following room, however, we come up against the final boss of the game, Big Boss, his name now making a bit more sense when put in this context. His dialogue reveals that every Everything the prisoner told us from earlier was true. Big Boss truly was the commander of Foxhound and the leader of Outer Heaven. One thing I appreciate, while slightly confusing me, is the additional explanation that's given to Big Boss's actions here. He explains that he sent us, what he perceived as a rookie who wouldn't be able to achieve success in this operation, to fool the world. But I don't particularly know how that's a possibility. I've been under the assumption, and one that I think is correct, that these kinds of Foxhound operations are top secret, not actually being revealed to the general public. Therefore, they there wouldn't be any kind of exposing involved in this operation. I also question who Big Boss would actually be fooling. He clearly describes Snake failing his mission as the thing which would achieve this outcome. But what does it prove? We have to remember that Grey Fox before us also failed his mission to stop Metal Gear, and I'm unsure if that proved any kind of point or fooled anyone. All it seems in this original meaning of this twist, which we have to remember eventually gets retconned down the line, is that Big Boss, our guidance throughout the game, ultimately wanted us to fail. Again, why send some Someone on a direct mission to come and stop you if you wanted them to fail. What point is that actually proving? I understand that future events give more context to Big Boss's actions here, but remember, we aren't looking at this game through the perspective of future games. We're looking at the narrative in terms of how it's conveyed within this game itself. And ultimately, this final twist, despite seeming impactful on the surface, being one big bait and switch, doesn't actually make that much logical sense for Big Boss. The actions seem totally counterintuitive. Besides these slight and consistencies, at least in terms of how I'm perceiving these events. The actual boss fight is fairly standard for the most part. All that's required is the rocket launcher and some quick reflexes. It's about the same as every other kind of human boss encounter, although I do like the additional cover which is presented here and the increased speed of his movements, giving a bit more depth and uniqueness to this fight, giving his shots more chance of landing and your shots less chance of landing. But at the end of the day, it's still merely a case of point and shoot. And once we're done with that, we head up one of three ladders in the following room, two of which being tricks to waste your time and potentially get you caught up in the explosion, but one leading to the final cutscene of the game, showing quite an impressive visual of Snake running away from the complex while it explodes behind him.
and with Snake's job done and the whole incident being covered up as one large earthquake, the credits roll when we're officially done with Metal Gear 1. There is an extra mode we can access here called Boss Survival, which as you could assume is literally just a boss rush where we have to consecutively beat each boss in the game. But outside of that, there's not much more extra content to be seen here. It should be noted as well, the original version didn't actually feature the boss survival to begin with, on top of not featuring the Infinity Bandana, which gives you infinite ammo and is unlocked upon completing the game for the first time, and also the rankings we're given at the end. Overall for Metal Gear 1 though, looking at it from the point of view it came out, it's great, but looking back on it now, with how game design has majorly evolved from this point, it's fairly unforgiving, fairly arduous, but does genuinely have a lot of redeeming qualities. The atmosphere is definitely distinct. It was this game, along with its following couple of sequels, that pretty much single-handedly popularised the stealth genre of video games. All the different gadgets we get to mess around with, both context and non-context sensitive, makes us feel like a full-on secret agent. The other positives I can give, though, can only be paired up with negatives in my eyes. I appreciate the more intricate level design here. It's going for something more ambitious than your typical arcade-type experience. But on the same merit, it's not refined enough to actually be satisfying from beginning to end. Things just become far too convoluted to navigate, and quite early on too. It's blatant some major streamlining needs to be done to the equipment, not only being pretty laborious to select each individual item and weapon from a list which is laid out both horizontally and vertically, but also with items like the key cards, having to use each individual one separately instead of just gradually upgrading the card when finding each increased level, making it multi-purpose, is definitely annoying. And then you've got positives and negatives which make up the core foundations of the game. I found sneaking past enemies in this game very satisfying, dashing between all kinds of different structures in the nick of time just as the guards turn their heads round to face you. But then when being caught, the combat elements get exposed as being very underwhelming, having you shoot pellets that while being accurate by heading in a straight line seem to be just a tad too inferior to your enemy's combat capabilities to feel satisfying. I understand that this may have been in part intentional, to reinforce the idea that players should be staying undetected, but I'm just saying that I think the fact you're so handicapped compared to your enemies here dampens the combat in my opinion. This is the foundation of an idea though, one that would eventually be refined and expanded on with Metal Gear 2. The development of Metal Gear 2 is quite interesting, as from what it appears from my research, it seems that Konami was initially hesitant to allow Kojima to work on a sequel to the original MSX title. This mainly stemmed from the immense success of the NES version of Metal Gear, which was released to other countries like America. A game that I should mention is seen as considerably inferior to the MSX version, and one that along with its sequel we won't be touching on due to it not even being canonical to the franchise. Kojima had zero involvement in its development, and the sequel to the NES version, this being Snake's Revenge was specifically being made for countries outside of Japan. Looking to Kojima at the time though, he didn't appear to be interested in developing a sequel himself to begin with. That's right, it wasn't all on Konami. Even after the very first Metal Gear game, Kojima showed almost no interest in continuing the series on. The idea for an MSX Kojima-headed sequel actually came about from a discussion with one of his co-workers, one which had already been placed on the development team of Snake's Revenge. And we have a lot to thank this co-worker for, as after only one train ride, where he encouraged Kojima to pursue his own sequel, Kojima had already established a premise for the sequel, with development being approved after a pitch to Konami. And starting up Metal Gear 2 directly after the first game immediately shows even more ambition compared to the first game, not launching up to a black screen not only showing the title, but instead a full-on intro sequence, this being the first clear signs of what would soon be known as Kojima's notorious cinematic approach to video games. The intro shows both the credits of those who are most essential to the game's development, as well as numerous amounts of high tech visuals appearing on screen, all of which coalesce to the development of a brand new Metal Gear mech that we're supposedly going to have to take down. The emphasis on the Metal Gear itself and the more intricate design of the mech, setting the stakes just like the first game, while also making the Metal Gear itself be even more of a spectacle. That's not all though, after this intro we're brought directly into another sequence, giving us some more backstory on the operation we're about to carry out. It's told that by the late 1990s, the world appears to be on the brink of some kind of total peace and stability between all 
nations. Real world conflicts like the Cold War are brought up here. Yet another aspect which subtly shows Kojima's focus on linking his video games to real life events, something which eventually becomes the basis of many Metal Gear games. All the world's conflicts are described as being almost entirely resolved, with the threat of nuclear war now being a thing of the past. However, a military group establishing itself in a place called Zanzibar Land in the Middle East desires more chaos, attacking numerous nuclear weapon disposal sites around the world, and taking the nukes which are yet to be destroyed, eventually leaving Zanzibar Land as the only remaining country in the world to hold nuclear weapons, putting all other nations across the world at threat of nuclear war again, one that due to their announcing of nukes leaves all other nations in a far more vulnerable state. Not only that, but the world's oil supply also ends up drying up unexpectedly, with the only person who's been able to synthesize an alternative, this being Dr. Kiyo Marv, being kidnapped and taken to Zanzibar Land. Kojima's writing begins to truly excel from this point onwards in terms of the Metal Gear series. Even this final line, a tiny micro but only a few microns wide, is about to change the world forever. It feels incredibly impactful. The stakes here are potential world domination, something which might sound quite generic when comparing this to other similar pieces of media, but it's the way all of this is conveyed, making the situation seem almost hopeless, before taking us directly to the start screen, which works so well in pumping up the player. It might seem hopeless for everyone else, but with us stepping back into the shoes of Solid Snake, there's a sense of determination to prevent this potentially cataclysmic event from occurring. And getting into the game, there's many things to take into account right off the bat, the first of which for me was the audio, having three different music tracks play, which define both Snake's introduction, his initial radio call with the Colonel, who's now replaced Big Boss as our primary source of guidance, and also in a story sense, has replaced Big Boss as the head of the Foxhound unit, and also what we'll find is the main theme of this section when taking control of Snake. This obviously being a grand improvement immediately due to Metal Gear 1's constant theme which felt like it was going on forever, although we'll eventually see that does still get repeated to a certain degree here. In that radio call which you saw, you can also tell there's a lot more personality to the writing immediately, which I assume could have perhaps come from Kojima as well as us players becoming more familiar with Solid Snake as a character. I don't think it's a mistake the game has the subtitle Solid Snake. From our first interaction with the Colonel, he's already painting Snake out to be this legendary soldier by saying things like, Snake, right on time as always. It's clear that after the events of Metal Gear 1, Snake is no longer being looked at as a mere rookie, but possibly one of the best soldiers around. Something else you'll notice too is the layout of the radio screen. Now we can actually see who's on the other end of this call, which I think is a fantastic inclusion, as I found that in the previous game I was feeling near to no connection with the characters on the other line, solely because of this fact. A mere character portrait ends up giving these characters heaps more personality, on top of the already more personalised writing that's been employed to each individual character now. The final, and arguably biggest addition which gets talked about during this call, is some of the new equipment we've got which will help us out in stealthing around. We've now been given an anti-personal sensor, which when switching it on, reveals the layout of the surrounding area, the enemies, which appear as white dots, and us, which appears as a red dot. Initially, it might seem like a slightly strange inclusion, considering in the first game, every time we entered rooms, not only were all the enemies within it very visible due to the top-down perspective we have, but they also spawn in the exact same locations every time depending on where you come in from. However, when taking control of Snake and focusing our eyes on the radar, you'll of course see that it tracks our movements, but also the movements of the enemies that are off screen. And that's no trick of the eye, in a move that makes the enemies more dynamic here, they now aren't confined to sole screens. This means that you'll be seeing multiple enemies with routes that travel across multiple different screens, whose movements have to primarily be gauged by us solely from this radar, because obviously we can't actually see what they're doing on a screen we aren't also on. There's a lot of positives and and negatives that come along with this in my opinion, but we'll get onto them in a second. First, we need to make our way inside the nearby compound, with the second screen we enter revealing even more information about how we'll be tackling our enemy here. You'll find that when heading up, despite now being aware of their locations on our radar, we're still lacking a sense of where they're actually looking, something that with the long detection ranges and brand new head turn ability the soldiers now have, replacing their previous head turns where they would actually move their whole body in one direction, made being detected a lot more likely. However, I didn't think 
this was actually a good thing. The fact that we're unaware of where they're looking while they're off screen is a major disadvantage for the player, as you're never able to properly gauge at points if it's okay to move up to another screen. It's one of those ideas that's a great concept, but definitely has pitfalls which will only become more apparent as we progress. Taking out these guards works exactly the same as before. Three hits from your fists, or use a weapon to kill them straight away. Although I will say the hits in particular feel a lot more impactful, with how that enemy's body is lightly elevated off the ground when getting hit, as well as the punchy hit sound that's now being given out. A nearby truck that we can find reveals another issue which has been fixed, and that's how we could exploit the previous game somewhat by entering and leaving rooms with items like ammo and rations in to fully stock up on them. As you can see, despite there being a ration inside here, once we pick it up and attempt to enter back inside the truck, it's no longer there. A great fix on the surface, but I did eventually end up discovering rooms that still adhere to the old way of acquiring these items unfortunately, although they do end up seeming far more intentional here, so perhaps that type of approach genuinely was supposed to be like that in the first game. Finally, to get past the fences, we're made to utilise our new ability to go prone and crawl along the floor. In terms of sneaking past enemies, I never actually found the crawl to be that effective to be honest. For example, I never ended up seeing any difference between crawling on the floor or going prone behind objects compared to just running around or hiding behind objects while standing up. The enemy's sight lines don't appear to be affected whatsoever, and most, if not all objects in this game that we can hide behind are still big enough to where we don't need to go prone. Instead, the crawling is primarily used for moments like this where we either need to crawl through entrances, go through vent shafts, or merely to find items in small crevices. The final one of those also working as the best example of how you can circumvent enemies while going prone, although I will say the placement of these are far more sporadic than you might expect. Entering inside the first building immediately made me realise how significantly I think the graphics have improved from the previous title. We aren't able to just walk through the front door, but instead have to head through some vents, in which the detail can already start being distinguished from all the different vent openings, nuts, bolts, and pipes we can see here. But then heading out of the vent and into the main bulk of the building, we can already see the same kinds of artillery like tanks which were lying around in the first game now have a considerable amount more detail to them. Same goes for things like the walls, floor and railings which we can see here, which compared to the first game are used a lot more sparingly in each individual section. Literally every building we entered in the first game had the exact same floor tiles, perhaps with some recolouring to give the illusion of some variation in the environment. Whereas here we've actually got a much broader range of textures being used. The only concern I had in relation to this opening section was not any kind of regression, but instead an issue in terms of how the opening is structured. It seems to be identical to how we start the first game. We're plonked into this infiltration mission, told what we have to do, but are given absolutely no direction on how to do it or where to go whatsoever. I would have hoped to see some kind of progression in relation to this facet of the game, but unfortunately, as we'll come to find, Metal Gear 2's biggest pitfall in my opinion is the exact same as the first, and that's how convoluted the game eventually becomes in its later stages. Don't be mistaken though, although I am bringing this up in relation to the opening section, I don't think it's all bad of course. As I've already mentioned, just like I don't think players should be left completely out in the cold, I also don't think they should be forced to be handheld and treated like they don't understand how to piece together anything. In the opening, I do think a certain degree of freedom should actually be given to the player. It gives them more opportunity to explore the area to its full potential instead of heading directly to their mission objective, as well as having their confusion about where to go most likely result and then becoming more familiar with their environment, working well with how they'll be able to interact with it later into the game. Something else I also think is a positive for this game in my view is that each building and each individual floor within these buildings was a lot more distinct compared to the first game. For example, the first floor of the first building is characterised by elements like the stairways which lead to the elevators, effectively showing that height can be used in this game to avoid enemies that are on the ground level. And there's even negatives I can point out that despite not liking them, do still give this single floor more personality. Like the long walkways that are on the bottom floor, which you'll find when you enter an alert phase will make it nigh on impossible to escape while journeying up or down one of these. I mentioned the elevators a second ago, and you'll find when using them this time round, they've been streamlined and have a lot more style about them now. As opposed to before, where you'd have to slowly and manually move the elevator up or down by yourself, now all it takes is a single button push to both call the elevator to your current floor, and one more button push when on the inside to go up or down. We do still end up getting what appears to be a totally unnecessary hindrance, in the fact 
fact there's two elevators here for whatever reason, both of which need to be used individually at points to gain access to certain floors. Again, I don't really know why though. There's nothing positive that's actually gained from this, only a negative in terms of having to switch elevators, which takes up more time, and also a confusion if you don't remember which elevators have access to which floors. Taking the elevator to the second floor, however, made me aware that certain mechanics in this game are getting shown off both more effectively and more often, which luckily does also go for the endurance of this game. The ground of the second floor is primarily made up of these see-through tiles, which make a distinct clicking sound when you walk on them. This in turn will make any of the guards that are on the same screen as you suspicious, with them audibly notifying this and immediately going to investigate the noise that you've created. I love this element, as it uses audio much more effectively to actually create an effect in the game itself. If a guard's on their way to check out the sound, you've got to think fast and get out of there before they discover you. And of course, you've also got the other aspect of this, which is how negating this sound utilizes other elements of the game like the crawl. Crawling on these tiles removes all sound, but you're also able to tap in whatever direction while standing and have no noise generated too. The progression is very similar to the first game here, and I mean almost identical. Between the several floors we've got in this first building, we need to find things like a level 1 keycard, a gas mask, and some infrared goggles, in which I should also mention we do find a pistol on the outside of the building as well, just like the first game. Between this time, we come up against threats that we're mostly familiar with, guards, cameras, and the infrared sensors, which this time are a lot less static than before, with most of the times these are featured having the lasers continually rotating on a cycle of different patterns, giving the infrared goggles even more purpose here. It's basically the same old continual investigation like the first game, albeit with the removal of the prisoners now, with you now having no kind of class system, which I thought was somewhat disappointing, but nothing I cared about too much either. In some ways, it might even be a positive, having our max health now be increased every time we beat a boss, which does end up feeling a lot more gratifying. But all this investigation eventually culminates when we discover the first boss of the game, Black Ninja, who just like the guy who impersonated Dr. Madnar in the first game, tricks us into thinking we found Dr. Marv before launching us into a boss fight. So I think now would be a good time to talk about the combat and how the stealth now operates in this game. And although there are definitely improvements here, there's certain aspects which I still find to be underwhelming for the most part. Considering we're at this boss fight right now, we'll start with the action-oriented combat, and this is an area that I think has the least amount of change overall. The bullets are still pellets, and I noticed in this game that both yours and the enemy's bullets travel even slower than before, which I found actually worked well to give you more of a chance to escape the damage being put out from the enemies, but also can give you just as much trouble trying to get your own shots off too. Looking at Black Ninja as well, I think in bullet-based encounters like this, things are bordering on the unfair side of things once again, with how Black Ninja's shots travel much faster through the air. And not only that, but they can also travel in multiple directions, something that we're still unable to pull off. It's in the very early boss fights like this where certain issues really start presenting themselves. Although I will say that as the game goes on and you're given back some useful equipment like the body armor and more effective weaponry, these issues do lessen to quite a substantial degree. The first thing I was made aware of was somewhat counterintuitive in terms of something I personally wanted from this game, and that's the removal of our ability to exploit item drops like rations and ammo. Make no mistake, I was searching all these different levels as thoroughly as I possibly could, and still went into this boss fight with hardly any rations. And for a first boss that is genuinely quite difficult, I felt that some health regeneration was definitely necessary here. There is one thing though, it's partly my fault. One of the things we can do before the boss fight is enter numerous ventilation shafts, emerging in a trash disposal area. It's this area which reveals the item exploit issue hasn't disappeared, as we can see trash bags getting funneled down the same chute we just came down, which ends up holding items like rations. Exiting the room and coming back in will always present another trash bag that we can search, although a lot of the time these trash bags will be holding stuff that we can't actually use, meaning we'll have to exit the room and try again. So in actuality, what I perceive as an issue hasn't actually been resolved, it's just been made more tedious to actually achieve here, and I don't know if I actually prefer this. If you're gonna still have a system where we can stock up on supplies by entering and exiting a single room, why make it this monotonous? It's a positive because it's not repeated in every single room with equipment in, but also a negative because I personally found the game didn't balance this aspect out. Now, some may attest to this, just telling me to get better at the game and to conserve my items more effectively, but I play games all the time. I'm not unfamiliar with common game design conventions and typically can figure out pretty quickly what makes a lot of games tick. Just because of the sheer hours I've spent playing games over the course of my entire life, I can confidently say I'm generally not too bad when I get to grips with whatever game I'm playing. And in my personal opinion, I believe the game's balanced in a way that's a lot more unforgiving if the player makes mistakes, takes damage, uses up ammo, and so on. And I mean a lot more unforgiving. So much to the point where I think it becomes unnecessarily difficult if you aren't going into certain encounters 
encounters fully prepared without making any mistakes beforehand. That's my point. You remove the item exploits in the first game and you've got the exact same issue. It's like they solved that problem without actually thinking of the repercussions of how that will translate to boss encounters like this. Of course, you can also do the trash bag trick, but after a few attempts, you end up feeling like you're merely wasting your time. Talking about the Black Ninja boss fight though, it's one that I like the concept of, but overall found the most frustrating out of almost every boss encounter here. Black Ninja has the ability to teleport, which I enjoyed. You can never get too close to him, otherwise he'll teleport to another side of the room. Something I feel might have been an active response to how you could literally walk right up and obliterate tons of the bosses in the first game without much consequence. Outside of that though, things start to become a bit more arduous. Pairing up his ability to teleport with his fast movement, fast bullet output, and widespread of these bullets, the chance to actually retaliate without taking damage becomes slim to none. It's a boss that I think would have worked very effectively if the area was a bit wider, as there's many instances where bullets are simply unavoidable depending on where you and the Black Ninja are placed. And the most common thing that occurred during this fight once again brought up my issues with how the bullets are thrown out of our pistol here. There's so many times in this fight where Black Ninja was literally standing right in front of me, but I shoot a shot and he either runs or teleports away before the bullet can actually reach him. It's a fight where you're made to feel so inferior that it ends up ruining the fight for me personally. As although you could argue it's something that's been put in place to create a sense of peril in terms of the present and future narrative, having the very first boss of the game seem overpowered compared to you. The fight itself I just found to be mainly unenjoyable, so that reasoning doesn't excuse it for me. After we're done with Black Ninja, it's revealed his identity is actually Schneider, who we communicated with in the first game. It appears that despite being part of the resistance against our heaven, he's aligned himself with the Zanzibar forces as an act of retribution against America. He explains that after Metal Gear was destroyed and Snake's mission was complete, NATO stepped in and launched a bombing campaign against our heaven, killing the majority of resistance members and also children which were apparently being housed in our heaven. Things become very interesting here, as Kojima definitely intends to make a statement in his writing about the shady goings on behind the scenes of supposedly reputable organisations like NATO, being told that NATO purposely launched this attack for no other reason than to eliminate all remaining life in outer heaven, not wanting to deal with the war orphans and refugees that actually should have been rescued. They're seen as merely a liability, so in turn they paint their actions in a brighter light by seeming like they were dealing with the terrorist threats, when that's actually far from the truth. Schneider mentions how someone, which at this point remains unnamed, saved them from the destruction of our heaven, giving them a chance to survive and a new land which they can call their own, that being Zanzibar land. We can already make assumptions on who he might be referring to, the main one obviously being Big Boss, who despite being supposedly killed by us might have actually survived. And before leaving, we're told to find a man wearing a green beret on the first floor, one of the first actual examples of a full-on understandable direction being given to us. Notice how this works though, as this is a piece of game design that appears to be quite modern even all the way back here. We're given this direction, a specific target that we're going to have to find, and then a given keycard too. This is all that you need to give the player a reasonable understanding of what they need to do next. You don't have to tell them precisely where this man with the green beret is and what room he's in. The distinct characteristics of the man and the mere idea that keycard 2 will perhaps give us access to him from one of the previously locked off doors works incredibly well. It's not restrictive, it's not enforcing something that leaves the player with no other reasonable option than to do exactly what they're told. As they don't know exactly where he is, they could acquire this keycard and access some other previously locked off rooms in the meantime to get some equipment, merely due to the fact they aren't told exactly where to go. Moving away from the boss fight, I was also going to mention how the stealth gameplay functions in this game, and overall I think most of the additions here are pretty great, albeit not fully refined yet. We of course talked about the differences in terms of how the guards function here, things like being able to actively walk from screen to screen, turning their heads instead of their body, which requires closer inspecting from us to identify where they're looking this time. But the biggest changes come in the form of how the alert system works now. As we saw, getting caught in the previous game was either a one room engagement which dies out upon entering another room, or one that will last multiple rooms until you either wipe out a certain number of enemies, or reach a room like the elevator. Here, the alert system has been given several stages, which leans much further into the stealth elements of the game. Being detected now shows what level of alert the enemies are at, level 3 being high alert, level 2 being evasion, and level 1 being totally undetected. Losing the enemies is no longer based on how many you kill, but instead entering another screen and genuinely getting out of their line of sight. The moment one of these pursuing enemies enters the new screen that you've gotten onto, the evasion level begins, where you've then got to last around 20 seconds to lose them completely. This is a fantastic addition, as it's promoting the game's core strengths a lot more, and because of aspects like how the enemies now rarely die down after entering a new screen, being caught now feels consistently more impactful compared to before. It's definitely not 
not without its problems though. I'm glad this is the model all of the future games follow, but it's one that in this first iteration has some quite major problems at points. I mentioned it a second ago, but because of how some of the areas are designed here, there's screens which will make it literally impossible to avoid the enemy. Things like the long corridors on the first floor. Travelling up one of these when you've been detected gives you no option than to be spotted again, which I think would have been okay if not for the fact the alert sound is played every single time upon being caught on a new screen, which in turn actually ended up dampening the impact of being spotted overall. I also find an issue in the fact that the radar is purposely blocked during these alert phases, and for whatever reason, I don't really know. I could understand this somewhat if our perspective was a lot greater than it actually is, but due to how enemies can now just wander onto whatever screen they want, well, within reason, I found a lot of the time that I was unable to gauge how to actually avoid these guys solely because I had no idea on where they were coming from. It's quite an unfair ask to have the player avoid something they quite literally can't see coming. There's also ways you can basically get yourself stuck here unfortunately, with how crawling under structures like tanks while on high alert will have the enemy stay aware of your presence. The only issue is they seem incapable of actually doing anything about it, so they just run around in circles infinitely until you come out again. I wish for the new dynamic additions we can see when stealthing, this dynamic aspect also applied to the combat, because for the most part it seems totally unchanged. The AI is slightly more intelligent in terms of actually getting shots off on you, but you'll still notice them running around like headless chickens even when you're standing right in front of them. Outside of that though, I think the alert system's a great new addition. I can definitely say I enjoyed the feeling of being on the run and staying out of the enemy's line of sight a lot more than actively retaliating. In many ways, that approach before was somewhat the antithesis of what the game was supposed to be going for, and for as many refinements I could possibly give to this new alert system, the fact is that it does get fully refined in the future. There's a possibility that during development, this idea was perhaps already seen as not meeting its full potential yet, but as I said, it's still good. Finding the man with the green beret, we're led to a section that funnily enough was quite unique at the time, but wouldn't really be brought back to the Metal Gear series all the way until MGS4, and that's the idea of a tailing objective. I mentioned how it's unique back here, mainly because it seems like so many games after this point always tried some kind of stealthy tailing mission. Everything from the Assassin's Creed games, which seem to never stop with this kind of mission type, to Grand Theft Auto, which more often than not has you tailing some kind of vehicle. Here, the tailing's fine, although it does become gradually more tedious the longer it goes on. The main thing I liked about this moment was the dramatic shift in the environment, going from the metallic, isolating rooms which we've been used to for both Metal Gear games so far, and expanding that out to a jungle setting. As long as it fits tonally, which I think it does in this case, more variation in the environments can only ever be a good thing, as it keeps the visuals fresh and new. Something else I like is how this feels like an isolated moment in the game, whereas many other times things can blend together when taking out enemies and going from room to room. This tailing section has a unique musical track, and much like I mentioned when talking about particular battle moments in the first game, only ever happens once. The only thing is, once you figure out this guy works on a very typical pattern of reaching a corner, turning round, continuing on and repeating, it becomes more of a waiting game compared to anything else. When finally reaching our destination however, and entering inside a hut, there's nothing to be seen, but there is in fact something to be heard. <laughs> there's some kind of tapping coming from the walls, and when getting in contact with the colonel, we're told it's Morse code that we've got on our decipher. Only issue is, the player's told to look at the manual to solve this puzzle, something which isn't included physically or digitally with any of these non-MSX re-releases of Metal Gear 2. A great concept, I should say, that requires the players to do something in the real world compared to in the actual game, but one that nowadays requires a Google search more often than not, which is slightly unfortunate. We're given the code 14082, and when attempting to call this number on our radio, we're put directly in contact with Dr. Madnar from the first game. Marv is said to be in the tower building, a few kilometres north of the first building, already making us aware that it isn't just the narrative structure that's quite similar here, but also the gameplay structure too. But other discoveries we get here are confirmations of both Metal Gear's presence and apparent completion in Zanzibar land, as well as being told that Big Boss is very much alive and is once again behind everything that's going on here. We end up getting a new radio frequency too, one belonging to a zoologist called Jacobson, that despite having very limited usage in terms of helping us progress, is one of the first instances where Kojima appears to be adding these optional characters and dialogue to merely impart knowledge that he's interested in. Might sound quite strange to begin with, but it's something that Kojima does more and more often as the games go on. It's just yet another one of his weird writing quirks. Although it might ultimately be irrelevant to the plot, this overabundance of well-written and interesting information given out by characters across the series is definitely something that's distinctly Kojima. Whether you like it or not is a different issue though, 
though, and I understand both sides of that coin. Before heading forward to the tower building, we're advised to go and acquire a mine detector first, obviously due to there being some kind of minefield up ahead. But you'll actually find that due to us being able to crawl on the ground in this game and pick up the mines, the mine detector is actually less essential, but still obviously useful. Thing is though, heading forward isn't the best option right now, despite being encouraged to do so, primarily because we'll eventually reach a roadblock in the form of a hind D that we have no way of taking down currently. So, heading back to the jungle, we're able to find a swamp by heading to the right hand side. And once again, we've reached a moment that is so horrendously outdated that I find it almost hilarious. Trying to step into the swamp will have us move very slowly, and not just that, if you continue to walk through it like this, you'll eventually sink completely under and die. The only way to get through this area alive is basically trial and error, where we have to find an invisible path that will get us safely to the other side. I don't really have much to say about this, it's just awful. It's quite literally impossible to identify where the path is, so you'll just find yourself falling into the swamp, retreating to a place which elevates you back up, and continuing this immensely slow process until you reach where you're supposed to go. The only thing I can say is that because you unfortunately have to journey on this path a few more times across the game, it does eventually become easier to navigate from memory, but it's still inexcusably tedious. And talking of tedious, I'd say that also applies to the boss encounter that we discover across the swamp. This being a guy known as the Running Man, with his one ability being that he can run fast. Literally, how is this guy a threat? Well, he's not really. You discover that running is genuinely all this guy has, with the main threat being the gas which gets leaked into the room, making the whole concept of this boss fight rely on, on how fast we can kill him. It's very underwhelming. There's no alternative ways we can take him down, or unique strategies to employ here. All we have to do is chase him around the rooms while placing mines on the ground, which he'll run into. Enough said. One thing that's even more annoying here, though, is that no checkpoint is put in place before the boss fight, with the final one that would have been activated being one in the desert area, which leads to the hind D. Which means if you fail, which I genuinely did a few times due to being unable to beat the boss in time, you've got to go back across the swamp again, which is just a pure nightmare. With the level 3 keycard now in hand, we can do a few things. First of which is to enter a nearby room and get some information on where a stinger missile is from some kids. This of course being able to be used against the hind boss in a moment. But let's not skip over the fact that kids are actually in this game, locked up in cells and wandering around. Although the dialogue doesn't indicate they're particularly bothered by this for some reason. It's quite a ballsy move to put kids in a game that features violent elements to begin with, especially because they're actually able to be killed by the player, having the exact same health loss repercussions as the prisoners from the first game. And although they're never put in any kind of peril throughout the game, I find the mere inclusion of them here to mostly show Kojima's strong adherence to his plots. A lot of other developers would have shied away from including kids here, let alone giving you the ability to actually kill them. But as they've already been mentioned, to be located in Zanzibar land, and also for the purposes of further reinforcing the big bad villain that is Big Boss, they were put in mainly as a striking visual, and also an information source. Heading back to building one to acquire the stinger missile, we actually end up seeing some streamlining to the keycards here, which wasn't just unexpected, but entirely welcome. One of the new doors we can enter holds a red keycard, which replaces all the other three existing keycards we're holding, and merges them into one. As there's still a lot of keycards to acquire, those also eventually being merged with their blue and green counterparts, it's still not the most functional system in the world, but you best believe it's a lot less finicky than what we've dealt with previously. During this time, we're also able to find weapons like the submachine gun, which is a far greater alternative to the pistol, finally giving us a weapon that has bullet spread, as well as obviously having a weapon that fires automatically, which can be very good for getting yourself out of tight scrapes, due to accuracy not being as much as of a concern. With Stinger in hand though, it's time to take on that hind D, in a boss fight that while not being particularly challenging when you know your way around it, definitely presents a more unique challenge. This is because unlike other bosses we've gone up against in Metal Gear 1 and 2, the Hind D isn't actually on screen during this fight, but instead flying around the air and shooting down at us. This fight's a lot more based on guesswork in terms of how effectively you'll be able to get your shots off, because although the Hind D's shadow can be seen on the ground, it's actually more effective to pay attention to the radar here, something that worryingly has been where my eyes have been focused on for a large part of this game, although we'll get onto that criticism a bit later on. The Stinger has a very large area of attack, as long as you're preemptively firing every time the hind enters one of the four squares that makes up the arena, you'll be guaranteed to hit it every time. I wouldn't say it's an absolute pushover though, the damage the hind gives out is quite significant, and the fact it's in the air during the battle does present a bit more of a disorientating effect. Ultimately, I think it's one of the best encounters in the game, despite not even lasting that long. It's got a unique concept and a surprisingly solid execution, not much else to really say about it. Moving on to the second building, we're told once again by the colonel to check information in the software manual, this time being a change of frequency, the reason for 
this currently being unknown. We're also told here that using a cardboard box and jumping onto the nearby conveyor belt is the most effective way of getting inside. So, discovering the cardboard box once again, which from here on out becomes one of the most recognisable staples of the franchise, we make our way inside. Very shortly after, we get a call from our ally Holly, who's apparently been captured and is being held inside the building. And it's definitely during this section where the reintroduction of convoluted instructions and confusing level design rears its head once again. You could almost assume that from the main bulk of the floor we enter at, the ground floor being one big spiral, with a few different elevators spread about which gradually get closer to the centre. It would be a reasonable assumption to make that because the first elevator we come across is on the outer layer of this spiral, this is most likely the one we need to go on first, but you'd be wrong. It's actually the second elevator which can be found in this spiral, a design which I should mention isn't just horrible to traverse because of how long it takes, but also presents that very same annoying issue if you end up getting caught, where you'll never be able to get out of the enemy's line of sight no matter how fast you run. Although that's not as much of an issue, considering there's some small crevices which are laid out all around the spiral, presumably to try counteract the criticism I just brought up, although I still think it's valid. Going down the elevator takes us to a sewer filled with kids, and it's here where we can find Holly, being located behind a hidden wall, which thankfully don't get used anywhere near as much compared to the first game. The writing and music during Snake and Holly's conversation insinuates there's supposed to be some kind of romantic atmosphere here. But not only is the character of Holly not anywhere near developed enough for us to have any interest in her character, but there's also been no signs of romantic tension between the two for the whole game. And I mean even when they're talking with each other, which hardly happens anyway. We're told a carrier pigeon sent by Dr. Marv might be the key to locating him. Heading back to the spiral room and up the center elevator takes us to a boss fight against a guy called Red Blaster, and he's hands down the easiest fight in the game. I hardly had to move from my starting location, the guy moves so slow that the main way of attacking him that being with grenades, which have now replaced the grenade launcher weapon. It was almost impossible to miss. Add that to the fact he basically follows your every move, making your accuracy even less of an issue, and also that the grenades he throws down at you are incredibly slow too, perhaps even slower than your ones. And it makes for a boss that is just terrible, for almost the opposite reasons of ones like Black Ninja. It's so easy that it feels borderline unfinished. It turns out that Red Blaster was guarding the way to the roof, which upon blowing open the door to it, we discover the carrier pigeon flying around. This is another simple moment that I think is played out very effectively, and it's once again based on the idea of context sensitivity, or I suppose a lack thereof in this case. For those who are unaware, context sensitivity is a type of game principle, which is based on things like allowing players to perform certain actions they typically aren't privy to for the bulk of the game. So for example, before Breath of the Wild, the Zelda games oftentimes had fishing mini games, ones which were activated by a button prompt and bring you into a self-contained fishing moment. The reason this would be considered context sensitive is due to the fact that fishing is something you can't do anywhere outside of this specific minigame. You can't pull out a fishing rod and throw it into any sort of pond yourself. You need to be at the exact location which allows you to do this. Fast forward to Breath of the Wild and fishing appears to be entirely removed, but that's only if you're referring to the idea of catching fish with solely a fishing rod. Things in this game were made far less context sensitive, so in turn, the act of fishing now has to be performed slightly differently, using things like bombs which you can explode in the water and see fish rise to the surface. The minigame approach might seem more authentic to the fishing concept, but the other presents more freedom by not restricting these moments to specific points and specific ways of catching your fish. The reason I bring this up here is that despite obviously not being as broad as Breath of the Wild, one thing this pigeon moment showcases is the idea of items that are multi-purpose. I define this moment as semi-context sensitive, due to the fact that the only way to catch this pigeon is by using one of your pre-existing rations, something which before this point has only ever been used for health regeneration. By having these rations be utilised in a similar effect throughout the endurance of the game, that's when something becomes fully defined as non-context sensitive in my eyes. But of course here they aren't. It might seem quite insignificant here, but although I might sound like a broken record, with hindsight this definitely appears to be a very loose foundation to what will eventually become a lot of instances that are non-context sensitive in the future. When capturing the pigeon there appears to be some kind of code attached to its leg, signed off by Dr. Marv, and by phoning a guy called Master Miller, another one of those characters that I had to actively search up to get his frequency, due to me never actually receiving a call from him in my playthrough. It's said that it's some kind of digital number. One thing I do like here, which works as a great in-between in terms of feeling completely lost and knowing exactly what to do, is that this is more of a hint, with Miller even signing off with a sort of confident wink that will piece everything together. But what I like even more here is that if you're still genuinely confused about what you need to do, giving Master Miller a second 
second call will have them basically solve it for you. Something that gets questioned and criticised by the gaming community, with a lot of people in recent memory hating the idea of easy modes for hard games and skip buttons for players who are struggling. But I've never seen an issue at all. If you're not struggling, great, keep playing and enjoying yourself. There's no need to criticise other players which are having a good time just because they're not having the exact same experience as you. The code ends up leading to Marv's frequency, but there's one issue. We don't understand the language he's speaking. So after a call with Madnar, we're told to find a woman called Gustava, who's disguised as one of the guards, with the way of locating her being to go somewhere only a woman would go. That being a woman's toilet, of course. This whole concept is just hilarious. There's no women soldiers anyway, so why would they have a woman's toilet in the first place? And if she's trying to stay undercover, doesn't entering the woman's toilet seem like one of the worst ideas she could possibly do? Things start becoming frustrating once again after this though. Not only because we have to backtrack to the first building, but we've also got to access numerous doors which were once locked off to us, which as I've said, will surely only be remembered by the player if they've noted it down. This part left me stuck for quite a while because I had no clue what doors and floors I've already been to, and what doors I could actually access with my keycards. To sum up though, you're able to now acquire more equipment that we used in the first game, like night vision goggles and RC missiles, and then head up to level 4 and access the door on the left to another area filled with sensors, guards and children. One of the rooms we enter on our way to the woman's toilets, utilising the night vision goggles, which now have the added effect of changing the tint of our screen to a bluish colour, giving the goggles more personality compared to the flashlight we utilised in the first game. For some reason, there's quite a few interesting concepts in this particular area, which are never really matched before or after this. It's hard to describe. It made this section stick out a lot in my mind, but for what reason that was done, I wasn't really sure. For example, you've already got our first exposure to the night vision goggles, which is already quite distinct, but then shortly after that, we get a few rooms filled with soldier mannequins, which end up also having a few actual enemies hidden amongst them. A really cool concept for these rooms, with a practical solution to solving them too, as by using your binoculars before entering each room, you'll be able to determine where the hidden soldiers are depending on the directions they're facing. Then, shortly after we leave these rooms, we're presented with another room with unique effects, which we'll have to come back to later, and that's the freezer. Inside, we find a couple rations which are frozen, however taking a look to our inventory, we'll see the rations we're carrying are frozen as well, presenting a temporary hindrance we'll have to deal with every time we enter the freezer, where we'll have to wait for the rations to thaw out before we can actually use them again. Nothing that will affect your game substantially unless you're getting into fights a lot, but just a little detail which was quite unexpected. Up ahead is the toilets, where we need to wait around for a while until right on schedule, a guard wanders down and ends up heading into the female toilets, this being revealed to be Gustava, who was mentioned earlier. The dialogue that's shared between Snake and Gustava could have some interesting commentary if you read into it, but I think that's genuinely all it is at this point. My mind started wearing up when it's mentioned that Gustava is most likely an ice skater who competed in and won gold at the Calgary Olympics. A female athlete that's been recognised and commended on a global scale, now being sent into a war zone as a trained spy. Why and how did she end up in this position? Does her involvement in the Olympics have anything to do with the organisation she's following orders from? Why would they pick such a recognisable figure, one that Snake was able to identify immediately, for such a high stakes mission? Lots of questions that ultimately are irrelevant. We'll find out later on that all this stuff revolved around Gustava is merely serving as a bit of character development, which will be elaborated on before an emotional culmination. We're led down to some sewers via a conveniently placed elevator that's literally in the woman's bathroom, and proceed through another maze-like section filled with sweepers. A nice detail here being the fact that as Gustava is now tagging along with us, she can be seen following closely behind Snake. A decision that I much prefer compared to a lot of other top-down games in this style, specifically RPGs, which merely have the characters merge into one and pop out whenever there's an important moment. Journeying through the sewers, we eventually find an elevator to Madnar's location, and following on from our greetings, we get a moment that serves as a very apt foreshadowing of the direction Kojima will eventually take the Metal Gear games in the future, in a number of aspects too. It begins with us heading up for a few identical screens on our way to another elevator, working as a nice transitory moment for the player, which I've previously described as putting the player in stasis. This effect could be done for numerous reasons. Perhaps you've just come off a high stakes encounter and the devs want you to take a breather and reflect on what you've just been through. Or perhaps like in this case, it's a more simple matter of having the long distance you're travelling be manifested into a more literal depiction. So whereas a couple screens in Metal Gear 1 were actually explained to be a very long distance, here we're being shown visually how far we're travelling, the time it takes to reach our destination, perhaps subconsciously closening the bonds of you and your allies, or maybe making the world feel more expansive. As I said, there's numerous reasons why this kind of stuff can be employed in a game, 
However, I believe Kojima does this here for cinematic purposes once again, which comes in the form of our conversation with Gustava after we stop for a short break. The music is the key thing in this conversation for me. The extent of emotion that's trying to be conveyed from the static text coming up on screen can only go so far. The most you get are things like certain punctuation being used in sentences, or having the words slowly come up on screen when a character's come to some kind of shocking conclusion. The music, however, is the only real indicator for me in relation to how I'm supposed to be feeling. In this case, having a sort of wistful, reflective type quality, applying well to Gustava's discussion about her mother, who lived in Poland during World War II. One thing you might have noticed so far about the writing is that it's, uh, well, it's not all that great. Don't get me wrong, I think Kojima was a figure who at times during the Metal Gear series was miles above any other writer in the gaming scene. And I suppose you can somewhat apply that here, merely due to this game tackling themes and concepts that were rather left field for gaming at the time. Of course, ideas like war have been focused on all the way back since Tank or Battlezone. But whereas those games are using war and artillery as a means to have fun, Kojima already takes a more interesting approach by using subtext and introducing real-world conflicts to portray the horrors of war. That's a very strong theme throughout a lot of the Metal Gear games in my opinion. A sort of anti-war, anti-violence angle. War, at points, is portrayed as a means to an end, but only in the case of villains is it ever actually shown as a net positive. But as I was saying, although the ideas which are focused on in Metal Gear 2 were definitely more interesting than what we saw in the first game, I don't think the writing has yet reached a level where you're actually connecting to these characters properly. Or at least that's how I personally felt. Perhaps it's because I'm missing the classic voice acting from the future games which I've played before this, or maybe it's because moments like the ones with Gustava in the sewers are few and far between in terms of the overall game. Who knows, but it has to be said, the writing can only improve from this point on. Although I am obviously aware a lot of people still have very substantial and ultimately reasonable issues with Kojima's writing overall, labelling it as cliched, convoluted, and even pretentious at points. I don't necessarily agree with those views, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't understand where these criticisms were coming from. One of the main criticisms are highlighted quite effectively in our talk with Gustava, and that's how blunt a lot of the dialogue is, where even metaphors are made to appear so obvious that I can understand why some people would find them laughable. Lines like, it was something about the ice, it felt cold, and having that be paired up with her mother's horrors from the Warsaw Uprising paints a very clear picture, which I think is actually a positive trait of Kojima's writing. The bluntness can lead way to very interesting visuals that can be painted in the player's mind. They might be obvious and straightforward at points, but I assume because of how the dialogue is translated and conveyed to to audiences outside of Japan, there's inevitably an aspect of the writing that's lost, this being something which permeates through some of the later games too, where multiple lines of dialogue have different, albeit usually subtle differences, between the English and Japanese versions of the games. Anyways, the entire conversation between Snake and Gustava is good overall. We get some insight on Gustava's character, which ultimately ends up being quite futile and tropey due to upcoming events in the very short future, giving us details like the only love interest in her life being someone called Frank Hunter. Having Snake and Gustava Gustava bond over the fact they're completely alone without any kind of family, explaining that she joined the STB and ended up here due to her asylum bid being rejected, and losing her chance to compete in any future sporting events. A lot of backstory is given out in fairly quick succession, which obviously would have been nice if Gustava is a character that sticks around for a while, having us grow an even closer bond to her character by having her personality be enhanced by the backstory we're given. But as we'll see, that's merely not the case. We discover this when reaching a bridge on the rooftop we've been making our way towards, where we actually see what a appears to be a set piece play out, which I not only found quite unexpected, but pretty impressive too. The execution isn't perfect, taking us out of the gameplay so the two characters who were training behind us can cross individually for whatever reason. Well, we know the reason ultimately, we can see it a mile away, with Madnar crossing first, then Gustava crossing halfway before the bridge is destroyed with some kind of missile strike. <laughs> A final talk with Gustava before she dies features some hilariously blunt dialogue. I was always skating around. I never learned to plant my two feet on the ground and walk. See what I'm saying? You get what Kojima's getting at, and I'll be honest, this type of thing happens so often that it actually becomes a positive for me in terms of how I find this style of writing to be very Kojima, in spite of how lame it can sometimes be. My only real issue is one that's shared between a lot of games, movies, and TV shows, and that's having a character that's blatantly underdeveloped be put at centre stage 
age for a period of time before they inevitably die. It's something that happens so often that it never surprises me anymore. Just keep an eye out for this in whatever piece of media you're indulging in. If all of a sudden a character that's hardly given any screen time is given a large amount of time on screen, or perhaps suddenly are given a fleshed out backstory, just wait a few minutes and chances are you'll end up either seeing them dead or something to that similar degree. In my eyes, it's about as lazy as you can get in terms of storytelling. It's like someone suddenly realising a story beat they've got planned for their character doesn't work because we hardly know who that character actually is. So as an attempt to make the audience care about them, they rushedly insert exposition to try make them care, not realising that audiences will only care about the character after a prolonged time with them, where they also showcase what makes their character likeable and unique. One thing I do really like here though is the introduction of the new Metal Gear. This being less of an introduction, but an intimidating glimpse at only the feet of the giant mech, which will inevitably have to go up against towards the end of the game. But that's not all. The man piloting the mech is none other than Grey Fox, who much like Schneider, left Foxhound and followed Big Boss to this new Zanzibar land operation. Big Boss's survival from Metal Gear 1 still being the most mysterious plot point in the game as of yet. With the level 6 keycard and brooch in hand from Gustava, we're told by Holly that we're going to have to make our way back to Building 1 and acquire a hand glider so we can bypass the bridge. As you can already assume at this point, the backtracking is something I'm once again not a fan of at all. It's important to note I don't despise the idea of backtracking in general. Metal Gear games in the future prove backtracking can be an incredibly effective tool to familiarise yourself with areas, in turn making them more distinct, and also saving resources during game development by not having to create a wider amount of unique areas. As opposed to those future games however, the process here is always too long, especially in moments like this, where it feels like we've just made a large amount of progress, before making us travel right back to the starting area of the game once again. Luckily though, when going to acquire this hand glider, we do also stumble across some other useful items too. First of which would be the second coloured keycard, this time combining cards 4, 5 and 6 into a blue card. And there's also things like the return of body armour, which significantly reduces incoming damage, and also the pitfalls from the first game, which still work as traps here. Unlike before, however, the pitfalls are far more balanced than fair, taking up a much smaller space on the ground, and opening up slow enough to where you'll be able to avoid them if you're continually walking across them. Any hesitation will still most likely lead to you falling down and dying, but I think it's a lot fairer compared to the nightmarish ones before. It's very important to explore the first building thoroughly now that you have the blue key card, as it not only gives you access to these very useful pieces of equipment, but it also will give you a much easier time when attempting to get the hand glider. See, although it's found on the first floor, literally being the area we arrive in upon coming back to the first building, the pathway to it is filled with guards which can't be avoided. This single problem uses both the exploration and items that we've acquired quite effectively, with our first objective being to understand that the brooch we've been given can actually turn into a key under the right conditions. This information is once again discovered by a few of the kids that are wandering around particular floors, telling us both how we can turn this brooch into a key and where we can find Gustava's locker to actually use the key. I'm not really sure how all these kids would know this information, considering they're always locked up in the same rooms, but it's whatever really. My only problem with giving the player information in this way is the very high probability for them to miss out on it, and for them to become completely lost. Not all doors lead to where the objective actually is, and you've got to take into account that on top of these rooms which aren't directly thrown in front of the player as they're making their way to a destination, the keycard system makes it so that many players will forget which doors they've actually opened, possibly missing out on some quite vital direction. Anyways, we're given enough info to where we understand that we need to head to the sauna in the crew's quarters. We then need to wait a while till the brooch transforms into the key, and then head back to a nearby locker room and open up Gustava's locker, containing a cassette tape inside. Despite not using it that much, I found the cassette to be one of the most overpowered items in the game, because as you can see when using it to get the hand glider, all the guards in the room now stand to attention while the Zanzibar Land National Anthem plays. At the time, I thought it was a nice context sensitive function that merely made it easier for us to get the item, but it turns out you can use the cassette past this point and the same effect will happen. Due to me experiencing this a few times, I decided to stay away from the cassette tape for the most part, as to not completely destroy the stealth gameplay, but it's definitely an item that can get you out of some tight scrapes if necessary. The moments which lead on from acquiring the hand glider are actually pretty great overall. We of course have to make our way back to the second building, something which now becomes slightly easier considering a fast travel point is now opened up in the swamp area, where we can use our cardboard box to transport us directly into the second building. But attempting to get back up to the roof leads away to a surprising ambush set up by Grey Fox, where we're thrown into a boss fight against four assassins known as the Four Horsemen, who apparently get their orders directly from the president. Quite a substantial detail to just throw out there, but we've already established that during these earlier games, Kojima's working with a lot of big ideas, with no real substance as of yet, which I think is fine for now. Despite being quite easy once you've figured out what makes these four guys 
tick. I actually really enjoyed this boss fight. It's pretty much a juggling act during the first stage, with the assassins being unable to attack you until they jump down onto the elevator, with which assassins jump down depending on what side of the elevator you're on. For example, if you place yourself in the lower right corner of the elevator, the assassins on the left and top of the screen will jump down and try to attack you. After you realise this, it's merely a matter of taking out the assassins in the order which is most convenient. The best way of dealing with them in my case was to wipe out the assassins on either the top and bottom or right and left sides of the screen first, which means you won't have assassins coming at you from two different angles. After you've done that, the fight's basically over. As you can see by the end of the fight, it's merely a matter of making the assassin jump down, getting some damage off, and then repeating the process. It's not an easy fight though. The barrage of bullets that gets fired at you during the opening part will definitely require some rations to be on hand, in case you take a substantial amount of damage. And not to mention, each individual assassin is quite durable as well, so it might take a while for you to actually get rid of some of these guys to get yourself into a more prime and stable position to eliminate all of them. I'd likely say it's one of my favourite encounters across the whole game. It feels balanced, frenetic, and intense. I can't see myself asking much more from a full-on offensive encounter from this game than this. The great moments don't end here, however, as due to the elevator being destroyed during our battle, we instead have to take the stairs, with a sequence that should be very familiar if you've played Metal Gear Solid, the next game in the series. It's sort of like a parallel to the sewer transitory moment from earlier, still making us work our way to a new area, but this time, showing this in the form of a more intense chase scene. It's very simple, the alert and guards in this area are endless, so all that's left for us to do is make our way up to floor 20 as fast as we can, potentially collecting supplies like ammunition that we can find on our way and fighting off guards that get too close. It's nothing too special of course, but definitely something that stands out from other moments. It's a good example of how a drawn out process akin to the backtracking we see in this game is actually made to work with a simple set piece, as opposed to backtracking where it's literally walking to our destination with hardly any new threats in between. Here, we're being tailed by a constant threat that could potentially kill us. This single threat also makes a far superior moment compared to if we just went up the elevator like normal. It uses the assassins, which was already a unique moment, to in turn create another unique moment in the form of this. When actually reaching floor 20 and heading to the outside area, we're given a call from our number one fan, telling us the only way to use the hand glider effectively is to make sure the wind is pointing in the right direction. Depending on if you have gas grenades, you can actually check this for yourself, as throwing one of them out here either shows an arrow pointing south or north. Firstly, I like the idea of the number one fan to begin with. It's just one of those intriguing things that's left hung in the balance, and the fact that he's contacted us at the exact point where we're getting ready to use our hand glider makes us feel like we're actively being watched. And although I do like how the gas is used to indicate which direction the wind's blowing, it ultimately doesn't really matter. The only way you can get the wind to shift north is by smoking one of your cigarettes. Shortly after we land, we're thrown into a boss fight against Jungle Evil, yet another point in the game which is clearly expanded on in future titles, this boss in particular being remade in Metal Gear Solid 3 and going on to be known as one of the best boss fights in gaming history. I really like the concept of this fight, as from the tall grass that envelops the arena, you can see that Jungle Evil's main way of getting damage off on you is to use the environment to his advantage. It's one of the only bosses we've seen up to this point that uses the same kind of stealth that you've been using throughout the game, presenting an interesting dynamic off the bat. The only thing I will say about this fight is that the concept isn't used to its max potential. I think this fight would have worked a lot better with a hide and seek type of approach, where you're continually having to track down Jungle Evil and blow him out of whatever cover he's hiding in. I also would have liked if your own stealth abilities were able to be put to use during this fight, a strange paradox that's permeated all of the bosses so far. Despite both games having a heavy emphasis on stealth, when it comes to boss fights, the enemies know exactly where you are at all times, in turn, meaning there's literally no way to use stealth effectively during the encounters. Especially here, I feel like having stealth on stealth would have been really effective. As I said, sneaking up behind the enemy and striking while they're completely unaware. It's a boss fight that boils down to cool concept, bland execution. The hiding is the best part of the fight, and I also like how there's four different screens which make up the arena, meaning that at points you're having to actively chase Jungle Evil around and relocate him if you lose track of him, but it's ultimately his attacks which let him down, just getting out of the grass, standing in one spot and firing, giving you ample opportunity to throw a grenade right on him. After this boss fight, we get a really strange moment involving two eggs which can be found in the building to the north. It's one of those things which made me realise how truly gamey this game is. Discovering the eggs just lying on the floor in random rooms, but being surrounded with infrared lasers. There's other stuff like this in the game, like how the kids are just left to roam around the sewers for whatever reason, or how there's hidden walls frequently placed amongst certain areas. Stuff that you could stretch the logic of to an extent to try and have it make sense, but ultimately are just decisions made for game design reasons, less to do with actually making the location feel authentic. It doesn't apply to 
everything, obviously, and is one of the reasons why Metal Gear was seen as a more mature and grounded game compared to a lot of others at the time. But the gaminess is still in plain sight at points. The significance of the eggs could possibly stretch from Big Boss wanting to cultivate some kind of wildlife sanctuary in this base, to quite literally the devs not knowing where to actually place these eggs. But the weirdest part comes about when you enter a few more screens after acquiring the egg, as you begin to see it start cracking open. Radioing Jacobson, the wildlife expert, he identifies the egg as a type of boa, which is a snake, leading to a nice unique moment where we need to go into our inventory and stop the boa before it reaches our rations. Failing to do so genuinely results in one of our rations being eaten, so it might not be a high stakes moment, but one that could definitely impact your progress in the future if you fail to stop it soon enough. The two eggs we picked up might seem pointless right now, but by the time you reach the next guard outpost, this being one with lasers blocking the entrance, we discover the other egg is actually an owl, which we can use nearby to make the guards turn off the lasers, being told by one of the kids nearby that they turn off the power at night time, presumably to save energy. Before we move on to the next boss fight up ahead, that being Night Fright, I just want to mention the fact that I haven't been talking about the design of a lot of these locations outside of the first building. I began Metal Gear 2 talking about the uniqueness of the floors. For example, having the second floor of the first building take advantage of the prone abilities we've now been given, as well as the new floor tiles which let the enemy know there's someone nearby. But the fact is, outside of the few exceptions, like the freezer which freezes our rations, the level design is very similar from start to finish. Maze-like levels with enemies scattered across them, rooms with nothing in them except rations and ammo. It's not just the level design that's quite standard for the endurance of the game, but the visuals as well. Yet again, the opening showcases numerous different wall textures, steel bars which line walkways, tanks, vents on the ground, crates, and then you look at the game as a whole and realise the box rooms with identical tiles merely painted a different colour is still the majority of the experience, just like the first. The only difference which is a definite positive is the more unique outside areas like the swamp and desert locations, and even this outpost that we've gotten to. The outside areas appear far more lively, with tons more unique textures that we aren't typically privy to inside the blocky, metallic looking buildings. You might be thinking, what, you want them to put a swamp in a building? And I'm not saying that, I just wish there was more variety in the actual buildings themselves, in many aspects of their design. The way you navigate the three buildings are almost indistinguishable. They all have elevators, and they all have floors with separate rooms in with equipment that will help you progress to the next area. To many, this may sound like a non-complaint, but when you're playing a game for upwards of 6 to 7 hours, I think there should be a wider amount of variety in the areas you're predominantly exploring. On to Night Fright, our call with our number one fan before the fight lets us into a few discoveries here, the first of which being the fact that all of the bosses we fought up to this point are known under the collective term The Whispers, and also the fact that Night Fright is using a state-of-the-art camouflage suit which makes him invisible, so we can already see that following on from Jungle Weevil, we've got another boss who prefers to remain undetected during the fight, in which we still can't reciprocate these same qualities here. Overall though, I thought this fight was really lame for one reason. Once you land a shot on Night Fright, the fight is basically over. The concept of it is sort of taking Jungle Weevil to the next level. Instead of having him pop out the grass and surprise you, Night Fright is completely invisible, with the noise generating floor tiles that make up the arena presumably being put in place so that you can locate him. Even though there's four separate screens with different types of floor tiles, I never found any use in actually traveling to those screens, considering Night Fright basically comes right to you anyway. And as I said, even though the idea of an invisible enemy who we can only locate by sound is interesting, the fight just doesn't play out how you'd think. First off, you can see the bullets which fire out of his gun, with the information we're told beforehand about his weapon not giving out any sound being useless basically. It doesn't matter if there's no sound, wherever the bullets are coming from, that's where he is. And then of course, once you land a shot on him, you're able to actually see him. Although, there's a strange thing with this guy which renders him unable to move while he's been revealed. So, as you could naturally assume, weapons like the submachine gun make this boss a complete joke, stun locking Night Fright in place before he explodes. Once again, good concept, bad execution. You've also got to understand that to actually get up to this point, we would have had to beat all of the preceding bosses which have also increased our health bar, and as you can see, our health at the bottom has now gotten substantially larger than when we started the game. Pair that up with the body armour and you've pretty much got a recipe for an unstoppable killing machine, which I think could be gratifying in its own right considering how vulnerable we've been for a large part of the experience, but an effect like this also has to be handled carefully and sparingly, so as to not turn the game into a monotonous cycle where you can kill everything easily and never be at risk of dying yourself. After the fight, we end up getting one of the worst backtracking moments in the entire game, when it's revealed the door up ahead requires keycard 9, a keycard that was actually dropped by Jungle Weevil but is hidden amongst grass. This moment is just inexcusably annoying and unnecessary, no new threats in between, no new challenges, just a straight dash back to Jungle Weevil's boss arena and then back to this door. 
I have no idea why Night Fright couldn't have just dropped the ninth keycard to begin with. Inside the room, however, we discover Dr. Madnar standing beside a dead Dr. Marv. We already pretty much know what's gonna go down here, considering Snake's observation of a bruise on Marv's neck, which Madnar merely shrugs off. But after this, we get some very meta dialogue that we've of course previously experienced in the first game, with Big Boss telling us to turn our console off. But with the mention of the MSX computer, the game company Konami, and Snake labelling the MSX as the world's best-selling brand of computer, it's clear to see that fourth wall breaks and meta is something that would end up defining the Metal Gear series for a lot of people. We get a call from Holly, giving us some backstory on Madnar after the events of Metal Gear 1, saying that he was ousted from the scientific community in the West, and has been searching for a way to get back at them. In turn, he became a double agent for Zanzibar Land, with his main goal being to gain the formula for Oil X, which is where the MSX cartridge that was mentioned comes into play, as the formula is actually hidden inside that very cartridge. With Madnar admitting his part in killing both Marv and Gustava, he attempts to strangle us in one of the worst fights in the game. It's very simplistic, all you have to do is use the RC missiles to hit Madnar from behind, but it was very annoying when trying to do this, due to the I can't breathe message that continually flashes up on screen during the fight. I also don't know what this guy's made of, but judging from how many missiles it takes to put him down, he seems to be some kind of titanium monster. Ultimately, it just feels like a complete waste of rations that you've saved up over time, as despite the RC missiles being the most effective way to deal with this guy, he pretty much ran through all of my rations because of how many shots it actually takes to put him down. With Madnar dealt with and the game rearing up for its closing segment, we have another backtracking sequence, where we need to go into the freezer to once again transform Gustava's brooch into a key. Pointless and annoying as always, but I still genuinely like the idea of having temperature affect the brooch, giving the sauna and freezer unique functions outside of merely holding equipment. And upon getting back to Marv, while also potentially collecting the final green key card, which combines the final few cards together, we can now open the locker and witness yet another strange but interesting interaction, which doesn't occur anywhere else in the game. Not only is the locker made to appear like a full-on room, a strange inclusion that translates to all of the lockers we enter in this game, but on the other side of the room, through a crevice, is a room full of rats, which holds the MSX cartridge. One call to Jacobson lets us know that these rats are highly poisonous, which is definitely true, as one bite from these guys and we die immediately. Rations are also used once again to trick the wildlife. Previously, it was to capture the pigeon, and now they're used to lead the rats out of the crevice so we can eliminate them all. With cartridge in hand, Madnar gives a final message to Snake on how to destroy Metal Gear, the process once again being revolved around the Metal Gear's legs. Luckily, this time though, it doesn't require the incredibly long-winded right and left combination from before. Snake falls down a pitfall which opens up beneath him, and after stocking up on equipment, it's time to face Metal Gear. I think this boss fight lives up to the expectations that have been set up throughout the game, especially when compared to Metal Gear 1, where we're pretty much fighting against the security cameras while placing explosives on the inactive Metal Gear. Here, we're fighting a Metal Gear that's being piloted by Grey Fox, a two birds with one stone situation. And in terms of the boss fight itself, it's fine for the most part. The appearance of Metal Gear is genuinely quite impressive. Snake appears tiny when paired up against the giant mech. The process of eliminating it might be very similar to the first game, but considering we're fighting a Metal Gear that's actively retaliating, it feels more like a one-on-one -on -one showdown, which I liked. Something I don't like is the contact damage with this thing, especially when considering how close Metal Gear likes to get to us. Touching any part of the Metal Gear results in immediate death, which I found slightly annoying. You can see in cases like this, I shouldn't even be touching it when walking behind it, yet I still die instantly. That's sort of my biggest problem with this fight. Metal Gear walks so far forward that it leaves little to no room to walk around and dodge its attacks, as well as making it considerably harder to throw our grenades at its legs because of the set range of where these get thrown out. At the end of the day, it's a great visual, but a fairly easy boss. It doesn't even take that many grenades to put this thing down, and I had a much harder time when fighting bosses like Black Ninja compared to Metal Gear. The variation of attacks is fairly limited, but what we do see here is great. Mixing up bullet-based attacks which follow us around the arena, alongside the RC missiles it shoots out, which also hone in on our position if we don't dodge out the way. As I said earlier though, body armor, paired up with the ridiculously large health bar we've now got, in turn makes the fight feel incredibly easy. We can essentially brute force our way through all of its attacks and still be fine. The closing segment after this, however, likely features some of the most memorable moments in the entire game for me, starting with a similar process to the snake which ate our rations from earlier, where we need to remove all the items from our inventory due to them being set alight from the destruction of Metal Gear. This more extreme repetition of the snake moment being fantastic in terms of the final few encounters we've got here. The first of which being a one-on-one -on -one with Grey Fox, in which we're told by the character Kassler, someone who I literally didn't interact with for the entire game, a bit more about Grey Fox's past before we fight him. I really hate that this aspect still carries over from the first Metal Gear. Optional characters that we could have previously 
previously cool to ones I was never aware of just cropping up in the closing moments of the game and talking to us like we're familiar with them. Either use a character like the Colonel, who from the very opening of the game is unable to be avoided, or just make this Castler character mandatory to talk to at a certain point. Just throwing them in at the last second when they've been entirely optional up to this point just feels weird. Some quite important revelations are thrown out here about Grey Fox, however, like how his real name is Frank Jaeger, or rather Frank Hunter when translating what Jaeger actually means in German. Of course, we can remember from earlier that Gustava's one love in life was a man going under the exact same name, making his murder of her earlier on pack a bit more of a punch in retrospect, showing just how far gone Grey Fox is with his loyalty to Big Boss. As for our fight with him though, it's fine, but nothing special either. I really like the setup of having all our equipment stripped away from us, leaving Snake and Grey Fox's only option to be an all-out brawl, something which is amplified even further due to the tight space of the room, as well as the mines which surround the outskirts of the arena. My only issue is that it's another fight that's just incredibly easy. Grey Fox hardly even tried to attack me the entire fight, instead just running around the outskirts while continually getting hit without any resistance or retaliation. It's the perfect kind of setup for a back and forth between the two fighters, but in my case it just felt like Snake beating Grey Fox to a pulp while Fox tries to run away. He does eventually try to attack you of course, and from how he does it, it feels like they designed this fight in a way so you only retaliate when Fox tries to get on the inside and attack. And if that was the case, I think I would have preferred this fight. Dodging out the way of an attack and countering would be a lot more satisfying than what actually happens here. With Fox down, he explains why he stayed so loyal to Big Boss, with Boss saving him as a child while he was being sent into forced labour in Vietnam, and again as a soldier while being tortured in Mozambique. The most interesting part for me here is the philosophizing we see in terms of war and the purpose of war to many people's lives. Grey Fox is someone who was brought up as a soldier, lived as a soldier, and will die as a soldier. He didn't live a life like billions of others. War is all he knew. The possibility of achieving anything outside of war is too much of an abstract concept. His mind has literally been warped from birth to believe fighting is all he's good for, and without it, he believes he's useless and might as well be dead anyway. It'll be a while before we actually get to them, but these ideas are at the centre of games like Peace Walker and Metal Gear Solid 5. War being painted out as an undeniably bad thing, much like Grey Fox says himself, but also being portrayed as a necessary part of a lot of people's lives, specifically child soldiers like Grey Fox was. Fox feels like fighting on the battlefield is his only means of surviving, and attached to Big Boss due to him actively cultivating an environment where war is never ending. First without a heaven, and now with Zanzibar land, Big Boss is giving people like Fox a place to fight. It's undeniably an evil act on Big Boss's part, but one that when looking at what appears to be the hopeless casualties of this environment, like Grey Fox, appears to show an active bias and willingness to spur on certain individuals like himself for his own gains. Big Boss's ultimate goal here is once again resting on nuclear weapons and devastating mechanical robots. He is undeniably a villain, but it's in moments like this where you actually begin to understand Big Boss's thought process, one focused around war as a way of life, perceiving his recruitment of child soldiers as a form of rescuing them, giving them rehabilitation in the form of sending them back out to the battlefield, and feeding into their most visceral instincts, ignoring the possibility of peace in Entirely. Perhaps with Big Boss thinking peace is something that will merely never be achieved in the long term, a stance that isn't actually too irrational when looking at how often history repeats itself. The only person left to fight is Big Boss himself, who we encounter shortly after leaving Grey Fox's arena, and I'd say our fight with him actually turns out to be one of the best here. Our talk with him before the fight echoes a lot of the same sentiments as Grey Fox. He makes Snake, and thus the player controlling Snake, reflect on their actions for the entirety of the game, with Snake not showing any interest to what many people's core fundamentals are made up of. Power, money, and yet war is the only thing that Snake continually pursues in life. Perhaps Snake and Big Boss aren't too different when looking at it from that angle. One who fights for good is ultimately still fighting. When taking a step back and removing the vindictiveness and evil intentions from those classified as the enemy, war is merely a back and forth of arms and artillery. They shoot first and you fire right back at them. Big Boss reveals the children we found throughout the game are in fact being trained to eventually become soldiers for his ever-increasing army. Start a war, fan its flames, create victims, then save them, train them, and feed them back onto the battlefield. This is Big Boss's cycle of war, deciding there's no way out of this kind of reality, and instead using his power to create a place where those who are forced into this way of living have the best chance of dealing with their foes. Big Boss tries to once again justify this system due to global conflicts and never-ending wars, as well as having these soldiers' fighting capabilities be seen as useless back home. Back home, presumably meaning back in the United States, which I suppose
suppose goes for a large amount of the West in general. Big Boss is trying to say that without him and the nation he's created, there'll be many people who feel like they've got nowhere else to go. So many jobs they won't be able to get hired for. Being a fighter is described as a one-way road, which after a certain point, you can no longer turn back. The fight begins shortly after this, with Big Boss wielding an automatic weapon and us still having nothing. It's that element which is actually my favourite part of this encounter. Unlike many other fights, you'll notice that Big Boss doesn't come gunning for you straight away, instead retreating behind some cover away from your position. This giving you some time to walk around the arena without being hounded by bullets and figure out what your plan of action is. And that plan of action, while being quite a simple one when you boil it down, is ultimately a lot more engaging and requires more intuitiveness from the player than many of the other fights here. The bulk of this fight is based on actually gaining access to a weapon of any kind, getting key cards which sequentially elevate in number, which unlocks each of the doors in the centre of the room. In between this time, you'll be able to find things like rations around the room, in which you can either keep them for healing or perhaps remove the risk of the acid that's lying on the ground. That being a concept that was introduced before the Madnar encounter, where a certain type of ration which contained chocolate was able to remove acid from the floor. It's primarily about keeping your distance from Big Boss to begin with, but upon getting the lighter and spray can, we can make our own makeshift flamethrower. The DIY nature of this feeling just that bit more satisfying than if we were to find an actual flamethrower. It's giving us that feeling of scraping up anything we can possibly find to thwart Big Boss. And although these are of course the only items that are able to defeat him, it in turn makes us and Solid Snake seem more quick-witted and a superior fighter to Big Boss. After that, it's merely a matter of lighting him up, which is actually quite easy considering the long range of the flames, and then we're done. <laughs> Afterwards, it's merely a matter of escaping with our ally Holly, where we also see some horrendously misplaced romantic dialogue once again with a character I've hardly talked to. The escape sequence here is fine, literally just running away from guards and eventually having to fend off against them in a single area for a while as we wait for our evac. But my favourite part is the cutscene at the end. It looks genuinely good, even though it only lasts for two screens. The animation and style of the helicopter, the sea and the sunset we see here is awesome. It just makes me wish there was more of these interspersed during the game, although I imagine this was likely related to the technical restrictions Kojima was frustrated with while working with the MSX. That's all there really is to say on Metal Gear 2. You've got the return of boss survival from the first game, but outside of that, there's no other additional unlocks to be found here. Metal Gear 2 is definitely an improvement over Metal Gear 1 in many ways. The graphics have a lot more detail to them, and the environments feel a lot more lively across the board. The music is a lot more varied compared to the constant repetition of the main theme from the first game, although I'd say the sound effects in general aren't substantially different or any more impressive than the first. The story tackles some more interesting themes, but we're ultimately still working with very surface level stuff here. If I'm being completely honest, if I wasn't familiar with the future Metal Gear games and Kojima's writing style, I would have boiled some of the topics here down to very generic stuff that a lot of other war-related media focuses on. The horrors of war, the grey area between good and evil, the fact that I already knew where Kojima's mind must have been during that, and knowing full well these ideas would be expanded to a much greater length in the future Metal Gear games, made me pay attention more and have more interest in what's said, something I'm not going to expect someone else doing who doesn't know where this series leads. And in terms of gameplay, I'd say I enjoyed it more than the first game to be honest. The new alert system is fantastic and plays into the stealth aspects of the game even more. Weapons like the submachine gun negate a lot of the issues I had in relation to how bad I found the pistol to be in the previous game, and to be honest in this game too. And of course, things like the larger area the enemies have to move around in with more intricate and unexpected routes is great putting the new radar to great use to predict the movements of enemies off screen, while also having the top down angle not have our eyes glued to the radar either. It's a step up in most aspects overall, only faltering in my eyes when you get further into the game, where it ends up repeating several missteps from the first with some tedious backtracking moments and confusing level design.
Making our way towards the blowout success that would truly start to turn Kojima into the gaming icon that he is today. I want to note that in between the times of Metal Gear 1 and 2, Kojima wasn't solely working on Metal Gear games, but in fact two others which over time have found cult fan bases of their own. The first of which was a game called Snatcher, a game that style and gameplay was very out there for what I perceive as a Hideo Kojima game, but still featured the same kind of quirkiness we see in his other games too, even featuring a machine called Metal Gear Petit, which if you're familiar with Metal Gear Solid 4, you'll notice becomes quite a key component of that game. Unlike Metal Gear, Snatcher was immensely unsuccessful in the Western market at the time, so much so that his next non-Metal Gear game, Police Noughts, never ended up getting an official English port, with fans taking things into their own hands after Kojima and Metal Gear gained more popularity in preceding years. Much like Snatcher, Police Noughts has gained a cult following since its release, and despite not gaining international attention at the time, was still rated very highly in terms of its style and dialogue. During Police Noughts development, however, Kojima was slowly starting to piece together what would soon become the next Metal Gear game, initially being envisioned for the long-forgotten 3DO interactive multiplayer console made by Panasonic, but eventually starting its development on the groundbreaking and incredibly successful PlayStation 1. The first huge decision which Kojima made for this new Metal Gear game was to now completely change the title of the series, one which most people merely refer to it as now. Instead of just Metal Gear, or in the case of this new game, Metal Gear 3, it was now renamed to Metal Gear Solid. The Solid part, of course, referring to the character Solid Snake, who he'd previously played as, and will continue to play as in this new game. But also, of course, referring to the transition from 2D graphics to 3D. And getting into the game itself, we can very clearly see this is a gigantic jump from what we've experienced in the first two games. The difference is immediate, and carrying on from what Metal Gear 2 set up, the game doesn't start directly at a menu, but instead a cutscene which gives us the rundown on our mission, while being even more cinematic than what we witnessed in Metal Gear 2. The obvious things to comment on would obviously be things like the 3D graphics, the presentation, the voice acting, and the music, all of which have either been introduced outright compared to previous titles, and others which at the time were considered far superior to all other games on the market. The nuclear weapons disposal facility covers the whole island. I'll instruct you by codec after you reach your target. Let's not get bogged down with all that stuff now though, but instead focus on where the story's picking up from last time. From the first few lines the Colonel delivers here, we're immediately made aware that Metal Gear Solid is actually a continuation of the previous game, not a straight up reboot or reimagining of them. The nuclear weapons disposal facility on Shadow Moses Island in Alaska's Fox Archipelago was attacked and captured by next generation special forces, being led by members of Foxhound. He mentions how one of the world's nuclear disposal facilities, which was set up in Metal Gear 2, has been captured by a group of Foxhound members, this place being referred to as Shadow Moses Island. Big Boss is confirmed to be dead once and for all here, so there's no way that he's behind this operation, at least not physically. The team of Foxhound members demand to be given Big Boss's remains, otherwise a nuclear weapon will be launched. Quite similar stakes to the previous games, with nuclear catastrophe being the main threat once again. Foxhound is described as being Snake's former unit here. Snake and the Colonel were no longer associated with Foxhound, with the unit instead being turned into something entirely different. Foxhound is now made up of six villains which we'll end up meeting, all of them being led by someone calling themselves Liquid Snake, being interesting immediately because of the correlation between Snake and Liquid's code names. The end of this cutscene finally takes us to the main menu, with one of the many many small details which make this game so unique, which I suppose goes for most of Kojima's games to be fair, where you can move around either your D-pad or the analog stick and watch the background also move around, as well as change colours. There's a few options we can select from this start screen, of course the most obvious one being to start a new game, but there's also a briefing tab which gives us even more backstory on our mission, and also a VR training tab which we'll talk about later. I didn't particularly like the idea of sitting through the briefing tab before or after the main game, primarily because of the presentation of these cutscenes. They're portrayed through a camera lens and feature stylized drawings, which while looking great I could hardly even see due to how distorted the entire images. This is a stylistic thing of course, Kojima matches these very same visuals numerous times in future games, but it's that paired up with the length of all these briefings which just makes them feel like too much of a slog to start the game off with, and too unnecessary once the game's over. We will go over some of the key information here though, as there is stuff here which we aren't actually told about in the main game, or is only passively mentioned. Firstly, Snake is shown in the first briefing tape to be hesitant to even go on this mission. What do you want from me? I just invited you here so we could have a talk. Invited? That's what you call sending armed soldiers after me? Sorry if they were a little rough with you. 
It appears that after Metal Gear 2, he went into retirement and was forced back into this current operation after the Colonel sent soldiers to go and collect him. A character called Dr. Naomi Hunter is also in the room with Snake and the Colonel, being described as the chief of Foxhound's medical staff. Obviously, not the Foxhound unit that we're going up against, and also an expert in gene therapy. The gene therapy part of this being a very vital aspect that we should keep in mind when analysing other parts of the game. Snake's given some kind of injection, which is described as a combination of nanomachines and an anti-freezing peptide. Nanomachines are eventually used to explain away so many parts of the Metal Gear games that hardly make any sense, although here I think their purpose is fine. The nanomachines are quite literally described as a machine which floats around a human's body, in turn giving them various abilities depending on how the nanomachines have been programmed. What was that injection for? It's a combination of nanomachines and an anti-freezing peptide so that your blood and other bodily fluids don't freeze, even at sub-arctic temperatures. Nanomachines? In Snake's case, for example, the nanomachines he was injected with continually replenish his adrenaline, nutrition, and sugar levels in his bloodstream, meaning there's no need for Snake to search for a supply of food during his mission. Snake's objectives revolve around rescuing two hostages the Foxhound unit have captured, and stopping any potential nuclear threat being launched. The first hostage being the Chief of DARPA, Donald Anderson. DARPA, referring to the Real Life Research and Development Agency for the US, standing for Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, and the second being the president of the fictional arms tech corporation, Kenneth Baker. There's a few briefings after this, which is where more of my issues come into play. Things like the further clarification we're given on our insertion method. We're literally told we're going to infiltrate Shadow Moses in the exact same way we see at the start. There's nothing to actually learn here, except being told Snake Suit represents the latest advances in polythermal technology, which is why we don't freeze to death right away. That's a big issue with Kojima's writing, and it's a part that, while charming, has led to a lot of criticisms. Not the kind of writing that tells you about quirky facts that hardly correlate to the actual game. I think that stuff gives Metal Gear a unique charm. What I'm referring to is information that we can pretty much already gather in our own minds, being elaborated on to an arduous degree. In many ways, this is for me the main thing which will eventually represent the Metal Gear franchise as a whole, explaining things to an overwhelming and oftentimes unnecessary degree, and as a result, having people perceive the plot as convoluted and confusing, when in reality it really isn't when you understand the core themes. I won't linger on these briefings for much longer, as a lot of the information in these does eventually crop up in the actual game, but the other main things we can take away from these briefly are more related to questions that are currently unanswered. The DARPA chief and arms tech president were held hostage because they were both present at Shadow Moses at the exact same time, potentially hinting at some shady goings on which Foxhound weren't even a part of. There's also things like the mention of the Human Genome Project, which Foxhound are using to actively strengthen all of their soldiers. Science has apparently gotten to the point where particular genes which cause negative effects to the body can be removed, while also having the capability to splice in superior genes to create a more effective soldier. It's referred to as gene therapy, and the example that's given here makes everything a lot clearer. The genes which cause sickness and disease can quite literally be removed from the body now. So, if someone were to have or be prone to getting cancer, this gene gene can be removed and replaced with a gene that gives them a much higher resistance. Big Boss is used as the basis of this combat-related genetic research, trying to use his genetic information to create soldiers which showcase his same level of skill in combat, this being the main reason why Liquid and his Foxhound unit want his remains. It's a bit strange considering Snake bested Big Boss in both fights he had with him, but there is a reason for that which we'll eventually see. The next generation special forces are described by the Colonel as simulated soldiers, and passively by Snake as video game players, due to them primarily having training in VR. If you ask me, these so-called next generation special forces should be called simulated soldiers. They have no real battle experience. Video game players, huh? with the gene therapy process being the main thing which makes them adequate resistance. And with all that out the way, it's time to get into the game. Compared to the first two games, which only had easy and normal, there's now four different difficulty options to choose from, with the new difficulties, hard and extreme, introducing several more things which make the experience much harder. Things like having you be able to hold less ammo for your weapons, having enemies give out higher amounts of damage, while also having their sightlines be increased compared to the lower difficulties. A great incentive to replay the game multiple times, 
times to really put your skills to the test. Starting the game, there's several key things that get thrown at us, which all individually make up why Metal Gear Solid was seen as such a groundbreaking release. The first of which, as you've already seen from the opening cutscene, is the presentation of the cutscenes themselves. Kojima is very clearly taking influence from movies with how he's carrying these scenes out, which, if you know the man, or just check his social media, you'll know movies are incredibly important to his creative process. In recent years, I think the influence goes so far that it actually works against him at points. Here though, this was, in my opinion, somewhat revolutionary. He chooses to open the game by flashing the cast members on screen, creates a great atmosphere using mise-en-scene with very purposeful and distinct shot choices, like when Snake emerges from the water before we get a faint glimpse at our main antagonist, Liquid Snake, all being paired up with a mysterious soundtrack which does a lot to reflect the tone of the game. Yet again, it's these cutscenes that we have to keep in mind, however, because as much good as they do in terms of both style and substance, they do, at points, work to the series' detriment, overstepping the mark and becoming confused at what the main strengths of the video game format actually are. That's not really the case for this first game, however, so we'll touch on that aspect later on. After the cutscene, we still don't get our hands on quite yet, instead presenting us with the brand new radio screen, where much like Metal Gear 1 and 2 gives us a chance to discuss with our teammates on how to carry out our operation. Of course, of course though, you'll notice that much like the cutscenes, there's now actual voice actors to all of the characters now, which works wonders in giving them more personality. This is Snake. Colonel, can you hear me? Loud and clear. What's the situation, Snake? I not only think all of the voice actors here elevate the writing to a substantial degree by not making us have to sit and read everything that's coming up on screen ourselves, but it's the talent that's on show here from the majority of voice actors that's even more impressive. Snake, played by David Hayter, is obviously the standout highlight of all the cast, going down as easily one of the most recognisable voices in gaming history, and for good reason too. His voice perfectly fits the rough and tough mercenary that he's been painted out to be, and in my personal opinion, it's in the first two Metal Gear Solid games where where Snake's voice shines the brightest. Especially in Metal Gear Solid 1, Snake's voice, while still being gruff, is delivered very naturally, which is what a lot of the voice actors do here. Going for a more naturalistic approach makes the situation we're put in feel even more real. Having the voice lines be overstated and over the top would have taken a lot away from the dialogue in my opinion. And as a result, what we see here isn't just impressive in terms of when the game was released, but also still great to look at nowadays. The other voices we hear right now are the Colonel, who's voiced by Paul Eading, who in my eyes is about on with Snake in terms of his delivery and how distinct and personalised he makes the Colonel's character with his voice alone. You'll have to take the elevator to the surface, but make sure nobody sees you. If you need to, contact me by codec. The frequency is 140.85. Snake and Colonel Campbell, off the bat, are two characters that I immediately feel would falter if taken over by any other voice actor. Both Hater and Eding appear to put their all into these guys, and make these characters their own. You might also be wondering what this radio screen actually is this time round. In Metal Gear 1 and 2, it was an actual radio, but now, we've switched over to a system referred to as the codec. The codec stems from the idea of a cochlear implant that runs off battery power, which is useful not only for swift communication, due to Snake only having to put his hand up to his ear to hear whoever he's talking to, but it's also a more discreet option compared to pulling out the transceiver and radio that we saw in the last two games. Something that we should bear in mind, however, is that much like the previous two games, the iconic codec screen, which is another element that would come to define the Metal Gear games, isn't actually reflecting what the characters are seeing. It's merely a visual to keep the players interested. In reality, the technology here still only boils down to audio communication, which might sound obvious, but because of a few other very gamey aspects of the game which also play into the codec system, I could understand people perceiving the codec as far more fantastical than it actually is. We'll talk more on the codec later though, with the colonel sending us on our way with an extremely juxtaposing comment to the atmosphere when he tells us to push the select button to activate the codec once again. When you want to use the codec, push the select button. We're thrust into the gameplay. I enjoyed this opening moment for a number of reasons. As we can see, the credits of the developers are still flashing up on screen, so giving players back control at this point acknowledges both the player's role here, that being to play the game, as well as more of the developers who created it. This section's almost like a mini taster for several gameplay concepts that are about to quite literally be explained to us in a few minutes time. Things like the new radar that can be seen in the top right, removing the items and life bar from the screen, which makes it less cluttered and the experience more immersive. Step 
stepping on some of the puddles on the ground indicate that noise which we generate can still be identified by the enemy, and this time not by a specific obvious looking floor tile, but more dynamic instances like puddles, which take up a more unconventional surface area. Huh? What was that noise? It's kind of pointless talking about these things right here, however, considering they do get explained very shortly after this, but I do still really like the approach of having players make these kinds of discoveries themselves, before being given further clarification after the fact. For as over explaining the Metal Gear games might be at points, moments like this put you in the shoes of Solid Snake very well, by having you work off merely your own instincts and prior knowledge of how the Metal Gear games function for a period of time. Rising up the elevator, we get the first moment in the Metal Gear series for me that just oozes cool, that being the pairing up of music with Snake's detaching of his scuba equipment, as well as when the title comes up on screen of course. It gives me chills every time, and is yet another moment which gives this feeling of going into uncharted territory, where we'll possibly be left completely out of our depth. The call we get when reaching the surface feeds into what I was saying about the briefings being a fairly unnecessary inclusion in my eyes. Things like Snake Sue and the nanomachines he's been given are mentioned here, with Naomi once again repeating, almost word for word, what she said during the briefings. If it weren't for your suit and your shot, I would have turned into a popsicle out there. An anti-freezing peptide, Snake. All of the genome soldiers in this exercise are using it. Information being given out through a long-winded briefing versus natural dialogue. I know which one I prefer, at least. Liquid takes off in a hind D right in front of us, a helicopter that we become more than familiar with by this point. And when getting back onto the call, we're introduced to another new character, that being Mei Ling. Nice to meet you, Snake. It's an honor to speak to a, a living legend like yourself. She's described as the visual and data processing specialist, and I think she's one of the only voice performances that is slightly over the top having this pretty stereotypical Asian English accent, which only lasts for this game, and gets changed in all other future iterations of her character. I wouldn't say it's particularly racist to any degree, despite some fans feeling that way, although she is described as being raised in America, which may lead you to think she'd have more of an American twang to her accent. You'll find a lot of children being brought up around people who are speaking in their native tongue will naturally lead to them developing an accent that more adheres to those ethnicities as well. Snake's interaction with Mei Ling is where we really start to see some of the more campy elements get introduced in the dialogue, something which will only get further reinforced not only in this game, but also the series as a whole. Mei Ling gives us a rundown of the brand new Soliton radar system, which we're told she actually developed, as well as the codec system. The bright dot in the middle is you, Snake. The red dots are your enemies, and the blue cone shape represents their field of vision. And with the crew telling us we can contact them at any time, and Mei Ling letting us know she'll work as our safe state for the game, we're given back control. As Mei Ling mentioned, the Soliton radar has a few similar elements to the radar we've previously used. Our position is reflected as a white dot in the centre of the screen, while the enemies are reflected as red dots. Thankfully, however, we immediately see a couple of my biggest issues in relation to the previous radar be fixed, and very easily too. Firstly, the camera's now more zoomed in to the environment, as well as the environment itself being one wide open space compared to the individual screens we saw before, both of which I see as a major positive. Having the camera more zoomed in doesn't just make us feel even more immersed in this scenario, but it also does a good job in making us more cautious, exactly like we should be in a stealth video game. And much like the camera, the radar's also more zoomed in. Before, we were pretty much given the entire room's layout from the radar, letting us know all of the enemy's positions, even if they were on the direct opposite side of the room. Now, we're made to actively move around to reveal more of the environment, going for the radar as well as the camera. On top of that, enemies now have a constant blue cone of vision, which indicates where they're actually looking, this being one of my favourite additions compared to the previous games, as it presents less confusion in relation to tackling the enemy. The only thought in my mind in relation to the cone of vision, however, is of course one that can't be changed, that being the fact that I think it's even more suited to Metal Gear 2 than here, because of the multi-screen layout of the levels, with many of the aspects like how far enemies can now see, as well as the first person mode we can enter, already making things slightly easier to begin with. Needless to say, the cone of vision is incredibly helpful, and such a necessary inclusion here. But let's not skirt over the other aspects I mentioned here. The fact all the areas here are no longer being confined to individual sections and screens is fantastic. It makes the environments feel so much more open, as well as the camera angles once again, encouraging more exploration on the player's part, compared to before, where quite literally everything on screen was in plain sight at all times. You've got to understand that even during gameplay, the camera angles aren't just being presented in a functional sense, but a stylistic 
one too. An example we can see in this opening outdoor section being the helipad, where the camera zooms much further out to give us this greater perspective on the helipad and the spotlights which are shining down on it. The first person view is yet another thing that works really well, both functionally and visually, letting us observe things like enemies' positions from a much greater distance compared to the top-down camera angle, and also just serving as a way to get a better look at our environment, either in a functional sense to map out a plan of action, or to just gaze at the environment surrounding us, which I should mention oftentimes allows us to see some great visuals that the top-down angle quite literally isn't able to give. Other things to note here would be things like a lack of loading screens in between short cutscenes, like our discovery of a surveillance camera, which might sound like nothing, but was definitely notable due to the time period and console it was released on. The design of both Snake and the enemies is shown to be great here, with Snake's black and grey uniform blending into the environment well, the sneaking suit in that case really living up to its name. But we also have the enemies here wearing blindingly white uniforms, matching the snowy atmosphere around them. The atmosphere is something else that's great here. You've got things like the snow particles falling from the air, but also even smaller details like Snake's breath, which we can see as being turned into a foggy vapour, which is fantastic. Unlike the intro section, I'd say this is our first true test in relation to the stealth here, as compared to then when we were merely avoiding the enemy until the elevator reached our position. Now we're actively heading forward and infiltrating the Shadow Moses complex, which presents a few more problems in relation to slipping past undetected. Whether you get caught here or not, the only way to get inside is through one of the ventilation shafts, being located on the ground floor or first floor, which we can access via the stairs nearby. Verticality being another aspect which has been brought back and expanded from Metal Gear 2. In the vent, we get a call from Master Miller, who along with the Colonel and a certain cyborg ninja will eventually discover, is one of the few returning characters from the past games. Although what he says here isn't that substantial, more of just a reintroduction to his character. During our shimmy through the vent shafts, we overhear a conversation between some guards, with them saying the DARPA chief has been moved to the first floor basement. The direction we're given here being the perfect balance between freedom and our ultimate goal. It's essentially exactly what I wanted all this time. Too much stuff was merely up in the air before, whereas now there's a definite direction given, floor one, basement, but we're not actually told how to get there outright. We're told by the colonel there's an elevator nearby, but not actually where the elevator is. Needless to say, I think the level design's been improved immensely here, so we're also not going through the same process of trying and failing to open each door we discover now. Our ultimate goal was usually not too hard to find after only a brief amount of exploring. Making our way to the elevator and heading to floor one eventually does lead us to the DARPA chief, where we can first press ourselves up against the connecting wall to get a visual on him. before heading back into the vents and dropping into his room from above. It should be mentioned here that the Colonel actually has a personal stake in this mission. Snake has been entrusted with rescuing his niece, Meryl, who we can also see when looking down one of the several vent openings here. Is that a woman? Not him. Another of which, of course, being the DARPA chief, but another also featuring this. Ugh, kinda damn cold. I hate Alaska. Boy, oh boy, that woman is built all right. Confronting the DARPA chief, his real name being Donald Anderson, we're informed that another Metal Gear is being housed in this facility, one that's capable of launching nukes to any country from any place on Earth, and also one that's fully complete and ready to be used. Metal Gear... It can't be... You knew? Metal Gear is one of the most secret black projects. How did you know that? We've had a couple of run-ins in the past. The biggest difference here, however, is unlike the TX-55 Metal Gear from the first game, or Metal Gear D from the second, this Metal Gear was actually being developed as a joint effort between DARPA and Arms Tech. This wasn't a machine being produced by terrorists, but a killing machine, a potentially world-ending one at that, being developed behind the scenes by governmental bodies that, to the eyes of the general public, are made to appear as just in their actions. These are organisations that thrive off conflict, but on the same merit, are made to seem as if it were an option, peace and the the avoidance of war would be their primary goal. Despite Metal Gear obviously being fictional, the fact that Kojima decides to associate this real-world organisation of DARPA with the development of a nuclear-equipped battle tank shows a very prominent questioning of what really goes on behind the scenes of the US government. It's definitely an active critique of the West and how they perceive and deal with conflict, and one that when you look at the histories of countries like the UK and America, is a critique which has been apt, spanning back several generations at this point. Anderson seems to be completely blind to the fact that his organisation 
organization shouldn't have been working on something as potentially catastrophic as a new Metal Gear in the first place. Instead, placing blame on Liquid's revolution, while at the same time confirming this brand new Metal Gear's name as Metal Gear Rex. If it hadn't been for the revolution. Revolution? Rex has fallen into the hands of terrorists. Rex? Metal Gear Rex. The code name for the new Metal Gear prototype. We're told by Anderson that himself, along with Baker, have the two passwords which will activate the nuclear warhead, Anderson's password already being extracted due to Psychomantis' telekinetic abilities. Which might sound strange, considering the direction of most of the enemies in Metal Gear up to this point seem more grounded, but actually works quite well when presented in context. We're told that Baker is located somewhere in the second floor basement, hidden behind some walls that appear different in colour, and also that he holds three card keys which can apparently deactivate the nuclear launch sequence. As we're about to leave, Anderson appears to suffer some kind of heart attack, screaming out why, as if this is something that's been done to him by somebody else, not just an unexpected heart attack. Hey, what happened? We hear some commotion outside, and a let out of Anderson's cell to be presented with a nude guard on the ground, and what is very blatantly Merrill, who's now put on the guard's uniform. Despite being held at gunpoint, Snake has no doubt in his mind that him getting shot by Merrill is just not a possibility, labelling her as a rookie, and in turn making me think about how far Snake's come from Metal Gear 1, where of course in that game he was also labelled as a rookie. Their talk is cut short however, when some more guards burst into the room to ambush the two, resulting in an unavoidable combat section where you and Merrill have to take out the several guards that enter the room. I think this is a perfect chance to start talking about the gameplay here, and especially how much it differs compared to the previous two games. We already made mention of the camera system, and this is one of the key differences that feeds into numerous new elements here. Now that we're in this 3D world, and one that's going for a gritty, realistic setting, there's a few more obstacles that are in our way this time. Something I've already mentioned is in relation to the shrouding of enemies compared to the previous games, where they've taken the idea of enemies being able to walk from screen to screen in Metal Gear 2 and upped it to another degree. Enemies are still given their set routes, but the radar becomes incredibly important here, due to the further clarification that's given in relation to their sightlines. Thankfully, we finally gotten rid of what I personally perceived as a frustrating element, which made it so guards and cameras could see you from any distance. Now both the distance and your positioning in relation to the enemy's cone of vision is all that matters. That's not all though, objects and your position in relation to them has also been expanded as well. On the 2D plane, objects pretty much ignored elements like height, so for example, if you're standing behind a metal crate with the top half of your body just popping out, the enemies still couldn't detect you. Here though, things are a bit different. Height now matters quite a lot in certain areas, with numerous different objects being placed around areas which vary in height, and allow you to take advantage of a few new additions Snake now has. The first of which, that's quite minor all the way up until Metal Gear Solid 4 in my opinion, is the crouch. The crouch, as you could assume, working as the transition between standing upright and the prone which returns here. Although in terms of the crawling, it's quite a bit slower than what we saw in Metal Gear 2, feeling a bit more realistic even if it does affect the speed we're moving at. The crouch's main function pretty much applies to the height of objects once again, allowing you to hide behind small crates without going into a full-on prone. That's about it though, you aren't able to actually move while you're crouched, and attempting to do so simply results in Snake going into its prone position once again. There's another element here that still makes crouching effective however, but also goes for our movement and observation abilities here in general, and that's our ability to press ourselves up against walls, much like the first person view and the scope we've now been given, which works as a first person version of the binoculars, where we can more closely inspect our targets by zooming in. Pressing ourselves up against walls is all based on observation once again. This works because of the camera angles that we're given here, which I've always found quite impressive considering the sheer number of surfaces we can press ourselves up against. Sometimes you'll find the camera angle won't change at all, but other times you'll see the camera swoop in and give a far greater perspective of the area ahead of you. As you can see, all of the elements I just talked about go towards improving the stealth gameplay in particular. They're all essentially based on getting a visual on our enemy, and then being able to more effectively avoid them. Pressing yourself up against walls is also now the only way we can knock to lure the enemies to a certain position, a mechanic which was already present in Metal Gear 2, and basically serves the same function here, merely having it happen through a more specific action than before. 
Another kind of luring we can do here involves the snow at certain points, although the only time most people will experience this is right at the very start of the game. Unfortunately, there's not many other moments I can think of that utilises the enemy's sight outside of straight up seeing you, but as you can see here, guards will be able to see the footprints you're leaving in the snow, and will continue to follow your trail until they lose track. Of course, this can be used to lure them away once again, so you can dash to a new position, but it can also lead to you getting spotted if you don't act fast after they start tracking you down. But that's not all we've got to mess around with here of course. There's also some other things which we've previously seen which feed into certain elements that are introduced here, as well as a brand new and, in my opinion, far superior combat system. I've mentioned ideas like Kojima having a noticeable and increasing anti-violence message in his games. During an interview in 2014, he said, I can portray this violence, and then the user can experience the truth of what that kind of violence entails, what elements people should have in their mind. It's a kind of contradictory approach, but I want people to understand the side effects, the effects of violence through experiencing battles in the games. Despite being an interview that's quite far down the line from Metal Gear Solid, which was released in 1998, the violence Kojima's referring to here being far more extreme than what we see in Metal Gear Solid 1. This philosophy is one that can definitely still be seen all the way back here. I mention this because unlike before, where our only options were to kill our enemies, whether it be a gunshot to the head, a punch which makes them literally combust, or an explosive, now we can play the game while being a lot less lethal. It's impossible to go fully non-lethal here because of certain scenarios which are set up, as well as having the boss encounters being solely based on killing your enemy. But now, when we punch an enemy for example, after 5 or 6 hits, you'll see that instead of being killed, they instead lie on the floor unconscious, with the stars which can be seen floating above their head being very cartoony, but a staple of the franchise after this point. The stars aren't just there as merely a visual effect however, instead indicating how long it's going to be until they wake back up. In total, taking around a few minutes on normal difficulty. I mentioned knocking them unconscious, which showcases Snake's new 3 punch combo. There's not much to really say about it, mashing the circle button will reliably pull off the combo every time, and there's no way to pull off another kind of combo here. The only different combos I suppose you could say are here is merely stopping before the full combo is even achieved, so merely pulling off a 1 or 2 punch combo before Snake does his kick. That's not all though, Snake is now also able to go up behind guards and choke them out by pressing the square button, where you can also snap their necks to wipe them out completely. This is an aspect that is quite finicky however, as to choke them out you have to be standing completely still while behind them, which with the guards pretty frequent movement patterns can be quite difficult to achieve at points. Pressing square while actively moving won't result in Snake choking the enemy, but instead throwing them to the ground. A good move if you've already peppered them up beforehand with some punches, but almost definitely leading to an alert phase if not, considering when they get back up from the ground the alarm gets set off almost immediately, which can be very annoying if you were aiming for a choke to begin with. The alert phase is pretty much the same as before, you get detected, the alarm is raised, backup gets called, and they all come to hunt you down. Despite going for a very realistic tone, the alert phase is still pretty gamey. Guards don't communicate with each other at all during gameplay, so it's still a bit strange that because one guard detected you, all of a sudden every other guard in the area appears to know exactly where you are as well, despite them obviously not being told of this. If all else fails and you end up dying here though, you'll get one of the most iconic game over screens in gaming history. <laughs> There's not much to really say about it, outside of the label I just gave it. Iconic. The music is bombastic, your teammates cries cut deep regardless of who it is, and I think it works as good motivation to get right back into the experience. One thing that is fantastic though is the music, carrying over the dynamic soundtrack idea once again, where the music raises from the fairly downbeat songs that play across the main areas we're sneaking through, to the upbeat, intense music which has come to define the alert phases in these games. This takes us right back to the shootout with Meryl, as much like Metal Gear 2, breaking the enemy's line of sight isn't the only way to enter the evasion phase, actually taking them out can also suffice at points. We just mentioned the punches, kicks, chokeholds and throws, but weaponry is something that while still not being perfect here is far and away superior to its predecessors. We can find a SOCOM pistol in the back of a truck in the very first area of the game, but using it is obviously something we're aiming to do sparingly, considering one shot will immediately notify the enemy of your presence. In situations like the one 
on with Meryl though, we're given the chance to go all out with the SOCOM, instantly showing the quality of life changes which have been made. This time round, we're obviously not working with the slow moving pixels which once represented our bullets. Weapons now shoot out bullets which reach targets instantaneously, which is also where the more violent elements are showcased here, with blood viscerally bursting out of enemies when they're shot. Quite a jump from the 8-bit violence we've previously been used to. There's a number of different functions that can now be seen when using the majority of our weapons here, like the ability to shoot while moving by holding down the X button while aiming. The aiming itself being either auto or manual depending on your personal preference. Manual being used when you're actively pushing left and right to guide the weapon's laser sight onto a target, and auto coming in when you hold down square for a short amount of time. Shooting with most of the weapons here feels fantastic, although we'll talk about some of the more unique weapons like the sniper when we actually get to them. Despite working with a console that has far less technological resources to work with than we have nowadays, the weapons all have a real kick to them, the SOCOM and FAMAS being a couple of my personal highlights. There's nothing to really see here if you're a gun nut of any kind. The pixelated visuals make it very hard to distinguish any details on the weapon you've got in your hand, with the most noticeable interpretation of our weapon being the small illustration in our inventory screen. That's the final thing I want to focus on in relation to the gameplay right now, and that's the UI elements, which I think are handled very well here. Surprisingly, despite elements like the radar system, which I felt improved Metal Gear 2 compared to the first game, I actually thought the HUD overall was a step back. I didn't enjoy how the actual interactive game part was essentially being reserved to a box on the center left side of the screen. There's so many things you can pick out very easily which take away from the HUD here. Why does the life bar have to take up so much space? Literally, the screen could have been stretched vertically considerably more, but is held back by the life bar and the black void that sits right next to it. The radar in this game is a win-lose situation. The fact it takes up a large amount of space is good, because you're then able to get a very close look at the enemies around the entire floor you're on. The negative obviously being that I think along with the two inventory slots beside it, they take up too much space. It was like they had a bunch of really good ideas that innovated from the first game, but didn't quite know how to implement them in a satisfying way. That's how I feel at least. Fast forward to MGS1 and everything has been paired back once again, but in a much smarter way. It might not initially seem like it, but all the elements from Metal Gear 2 were still here. It's just the fact that they've been made dynamic, as to not take away from the experience this time around. The game now takes up the full screen, but as you can see, the radar issue is immediately solved by turning it into a smaller, more rectangular shape, giving us a wide area to see, while at the same time not revealing the entire map instead moving alongside our movements. I love that element in particular. There was something that I felt was almost distracting with Metal Gear 2's map, because it covered such a wide area. The dots were too small, and I oftentimes got confused with which enemies I was actually looking at. Color coding is also used effectively with the Soliton radar, not just in relation to the red and white dots, which distinguish the enemy and yourself, but also the different colors of the cones of vision, with enemies always having a blue cone, and things like surveillance cameras having a yellow cone. Might sound insignificant, considering both their aims are merely to spot you, you, but of course, they don't function entirely the same. The surveillance camera turns much slower than guards tend to, and when pairing both of these threats up, it could potentially lead to you getting yourself caught if you aren't planning carefully. Not to mention, one of the most important factors around the radar is the fact it's also translucent, not a solid block on the screen, meaning that any enemy threats that could potentially be hiding behind it not only will show up on your radar, but also will be able to be visually seen as well. Then, there's the more dynamic elements, like your life bar, now only coming up on screen when you either lose or gain health, but it can always be checked by either holding L2 or R2, this taking us to the brand new inventory system. Instead of that long convoluted list presentation we had before, this list has now been turned into a much more effective selection screen. I could imagine someone who's never played Metal Gear being confused when trying to get the inventory up for the first time, requiring multiple button pushes to select what item you actually want, one of those buttons, L2 or R2, obviously being held down during the process. It's still not perfect in my opinion, I don't like the fact we have to actively scroll through all of our items to get to the item we actually want, something which becomes an even longer process with the more items you acquire across the game. And when you reach scenarios where you've got an item equipped, a weapon equipped, an alert phase and your health bar on screen, the image can definitely appear a bit cluttered, but the fact this is a stealth game and most of the time things like your life and your weapon won't be present on screen, is typically not an issue most of the time. I definitely prefer it to what we had in the last two games. Despite my mention of it being more drawn out as you gain more equipment, it never becomes anywhere near as tedious as the keycard management of those games. The items we actually acquire also work well in the colour coding department, having the name of whatever item we pick up flash up in bright white text, and having items that we can't pick up shake around on the ground, with the name this time appearing in red text. Reasons we can't pick up an item can range from things like being full on rations or ammunition, or trying to pick up ammo for a weapon we don't even have yet. And talking of being full on rations or ammo, a final little detail I want to mention right now is merely the counters that rest beside the items on our screen. The rations for example, showing how many rations we're currently
currently holding, as well as the max amount of rations we're able to carry on us. The same going for the pistol, which also features an ammo counter below the weapon's icon, which lets us know how many bullets we've got left until we have to reload. Reloading being a slightly strange function with Metal Gear that once again puts satisfying gameplay first instead of realism, which I think with a video game, which is all virtual and fictional anyway, is usually the best choice in most cases. I mean this in the sense that merely unequipping and re-equipping any weapon will always reload it, regardless of how much ammo has been depleted from the clip. Something that's made even more swift and once again satisfying due to our ability to do a quick equip, where instead of holding the inventory button down, you can simply tap it and have the last weapon or item you had equipped be immediately held. Great for the weapons and great for items like rations, being able to equip these for some last second healing in case all your health is depleted. Back to the shootout with the guards, this moment is put in for a couple different reasons, the first of which I think revolves around the combat elements of the game. Up until this point, it's obviously been continually advised for players to stay out of sight, although if a combat system has already been developed for the game, and one that I definitely think the devs should be proud of here, considering how surprisingly smooth it feels for a PS1 game, you can naturally assume they want you to actually test it out and not merely stay in the shadows for the whole time. The second reason relates to what Snake said about Meryl being a rookie, presenting this reality physically by having Snake continually pressure Meryl into shooting the guards. I wouldn't say the fight is that hard because of how enemies consistently drop rations and ammo on the ground, so much to the point where I think it's almost impossible to run out, but I'm still glad this moment's here. It highlights the gameplay while varying the encounter up enough with the brief moment with Meryl shooting, where it also doesn't feel like you're merely shooting enemy after enemy as they get funneled into the room. The cutscene which follows presents something which I think nowadays would be described as a problem for the Metal Gear series, and it's something that I'll be honest only gets even more extreme and goofy down the line. What I'm referring to is the zoom in on Meryl's arse as she runs to the elevator. Here I think it's actually pretty acceptable, considering, as dumb as it sounds, this visual was actually used later on to help us identify Meryl. The fact is though, as the series goes on, it does end up in certain moments where women in the games are definitely over-sexualized to a certain degree. A strange paradox, as I believe that much like games like Resident Evil, women were actively being put in to represent strong and resilient characters, just like their male counterparts. But on the flip side of that, you've also got this undeniable sexualization to a lot of them, which doesn't happen anywhere near as much to any of the male characters. We'll get into it more when things become slightly more extreme, but in my opinion, this game handles the female characters quite well across the board. This is one of the only real occasions where you could criticize women's portrayal in this game as male gazy, but of course, I'm not as invested in that stance anyway. It's one of those things that is definitely present here, and that I'm required to talk about because it gets thrown right in the player's face at points, but it's only an element that I'm going to acknowledge really. Some people are going to be offended and questioning the portrayal of women in the Metal Gear games, and others won't. I'm not going to get involved in that side of things, due to it being related to several very touchy subjects in our culture today. I'm merely going to say exactly what's on screen and how it's presented. After Meryl runs off, we're brought to a strange cutscene which is disconnected from the events that Snake is currently experiencing, this being the first time we're actually taken out of Snake's point of view and shown information that he currently isn't privy to, if you exclude the shots of Metal Gear Rex of course. What's presented here is a meeting between Liquid and a couple of his teammates, the first of which being Psycho Mantis, who easily has one of the most distinct designs in the game, due to the jet black gas mask he wears. Standing close by is Revolver Ocelot, who we'll see in a second is just as distinct as Psycho Mantis, despite not wearing anything as outlandish as the gas mask. The most interesting part though is what this cutscene's actually showing, that being all of the members crowd around the body of Donald Anderson and saying that he's dead. We've just seen Anderson suffer a heart attack in the same room as us, so it should be impossible for him to have been dead at any point before or after that. Meryl ends up escaping, and Psycho Mantis himself quite literally appears out of thin air, with his dialogue implying that Meryl is either on the side of Foxhound, or there's some kind of mind controlling effort from Psycho Mantis. It's definitely a moment that will be more impactful for players who are beginning with Metal Gear Solid as their first Metal Gear game. Everything so far has been firmly grounded in reality, and seemingly out of nowhere, you've got this wacky character wearing a gas mask, teleporting right in front of you and levitating above the floor. Having experienced Metal Gear 1 and 2 before this, and fighting bosses like Night Fright who uses technology to make himself literally invisible, as well as the more quirky elements like being told to switch the game off, I'd say Psycho Mantis is still quite surprising, but not as big as a surprise if you've already experienced the precursors to Metal Gear Solid, especially because at this point we aren't entirely sure if these telekinetic, mind-controlling powers that Psycho Mantis is described to have are actually a genuine gift that he naturally possesses. Much like Night Fright, there's still a possibility at this point that it could be explained away as some kind of technological development which allows him to do the things he does. I like how Snake reciprocates the same kind of disbelief that a first-time player should be feeling at this point, questioning if he was having a hallucination, before being told it's more likely that Mantis actually made an appearance. Getting 
getting to the second basement leads me to think about how great the level design is in this game. It's yet again taking elements which were used before and streamlining them so they're easier to understand and less convoluted to pull off. Funny enough, a lot of the levels in this game were actually pre-built by Kojima, not using any computer software, but instead Lego bricks and toy figures, a very endearing element to the game's design, and one that I think is included quite faithfully. But in terms of streamlining the experience, let's start with the obvious one, that being the elevators between Metal Gear 2 and Metal Gear Solid. In Metal Gear 2, you had the main elevators in the first building, ranging from basement 2 to the fourth floor. Not only is that a huge number of floors, pared down to only three here, which I should mention makes everything that's presented in these floors feel even more unique and individualized, but we also only have one elevator this time round, compared to before, where you had the two elevators, which strangely only went to certain floors, depending on which one you were in. That kind of mentality translates to a lot of things here. You've got an elevator that takes you to less floors, allows you to choose exactly what floor you want to be taken to, instead of having to go to each individual floor. And getting into the floors themselves in this first building, my god, is it just so much nicer to traverse. And I think a lot of that stems from a belief that I feel is completely true. And that's the idea of having a lot of ambition, not having the appropriate resources to pull off your original vision, and coming up with a far more creative and in turn better solution. Filmmakers typically describe this process all the time. Small budget indie filmmakers, experimental filmmakers, people who are looking to carry out a vision with nowhere near as much money as it would actually require. It can still be seen in big budget movies however. Just look to 2001 A Space Odyssey. The film was made by Stanley Kubrick in 1968 and still features some of the most stunning space visuals in any film I've ever seen. The scenes that everyone calls to of course are ones like the Stargate sequence, which is spectacular, but all the footage of space, which obviously had no possible way of being filmed physically, is just miles beyond films like Star Wars, which, let's not forget, was also praised for its visual presentation of space, but not only being inferior to Space Odyssey in my eyes, this being especially obvious to me with the spacecraft we see in both films, Star Wars looking like toys being held on strings, whereas Space Odyssey gives a real scale to all of the spacecrafts. But Star Wars was also released almost a decade after it, linking this to Metal Gear, unlike Metal Gear 1 and 2 that showed ambition in relation to the amount of areas you can journey to, and how many different rooms and floors that were featured. This has all been pared down in Metal Gear Solid. It's a similar thing I remember seeing in the first couple GTA games, the first one in particular featuring Vice City, San Andreas and Liberty City, three different cities, all of which would eventually be heavily expanded on in the future, with the only problem being they hardly varied from each other. Metal Gear Solid may have overall less rooms to explore, but the ones we do explore are far more impactful. I'll show you what I mean by using this first building as an example. The first floor we enter features two levels which connect via a stairway. The top part reflects the second floor from Metal Gear 2. By introducing the idea of the noise generating tiles, which make up most of the floor tiles in the upstairs area. On this top floor, there's also two doors, both of which are made clearly visible due to the camera angles and radar once again. Dealing with the surveillance camera, you'll likely be pressing yourself up against the nearby walls, in which the camera angle reveals the door. It's not just that though, not only do they cut majorly down on the keycard activated doors in this game, something I perceived as one of my biggest annoyances from the previous two titles, but they also clearly show what keycard is required to open up the door. If you need a level 1, the door will have a 1 on it. If you need a 2, it has a 2 on it him, and so on. An incredibly simple solution to a very big problem, and the positives don't end there. On the bottom level, we have numerous tanks lying around, working as our main form of cover, being able to pull off the same kinds of tactics from Metal Gear 2, by crawling under the tanks to hide from enemies and wait for them to pass. Now, we're brought into a first person view however, just like the vents. Yet another subtle design choice that puts you in the shoes of Solid Snake, and makes the act of hiding a lot more tense than it otherwise might be. The first floor basement is pretty small, and is only really used for encounters with Anderson and Merrill. It's fine, but not an area we ever have to return to again after those moments, which I see as a slight waste considering a large amount of areas here have brought back the idea of backtracking, and instead used it to great effect. That brings us to the second floor basement, a room with guards, pitfalls, and numerous locked off rooms. The difference is though, the quality of life changes that are made here make all of these things which I once had issues with in the previous game a joy in this one. The guards we've already been over, despite being a cramped space, the Soliton radar now 
clearly shows where they're looking. And on top of that, peeking around corners in the first person mode gives us a detailed visual on their position and where they're looking anyway. The pitfalls, which are now very clearly trap doors, are totally avoidable this time round. All it takes is constant movement and you'll pass over them fine. These trap doors also now have audio and visual cues before they actually drop, where walking over them makes a very blatant activation sound, as well as the floor itself quite literally beginning to fall from beneath you. So, guards are solved, pitfalls are solved, but what about my biggest issue? Well, they solved that too, and although it does get improved further down the line, it's more than enough here. You still require key cards to enter a lot of these doors still, but the biggest change which we haven't yet experienced due to us only holding one key card, is the fact that key cards now stack on top of each other. So when we eventually acquire the level 2 key card, it fully replaces the level 1 in our inventory, while at the same time still letting us enter all the level 1 doors while having it equipped. Just a great addition. Other great additions would be the fact doors now open automatically while we're standing next to them, not requiring us to actually press up against them and waste our time. And also, how doors we don't yet have clearance for make a buzzing sound which on top of the numbers which are shown on the doors, just gives so much more clarity in relation to what doors we can enter, as well as the stacking key cards allowing us to just run past all of them swiftly, and see for ourselves which ones we can enter and which ones are locked off. The level design in terms of this second floor basement might be quite simplistic. It's working off a grid structure, with the six rooms that are found within the floor working as our main way of cover from the enemy. It's very simplistic once you break it down, but add in the trap doors and the guards' unknown patterns when dealing with them for the first time, and it becomes a Room that requires careful and considered traversal. This is how a large part of the game is laid out. Having us come back to certain buildings and floors this time round feels clever, both in terms of how they fit into the game's structure and also in a development sense, how they manage to conserve resources by doing this. Everything in a level design sense feels expanded and refined. It's not perfect, I'll say. There are some areas I do have a problem with, as we'll eventually see. But on the whole, it feels like an innovative step up from what we've seen before, just like it should be. Taking us back to where we left off, though, the one thing I don't think is innovative, and luckily isn't repeated anywhere else in this game, is the idea of the invisible walls which we need to look out for here. I wouldn't say it's better or worse than what we had before, but about the same level of confusion. Even for someone like me, who's played all the Metal Gear games to death by this point, the hidden walls are something that occasionally catch me off guard, depending on how long I've been away from the game. The positives are the fact that the walls here at least have the distinguishing feature of being a different colour than the walls surrounding it, as well as making a reverberated sound when tapping on them to show they're hollow. The fact we're actually told about the hidden walls too is a lot better than before, where we literally had to discover these purely by ourselves. Or at least that's what I gathered from my playthrough. I'm not going to write off the fact there may have been a radio call that let us into that fact. But we still have to acknowledge that it's very hard to actually see these from the top-down angle. For most people, requiring a more drawn-out process of either entering the first-person mode to look at the walls, or going around and tapping the walls to see if they're hollow. It's not a huge issue at the end of the day, it just sticks out more as a strange inclusion considering how well I think the majority of this game flows. Making our way inside, however, we eventually discover the arms tech president, Kenneth Baker, being held captive, with wires all around him that, if tripped, will detonate all the C4 that is placed around the room. Snake dodges out the way of a bullet shot by Revolver Ocelot, a great visual, but one that makes Snake look more like a ninja, performing an action that I don't think I see him replicate anywhere near as closely again in other games. So you're the one that the boss keeps talking about. And you? Special Operations Foxhound. Revolver Ocelot. Ocelot's introduction here is brilliant. Everything from his character design, which we can now clearly see, having standout things like his red gloves and grey slicked back hair and moustache, as well as his voice performance being stellar, Ocelot proves himself immediately to fit in line with the very distinct Psycho Mantis, who already had the potential to steal the show off the bat. To many people, that is actually still the case. Living up to his name, Ocelot appears to have his roots ingrained in westerns, twirling a cult single action army in his hands and yelling draw before throwing us into a boss fight with him. Over the years, I've become more and more resistant to this boss fight, where ultimately, in this playthrough of the game, I found it fairly bland overall. This is definitely the most bog-standard encounter of the game, which is quite a shame, considering how much of a character Ocelot proves himself to be in the brief moments we see him. The biggest positives I pick out from this encounter is both the stakes which are set up, having you and Ocelot firing lead at each other in a room filled with tripwires and C4 explosives, and also, the abilities Ocelot shows off in this fight prove him to be the great sharpshooter that he was claiming himself 
yourself to be. You are able to dodge out the way of quite a lot of his shots by just running around, but I'm referring more to the rebounds the bullets make around the environment, a lot of them bouncing off walls and hitting you, which is pretty cool. That's about the only unique part of this boss, however, and it's one of the few times in a game where a one-on-one -on -one fight features a back and forth, which I don't actually enjoy that much. I think this primarily stems from how Ocelot interacts with the arena here, with the entire encounter basically boiling down to a chase, where Ocelot shoots all the bullets out of his revolver and takes some time to reload, which gives you a large window to deal some damage. Years ago, when I played this for the first time, I liked Ocelot's fight. It felt intense, the stakes were high, it was the first Foxhound member we were actually going up against, and someone who appears to have a much higher level of skill when it comes to shooting. As the years have gone on though, whether you're constantly stopping to catch Ocelot off guard, or actively pursuing him around the arena by executing the move and shoot action we've got here, it just feels like the same thing rinse and repeat until the boss is over. There's no kinds of second phases here, you're hitting Ocelot with shots until he's dead, simple as. The best thing we can observe from this first boss fight is something that carries across to most of them, and that's how equipment is handled during these. Rations aren't given out so sparingly in boss fights. Typically, there might be one or two lying around when the fight begins, but oftentimes there's only really ammo placed in these fights. That's an aspect I really enjoy, as to compensate for the lower stock of ammo that we have here to begin with. Ammo is both placed at the start of the fight, and also gets restocked over the course of the fight, as your ammo increasingly dwindles. Yet another quality of life change that removes the annoyance of having to grind for certain types of ammo or rations, and making it so that you aren't completely hopeless or left stuck if you don't have these after the fight's already started, in which you obviously can't back out or run away. That's all I can really say about this fight though, run around, get shots off, and avoid setting off any of the tripwires. <laughs> Something that occurs after this fight, however, that's even more intense is the appearance of the cyborg ninja, entering by cutting off Ocelot's hand with ease and slicing all the tripwires. What? My hand! <laughs> A visual which might look cool, but ultimately makes zero sense, with how setting them off beforehand would kill Baker, and lead to us having to try again. Literally, the stakes of the past fight look insignificant once you see Baker fall over with explosions all around him, and somehow still magically survive. Much like Psycho Mantis, the Cyborg Ninja is one of the elements in this game which really stands out from everything else we initially see, with this character having a grey and futuristic looking design, which not only contrasts with all the other characters, as well as the rundown environment around him, but also is one of the first characters that seems like it takes heavy influence from more Japanese-centred culture, as opposed to the more Western elements that make up the bulk of the game. Our meeting with him here isn't just cool, but arguably the first genuinely freaky moment in the series so far, with how he eventually ends up going crazy, making all kinds of animalistic sounds and screams before darting out of the room. Again, another aspect that appears brand new and contrasting for the experience in this game, but eventually becomes the norm for Metal Gear. Our talk with Baker reveals Foxhound managed to extract his detonation code via torture methods, meaning they're now able to launch a nuclear weapon at any time. Baker reveals an interesting detail in relation to resisting Psycho Mantis's mind probe, telling us that everyone who's aware of the top secret detonation codes are given surgical implants in their brain to prevent this type of mind probing. The only way of stopping a launch now is apparently by way of the key cards, which can override the detonation codes, one of which has been handed off to Meryl. This leads to an utterly fantastic moment, which surprisingly isn't particularly seen all that often, and for myself, hasn't been seen in any other game that I've played, despite being such a cool concept. We need to contact Meryl via codec, but Baker has forgotten what her frequency is, before remembering that it should be found on the back of the CD case. Oh, that's right. It should be on the back of the CD case. Try to contact her. Now, playing digitally on the PS3, the only thing we have access to is the digital software manual, which is very boring in how it reveals the code to us, just being found on the screen which talks about the codec and saving our game. The best way this can be experienced experienced, in my opinion, is to physically have the CD case right in front of you, where the game quite literally takes the game into the real world, and requires you to investigate the back of the case for Meryl's frequency, and eventually you will end up coming across it by looking at all the pictures on the back. Such a simple, but at the same time incredibly intuitive and clever inclusion, although I'm glad they never repeated this again personally. This first time round, the idea of having to physically check an item outside of the game feels fresh and surprising, whereas if it was repeated even once more, considering 
Metal Gear 2 already had a similar concept. I feel like it would not only dampen this initial moment, but also feel like more of a gimmick, compared to here, where it has a genuine function. There is still more that Baker has to say, however, first telling us to find one of his employees, called Hal Emmerich, who was the leader of the Metal Gear Rex project. And secondly, when Snake questions why a Metal Gear was put into production due to nuclear war dying out by the start of the new millennium, Baker begins to clarify that they are actually at a point where a nuclear attack has never been more likely. If you need any more proof that the whole point of the Metal Gear games for Kojima is to have a message which actively correlates to the real world, it begins here. My biggest issue with how many people take Metal Gear's story is that they take it at face value, and try to look at things in the most literal and game-related sense possible, when if you look at it like that, I think it removes so much of the meaning from these games. The reason I bring this up here is because as you can see, Kojima decides to insert real-life footage of what appears to be missiles being shot up into the air, and people handling explosives. This only gets further reinforced in the sequels, but to say that Metal Gear is purely fantastical because of some of the wacky elements which get introduced in it doesn't hold up so well anymore. It began in Metal Gear 2, and by Metal Gear Solid 2, most of the events which get talked about in-game seem to have some kind of real-world implication. As I said, they might be portrayed as completely mystical, but you've got to remove that aspect and try to understand what the inclusion of that stuff actually means in the real world. That's not the case here though. This is pretty much just straight-up facts in relation to how nuclear weapons and more specifically nuclear waste is handled. Drums and drums of nuclear waste stacked this high, as far as you can see, because there's still no real way to dispose of the stuff. So they just close the lid and try to pretend like it'll go away? Uh, essentially, yes. And they're not even doing a good job of storing it. One Google search about nuclear waste storage will show you exactly what Baker mentions here, about nuclear waste literally just being put into containers and left, due to there being no proper way of disposing it. A 2020 article from the American Chemical Society tells us that even today, nuclear waste continues to pile up as scientists search for a long-term storage solution, and needless to say, one hasn't been discovered yet. These are the harmful effects of war and nuclear weapons, from the weapons themselves to a particular potential nuclear waste spillage. It's all screaming for an absolute tragedy to take place, intentional or not. The biggest problem comes from Baker's mention of a potential nuclear black market, due to there being a large amount of nuclear materials which are unaccounted for. A scary message from the US Department of Justice, acknowledging what's mentioned here is absolutely true and happening. And what's even more freaky is that they claim it's going to get worse before it gets better. This is what I mean. The more you look into this stuff, you realise Kojima's breaking out the confines of what games were mainly focused on during this period, that being completely fictional stories, and introducing all these elements which actually exist and could potentially affect all of the people playing the game. It's a real filmmaker's kind of mindset. By Metal Gear Solid 2, the game almost becomes merely a byproduct of the powerful messages Kojima is trying to put out. Baker begins talking about Metal Gear and how it was developed as a black project, essentially translating to a secret project which had the American government directly involved. As he mentions here, Rex was only able to be developed due to the Pentagon black budget funding. It refers to the idea of the game being rigged, and having the general public, and also the opposing political parties, have no say in these kinds of weapons developments. As Baker says, they were essentially given free reign on Rex's development, with no one around to bother them, saying that even the military oversight committee was not privy to any information regarding Metal Gear Rex. They could build the most destructive weapon mankind's ever seen, and no one on the outside even knows it exists, all of it being bought and paid for by the American government. It's telling us that these people people are not your friends. Despite the president's attempts to try appear as a relatable human, which has the public's best interests in mind, there's too much shady stuff going on behind closed doors to ever truly believe the government is just and transparent in all of its actions. And with Baker giving us an optical disc containing all the information related to the Metal Gear exercise, as well as a level 2 keycard, he suffers the exact same kind of heart attack that Anderson did, while chastising the Pentagon and claiming that we're being used for something that we aren't personally aware of. Oh no. Can't be! Those Pentagon bastards! So, they, they actually went and did it! What are you talking about? They, they, they're just using you for. <sighs> Finishing up all the talk, we get put back into the game, and are given an increase to our maximum health. Just like before, every time we beat a boss, our max health goes up, this time having Snake do a kind of fist pump movement that's as cool as it is goofy. <laughs> 
using our level 2 keycard, we can now access some of the different rooms, which give us equipment like the FAMAS, a brilliant automatic weapon that deals out high damage in quick succession. It functions pretty much exactly the same as the pistol in terms of shooting it, but holding the square button down obviously lets out a barrage of shots instead of just aiming, having a nice trade-off between high and rapid damage for less accuracy and a faster rate of ammo consumption. Other items we can now acquire in this building are a suppressor for our SOCOM, now making the idea of using weapons stealthily a possibility, and also the return of the cardboard box, which is only useful for fooling enemies here, as conveyor-based fast travelling doesn't make a return. Giving Meryl a call, we can see she's still dressed up in her enemy disguise, and as we start to elaborate on who we are and who we're working for, she starts fangirling over the fact we're quote, the legendary solid snake. The legendary solid snake? You? Sorry about before, I wasn't sure if you were one of the good guys. If there's anything that proves we're not the newbie rookie from Metal Gear 1 anymore, it's right here. Keep Snake's charm in mind here. There's a few moments across the game where Snake is shown to be very human and compassionate in his interactions with other people, something that becomes increasingly absent as the games go on. Admittedly, for a reason that I think is striking and impactful enough to warrant it in my opinion. Why did you look so surprised when you saw my face? Because you look just like him. You mean the terrorist leader, Liquid Snake? Yeah, you know him? You're not brothers, are you? I have no family. Something I haven't mentioned till now is the continual comparisons between Snake and Liquid so far, but especially in the briefings where we get zoom-ins on Snake's face, we can see his hair was almost identical to Liquid's, with his face being a bit harder to distinguish because of the very intense grain effect which is put on screen. It's one of the mysteries that's very interesting, and is pretty much just left for the majority of the game. The main villain here looks exactly like us, and for what reason, we really have no idea. The most important things we're told here is in relation to the purpose of Shadow Moses, being told that the idea of it being a nuclear weapons disposal facility is entirely false, instead being a dummy corporation set up by arms tech, the term dummy corporation referring to a company which is set up as a front, in this case for the development of a brand new Metal Gear. Foxhound and the next generation special forces were called here for the test launching of a dummy nuclear warhead. That's right, nuclear weapons disposal has never been this facility's priority. It's all been about Metal Gear, something which Snake chastises the Colonel over due to him obviously being aware of this information and purposely hiding it from us. The reason Foxhound was placed on this island now resembles security for Metal Gear's development, clearly keeping Snake out of it due to his previous experience with how devastating the Metal Gears he's faced in the past have been. Snake gives Meryl a talk about how she's too green to journey alongside him right now, still calling her a rookie, which leads to a great great moment where Meryl elaborates on how she felt killing someone for the first time, those being the three guards that we ordered her to shoot at earlier. I don't know what happened, I just couldn't pull the trigger right away. I never had any problems in training, but when I thought about my bullets tearing through those soldiers' bodies, I, I hesitated. Shooting at targets and shooting at living, breathing people are different. Ever since I was a little girl, I always dreamed about being a soldier. You'll hear that in the back, there's the re-emergence of the song which played at the very start of the game as we swam to the docks. This track is called The Best Is Yet To Come, and outside of it featuring a beautifully layered choir, it's used in a narrative sense perfectly as well, always seeming to come in at quite pivotal points in the story, usually to represent something like an important character development like we see here. In a war, all of mankind's worst emotions, worst traits come out. It's easy to forget what a sin is in the middle of a battlefield. And with Meryl opening up the cargo door to the outside, it's time for us to head to the second building and find Hal Emmerich. There's some vertically moving lasers in between, which prevent us from just running straight to the door in front, instead having to use thermal goggles, or even more intuitively, our cigarettes, to get a visual on the lasers, and crawling along the floor while making sure we don't come into contact with them. It's not that difficult, especially with the thermal goggles, although due to the perspective we're seeing the lasers from, it can sometimes be quite difficult to actually gauge which lasers are falling in what position. Let's talk about the graphics and the atmosphere of this game for a second, as we've only briefly focused on certain aspects, despite this blatantly being a huge jump forward from the 8-bit games. The atmosphere is one of my favourite elements that feeds into the environments which are created here, where much like a lot of other aspects, it's going for a gritty and realistic portrayal. The opening section, for example, has the brilliant snow particle effects which fall from the sky, which I think create a great effect while not being too overwhelming, as opposed to many other games which implement weather effects as a filter which is thrown up on 
screen, we can clearly see the snowfall were actual particles which fall to the ground, which I imagine wouldn't have been the easiest thing to implement at the time, but it's pulled off amazingly. Looking at the enemy's design shows a surprising amount of detail, despite the intense pixelation that came with most PS1 games. Their clothing, for example, isn't just a jet white suit, but looking closer, we can see their jacket opening up at the bottom when they walk, their collars at the top, logos on their right and left arms, as well as their weapons containing a flashlight that we can see flickering on the front. In games that are made as far back as this, we can't take these things for granted. These are things that would have taken a lot more time to implement, and the fact there's such a high level of detail to merely the grunts here should be commended. I've already talked about Snake's design, which I think is great, with everything from his sneaking suit which highlights his muscles, to his soon to be iconic bandana, making the legendary hero label seem quite apt off the bat. And despite everything now being handled in this more technically intensive 3D environment, complaints I had in relation to the continual repetition of textures and objects in the previous games is entirely solved here. Sometimes, the changes are quite substantial. Looking to the front of the Shadow Moses facility shows a very believable structure, with different parts of the building sticking out, presumably to adhere to certain parts of the building with different lengths and size. Colour is an aspect that I can somewhat understand people criticising. This is a very grey and drab looking game in terms of exteriors and interiors, but of course, the counter to that is the fact it fits very well in terms of the environment itself. The setup is an island that is a nuclear disposal facility. It wouldn't make much sense for the environment to be thriving with colour here. The textures liven everything up in my opinion though. The mountains on the outside, which vary in size, and have all kinds of different indentations and slopes in terms of the landscape. Chain link fences, gates, railings, not just the same wall texture repeated verbatim. Floors with all kinds of different textures laid out across the environment, not just the floor itself, which is still varied up to a far greater degree, ranging from snow to concrete, but also more unique floors like the helipad, which features several lights and grates on the floor, metal crates with labels on them, straw bags which are piled on top of each other, yellow tinted windows to reflect the spotlight that's getting shot from the inside. And bear in mind, I'm literally just focusing on what's pretty much the first area of the game. You've got to understand that this level of care is brought across to essentially all of the interior and exteriors throughout the game as well. Once again, I don't think it's reasonable to throw these things to the side in a game made in 1998 for a console that people would consider primitive by today's standards. You might scoff when I mention all the different kinds of objects that are thrown into all the environments here, but you have to consider that these were all crafted by individual artists and developers to make the environment feel authentic, something that despite the improved hardware the PlayStation brought over the MSX, still would have definitely brought its fair share of problems when trying to actually implement everything. Let's not forget, even today, developing a game can take such a long time due to how many aspects have to be taken into account. Sometimes, developers' visions are so grand that even in the final release of a game, the game itself is barely hanging on from a complete meltdown. It's why I give more leeway to games which are released in a rough state sometimes, unless their intentions are blatantly impure, which I think can be said for games like Cyberpunk 2077, the released in a state which no one possibly expected. Games are such a hard thing to make, and it would be incredibly petty and self-righteous for me to shout down games that might not run as effectively as they ultimately should. This obviously isn't the case here, despite the sheer detail that's put into the environments, and being, in my opinion, one of the best looking PS1 games ever released. The game runs smooth as anything. Same goes for most of the animations here, some of which I find to be a bit clunky, like the neck break animation, where every time Snake consistently appears to warp away from the enemy and break their neck while holding thin air. But things like the doors opening, all the movement in the cutscenes, some of the highlights being things like the Cyborg Ninja's mix between fluid and frenetic movements, Ocelot's revolver spinning. I could go on and on, but eventually it'd become pointless. The graphics overall were fantastic for the time, and even when looking back, aspects like the dense, isolating atmosphere that's created, the large number of varying textures, and certain elements which get introduced towards the end of the game, like the towering Metal Gear, all coalesce to make Metal Gear Solid a great game visually in terms of when it was released. And although it may be off-putting to some people, I still think there's too many aspects which work in the game's favour to put it aside, merely for aspects like the pixelation. I'll bring it up again, Resident Evil has a remake which I think is far superior in every way. Looking back on the PS1 version now presents a lot of good stuff visually, but also some very underwhelming things, like a lot of the very tight boxy hallways which occasionally appear identical. In the early Resi games too, they obviously all feature pre-rendered backgrounds, which oftentimes takes away from the depth of the image, which can be felt very strongly in Metal Gear Solid. It was released earlier than Metal Gear Solid obviously, so you should give it some props for being as good as it was for the time, but it just doesn't hold up as well as I think Metal Gear Solid does, in a visual, audio, or gameplay sense. Overall 
although it's great stuff all round. It looks great, doesn't particularly become stale at any point, and most importantly, it is distinctly Metal Gear Solid. You could have the best looking graphics in the world, but if the style's not there, you'll end up faltering. I think a lot of credit should be put towards the art director, Yoji Shinkawa, who's not only responsible for the majority of the artwork featured in the Metal Gear games, but also in terms of their styles overall, being responsible for a lot of the environments, as well as the characters and mech designs. Heading back out to the snow filled outside, we get a call from someone calling themselves Deep Throat. Just call me Deep Throat. Deep Throat? The informant from the Watergate scandal? An unfortunate name, but one that does genuinely correlate to the real-world pseudonym Mark Felt used during the Watergate scandal, just as Snake says. Although it's the last thing he mentions about being one of Snake's fans, which should sound eerily familiar, with Grey Fox making the exact same mysterious remark to us over the radio in Metal Gear 2. The main thing he tells us is to use a mine detector, as the upcoming patch of land is filled with mines. You can do this, of course, either if you've already acquired the mine detector, or if you go back and get it, but just like in Metal Gear 2, you can just as easily crawl along the floor and pick up all the invisible claymores instead. It might be a slower process, but one that can still definitely be achieved. This takes us to our first boss fight against the character Vulcan Raven, popping out of the tank and appearing like a buffed up shaman, which is exactly what he is, despite never actually using any of his spiritual abilities against us. I like the cutscene which leads into this fight, with Snake once again showing off some pretty insane acrobatics when dodging out the way of a missile, but unfortunately, I think this takes us to the worst boss fight in the game. It's a fight that's primarily based around grenades, one of which we're already familiar with, that being the standard frag grenade which is used to deal damage, and the other of which being the brand new chaff grenade, which has a kind of EMP effect by jamming the signals of nearby electrical devices like surveillance cameras, and as we can see here, the tank seemingly auto-locking missiles. I do like how the chaff grenade is used across the game, it's an item that like here, can be used for more specific purposes, while obviously still being useful for any kinds of cameras that may be present in certain rooms. That really is the only interesting part of this fight however, as when the fight starts, it's not explicitly clear that throwing a chaff grenade is the way we're able to actually get close to the tank without it pushing us back. Once that's done, the fight's pretty much over though. The arena's more open, which I enjoyed, catering well to the large size of the tank, and I also enjoyed how much like the ocelot fight, there's extra equipment lying around just in case we're running low. The boss is drawn back however by a few elements here, one being the size of the tank and how frequently it turns and moves around, which isn't a huge issue, but becomes annoying in moments like this where I get hit for a apparently no reason. I know you might be thinking it's the tank's barrel that's hitting me here, but if you look closely, you can see it passes right through Snake's body before I actually take any damage. I've also never been a big fan of who we're fighting here, and how we deal with them, because you aren't actually fighting Raven here, but instead the same grunts we've already dealt with multiple times up to this point. Not only does removing Raven from the fight, and only having him pop up occasionally, strip back the personality from this encounter, but the fact there's no alternative approach here, aside from walking up to the tank and throwing a grenade, is slightly disappointing disappointing too. At least in the Ocelot encounter, it felt like multiple tactics could have been put to use. But here, it feels like the fight almost plays itself for you. Trust me when I say I've never been good at aiming grenades in this game, so it's a bit surprising that when it comes to this fight, it only takes a few tries for me to get a grenade to land on the tank. It's just quite underwhelming all round. The boss is literally a couple guards who you have to take out at the top of the tank, and there's only one way you can take these guys out, one that feels finicky and annoying, making every time I'm made to go up against the tank just slightly tedious all round. It's a miss, but I'd be lying if I didn't say it still surpasses most of the bosses from the last two games, and in terms of Metal Gear Solid, it's the lowest point the bosses ever reached thankfully. After the fight however, it's revealed that Vulcan Raven is still alive, and the keycard which Snake acquires from one of the fallen soldiers is fully known by Liquid and Raven, with Liquid giving the increasing feel of a maniacal Bond villain with how he's deciding to toy around with us for a while, something that much like most Bond villains will inevitably lead to his downfall. Well, Snake is mine now. When I meet him next, I'll take special care of him. Not yet. Don't kill him yet. One minor thing I want to mention in relation to the codex here is how much dialogue has now been added. Going back to the first game, we were told by Big Boss that we could call him if we need assistance, but this was basically an outright lie. Unless you performed a specific action like picking up a new piece of equipment, calling Big Boss or any of the other characters would simply lead to no response. In Metal Gear Solid, we can now call any of the characters at any time, in which we're either given guidance or some kind of quirky conversation. Mei Ling, for example, has lots of different conversations with us after we save our game, sometimes giving us support 
poor, other times telling us well-known proverbs, and other times just giving us some extra character development. It's an aspect of the game which gets carried forward and expanded on so much, to the point there's no way I'll be able to keep track of all the different codec outcomes. Just bear in mind that it's an aspect of the game that now has heaps of dialogue, all of which is obviously optional, and with characters like the Colonel, oftentimes merely leads to further clarification on your mission, and pieces of equipment that are in your arsenal, but does undeniably make you feel more acquainted with all these characters, something that I think is important considering the majority of them we never actually see in person. It's an aspect that I feel rewards the player the more heavily they invest in it, but at the same time is made optional enough to where if you miss out on a lot of these conversations, you won't feel the story or characters are lessened to any substantial degree. It's still great that the codec has more of an actual function now, and the fact your allies are consistently there to give you assistance, instead of just disappearing and coming back when they please. Entering the Warhead storage building, as we're told by the Colonel and Naomi, the nanomachines in our body have now disabled the ability to pull out our weapons. What are you talking about? Have you forgotten? That's where they keep the nuclear warheads. How do you see them? A cool concept in theory, as it shows the kind of technology that's floating around the Metal Gear Solid universe, bearing in mind Metal Gear Solid is set in 2005. But when taking a step back and realising we're playing as the legendary Solid Snake, it doesn't make that much sense. He's a hardened war hero. If he's told firing weapons in a location could lead to catastrophe, why would he even think of doing it anyway? Things get even worse, however, as due to the guards patrolling the building with weapons, you can already guess getting caught by them will result in them also shooting at you. Quite literally a scenario which makes zero sense. I like the idea of having all our weapons be unusable for a period of time, but this idea just seems sloppily executed here. We're also given the frequency to a woman called Natasha here, who's described as a member of the nuclear emergency search team. She's a fine character whenever we talk to her, but she's a lot more optional than any of the other teammates here. Unlike the Colonel, who forces you into codec calls with him for example, Natasha only ever speaks to you when you directly call her up. And despite the information she gives out possibly being interesting, none of it ever actually ends up furthering our ultimate goals. Needless to say as well, she's a character that never returns in any future games, and is only ever mentioned passingly in conversations. Heading into the elevator on the upper level of the warhead storage, once again shows there's only three floors here. Floor 1, Basement 1, and Basement 2. Thankfully, they show far more restraint in this game, still making all of the different floor designs interesting, with unique challenges in between, while at the same time not trying to go for a larger, more convoluted scale like previously. Basement 1 is where we acquire the Nikita launcher, which I'll admit has quite limited usage compared to most of the other weapons we have here, but still functions well in itself, resembling the RC missile from the previous games, with how it shoots out missiles that we can actively control. The Nikita's put to the forefront in only one moment during the game, that being the moments directly following our retrieval of it, in which we're made to use it in a room filled with gas, to switch off the electrical panels which make up most of the room's floor tiles. I think the idea of having a room filled with gas is an interesting concept to bring back from the previous games, and although I think the concept doesn't make that much sense, why would anyone want to have offices and rooms in a place that's filled with lethal gas? It works a bit better than it did before, due to this specific missile segment. Our oxygen meter basically works as a time limit now, having to guide the missile as swiftly as possible, with different speeds being able to be achieved depending on whether we're turning the missile or letting it go in a set direction. It's not a section I'd describe as being all that hard particularly, but I could definitely still see a lot of people having trouble with this. When controlling the missile in the third person view, it only has the four set up, down, left, right directions. Unlike Snake, who can run around in circles and turn whatever direction he wants, including diagonally. It feels quite sturdy and stiff, whereas entering the first person mode, we're able to more accurately turn where we want, as well as getting a greater visual on the environment in front, which ultimately is the most important aspect here, considering our main goal was avoiding any walls or objects, on top of the cameras on the run up to the switchboard, which are equipped with weapons. Once we've done that, we can inspect some of the other rooms on this part of the basement, being able to get items like the gas mask, which admittedly is used pretty sparingly from this point onwards, and isn't even all that essential, even with these gas filled rooms, considering how big our oxygen bar is. I do like how our first person view adheres to the gas mask though. Continuing on from the more bizarre, horror themed elements that Psycho Mantis and the ninja started to introduce in this game, we get another scene which uses violence, blood, and dead bodies to create a frightening run up to our next encounter. Bearing in mind that a lot of players may have totally avoided combat up until this point, outside of Ocelot of course, they may have not got on a clear visual on things like the blood, which is splattered all over the walls here, and the huge gashes we can see on the guards. The twisted sounds we hear while making our way forward are fantastically ominous, as well as the moment where a guard collapses in front of us, claiming it's a ghost. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Spirit. Just a great run up to an inevitable fight. And as we see when stepping forward a bit more, it appears it's now time to face off with the cyborg ninja. The cutscene which plays when entering the room has a lot of great moments in it. First of which comes from the visual we get on who we can presume is Dr. Emmerich, quite literally pissing himself out of sheer fear while the ninja approaches him. This in itself is a great contrast to the kind of person we could have potentially envisioned as the leader of the Metal Gear Rex project. He's not some kind of twisted, maniacal scientist. His immense fear, where we can even hear him whimpering, tells us this guy might potentially be more innocent than characters like Madnar, who we met previously. With Emmerich claiming Snake and the Ninja Showdown as like something out of his Japanese animes. What's with these guys? It's like one of my Japanese animes. Great line, by the way. You and the ninja begin your battle. I love the ninja's personality during this fight, once again fitting well into his already bizarre persona, starting the fight by telling us he wants to feel alive again, and as we'll eventually see, begins begging for more and more pain after a certain point. Unlike Ocelot on the tank, this boss fight features a few distinct phases, which I really enjoyed. The first phase basically being an all-out brawl, where the ninja fantastically shows off his far superior agility compared to Snake, which I think works well, but at the same time, Time can be somewhat annoying because of that fact, due to attacks like his flying kick being nearly impossible to dodge out the way of, or at least that's how it felt to me. Shooting is completely off the table here, as the ninja's able to use his sword to block all of your bullets. Yet another aspect I really like, where just like in the first part of the Warhead storage building, you're stripped back to basics and have to rely on all the abilities Snake has himself, not on your equipment. The only negatives that can really be drawn from that fact is how I've already said that Snake hasn't really got too many tools to mess around with. He does the same combo every time, his movement, especially compared to the ninja, is rather slow, and when looking to how much damage he gives out, the fight becomes more of an endurance test to see how long you can survive the ninja's onslaught. Once the ninja puts away his sword, the fight begins feeling like you're on a more even playing field, although attacks like the flying kick that I mentioned earlier, as well as his large jump and slam to the ground, still remind you this guy's far more agile than you. Due to his health decreasing so slowly however, I'm really glad they felt the need to spice things up when reaching the midpoint of the fight, where the fight becomes more like hide and seek, with the ninja activating his stealth camouflage. Just subtle things I enjoy is how this new phase is described to the player, having a short cutscene where we see him activate the stealth camouflage, before showing clearly where he's now positioned himself in the room, and then giving control back to the player to go find him. Small things like that work wonders in eliminating confusion. You give the player a concept and present it clearly, and then, after they've been shown it, you can start mixing things up a little and throwing in more unexpected elements, but the base concept should be clear right from the start. Luckily, the ninja still isn't too hard to see during the stealth camo phase, with key giveaways being things like his shadow, which can still be seen beneath him, as well as obviously the outline of the stealth camo, which inevitably ends up sticking out from the background slightly. Still a great idea though, which could have only been improved in my opinion by focusing more on the audio. With how the ninja calls out to you during this phase, I presumed while playing that it was some kind of audio based hint, to give you an indication of where he's hiding. Hurry up and catch me. Putting on some headphones though, I noticed there was no kind of panning involved here. The audio comes right in the centre, like all the other audio sources. Not an issue of course, just a missed opportunity that I think could have also worked well. Once we're done with this phase, it's clear we've entered the final stretch of the fight, where the ninja now slows majorly down, and relies more on his sheer strength and teleporting ability. You can still definitely get hit here, so it shouldn't be taken lightly, but it feels more like the fight's winding down, as opposed to escalating to any higher degree. The only part I disliked was how we're totally uninformed about the final moments of this fight, where the ninja becomes manic once again, screaming at the top of his lungs, and having this electrical bubble around him that deals a very high amount of damage when it initially spawns in. My initial attempt at this fight was put to sleep solely because I forgot this was coming, and didn't have any rations equipped. In the following cutscene, the audio once again proves to be the highlight here, with the industrial effects and distorted layered screams which play when the ninja's seizuring. <sighs> Again. A key detail that we basically get told right off the bat is that the cyborg ninja is actually revealed to be Grey Fox, with Snake saying in disbelief that he died in Zanzibar land. The parallel between Grey Fox and the ninja becoming a lot more obvious after this fight, considering the last time we encountered him, we ended up in a one-on-one -on -one brawl, just like this time. I have to state again, I love how strange everything is here, with the ninja, or as I'll refer to him now, Grey Fox, slamming his head onto the ground repeatedly, before dashing out the room once again. 
call with the colonel and Naomi confirms the ninja most definitely is Grey Fox. With it being revealed, he was essentially risen from the dead via gene therapy, with Fox being the first body they experimented on, which we of course know eventually translated to the creation of the genome soldiers we've been seeing throughout the game. Our discussion with Emmerich after this proves to be a very fruitful one, with the chemistry the two share, despite seeming like polar opposites, being fantastic. I think Christopher Randolph's performance of Emmerich is just brilliant. Yet again, I place him beside Snake and the Colonel in terms of how distinct and authentic he sounds. Oh, I'm okay. I just twisted my ankle a little bit trying to get away. He manages to capture perfectly the almost constant fear that Emmerich feels whenever we see him. He always seems to have a slight quiver in his voice, sometimes out of fear, as I said, but other times for moments more based in emotion and wistfulness. That's not all though. His dialogue also conveys his immense intelligence, which is appropriate considering he was the head of the Rex development team. We can blatantly hear him lose that sense of fear and become more confident in what he's saying, due to it being an aspect of his life that he knows he's a lot more clued up on compared to anyone else. There's such an authenticity to his voice lines as well, working very well and almost immediately proving his innocence to us. When Snake accuses him of lying about the true purpose of Metal Gear, Emmerich appears to have no idea what Rex was actually going to be used for, instead thinking they were merely developing a nuclear preventative, as opposed to a nuclear weapon. No. A nuclear missile on Rex? So you really didn't know? No. All the armament was built by a separate department, and the president personally supervised the final assembly of the main unit. Our discussion leads to new revelations about Metal Gear, such as being told it's equipped with a railgun, and also more talk of VR and the power it now holds in the world. Rivermore National Labs, which I assume is supposed to be a direct reference to Livermore National Labs, located in Livermore, California, is described as creating a new type of nuclear weapon using VR technology, their tests being conducted in a virtual environment, which Emmerich claims just isn't a feasible option. It becomes clearer at this point, this is why Rex was created. We already know Shadow Shadow Moses was a front, but the entire exercise is all based on pre-existing tests they'd already conducted in VR. Just like Emmerich says, the research and knowledge they can gain in a virtual environment can only take them so far, deciding to plan out the exercise in real life, using Shadow Moses as the shady, unknown hub of these nuclear-centered operations. Emmerich shows deep regret towards his actions after thinking over what he's helped create in Rex. He tells us about his grandfather, who worked on the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project, of course refers to the top secret research and development program led by America during World War II, with all its efforts going towards the creation of atomic bombs, weapons of mass destruction. Emmerich mentions how science is something that he once believed would further mankind, but in reality is only applied when nations actually want them to. I used to think that I could use science to help mankind, but the one that wound up getting used was me. It's not too dissimilar to what we see today. Like Kojima's trying to convey here, but it's important to keep an open mind in relation to these governmental powers, because always remember, these people aren't your friend. Although they talk about having your best interests in mind, a lot of the time it's just that, talk. A carefully constructed lie that will guarantee them a place of power, in which after that point is secured, they're in full control and no one can tell them what to do. Mainstream science and industries like Big Pharma have been under copious amounts of scrutiny as of late, for these exact same kind of reasons. The idea of the pharmaceutical industry calling the shots of what policies are instilled to nations like America, and that being their primary goal. Not some kind of resolution or scientific breakthrough, but control. We're going into the realms of what many people may claim as a conspiracy theory, but it's interesting when looking at the Metal Gear games just how much stuff would be either labelled as conspiracy back then, and has only proven itself to be increasingly true as the years have gone on. Or, more interestingly, things which were known as true back then, and are only now labelled as conspiracy today. This is something that rests at the core of Metal Gear Solid 2, so I won't divulge too deep into it now. But keep these ideas in mind, they'll be important much sooner than you might expect. Emmerich tells us Rex is in the underground maintenance base, and as he hasn't been called for assistance in the last few hours, he claims they're most likely ready to launch, which means we need to either activate the detonation override process, or destroy Rex entirely. Our conversation wraps up, with Emmerich telling us he'll help us in destroying Rex if necessary. A short call with Meryl after this shows her getting caught, in which there's some strange music which plays in the background. There she is! Over there! <gasps> oh no! Damn, they've spotted me! <laughs> Meryl, what happened? 
music which Snake and Emmerich actually acknowledge as opposed to being part of the soundtrack. And finally, as Emmerich gives us a level 4 keycard, he tells us to call him Otakon from now on, the name stemming from the words otaku, referring to a Japanese word which relates to people who consume media like video games, anime, and manga, and con meaning convention, so think of events like Comic Con, a convention related to comic books. The cutscene which follows features a very peculiar but welcome merging of Kojima's previous game Police Nauts, in which I should also mention a Police Nauts poster can also be found in the very same room you're standing in, as well as a PlayStation 1. It's stuff that you could begin to speculate over if you think too deep into it. Questions like, is Police Nauts part of the Metal Gear universe? Is it a fictional video game that people like Otacon are familiar with and has played? But I just think we're back to the quirkiness once again. Kojima made a game that featured robotics in, that also featured cutscenes which looked very similar to how you could imagine a typical anime looking. Both things correlate to what Otacon was talking about, so I don't see any harm in throwing this in. For players who've actually played Police Nauts 2, I imagine seeing a reference to it would be pretty cool as well. And with that, Otacon runs away and we're given back control. The last string of cutscenes being the most long-winded, but at the same time most informative ones in the game so far, taking around 20 minutes for all these cutscenes to play out before it's time for us to start playing again. Believe me, 20 minutes might seem like a long time, but this almost becomes the norm for later games. It's more weird when cutscenes don't last this long after a certain point. Going back to Basement 1, we hear the strange music which played over the call with Meryl once again. I think this entire section's filled with very clever moments, starting with a straight up callback to Metal Gear 2 once again, with how we're back in a position where we have to identify a female soldier dressed up as the enemy. I think the cutscene so far in relation to Meryl's walk, and as Otacon says, She had such a cute way of walking. She kind of wiggles her behind. You were really looking. Well, she's got a very cute behind gives the player enough to piece together what they're looking out for here, that being a soldier that stands out from the others. The first person view is used very effectively here, as upon entering it, you're not only able to more closely observe all the soldiers found in the room, but are also able to hear that one of the guards has a unique sound every time they take a step. It's not what I'd call the toughest mystery I've ever had to solve, but I do like the emphasis on observing our surroundings once again. A lot of aspects in this game make the player take on a sort of detective's mindset, playing into the James Bond influences, where despite being a secret agent, 007 definitely shows some cunning deductive abilities from time to time, oftentimes getting him out of tight scrapes. Here, for example, we're using all the different pieces we've been given across the cutscenes and gameplay, in relation to things like the way Meryl walks, how it's described, and how it contrasts with the enemy surroundings surrounding her, to deduce which guard Meryl actually is. Refusing to pay attention to this stuff will lead to the player getting stuck, in which I think the almost endless helpful information the colonel gives out is great, but also undeniably feels like a get out of jail free card. There's one part of me that wants players to be punished somewhat if they're skipping through everything, and aren't really paying attention, but there's also an undeniable flip side to that, where I think it's much better game design to keep the player informed at all times, regardless of if they're aware of what's going on. I think it's a reason I have such a hard time I'm writing off waypoints and objective markers. I hate how prevalent they've now become, but at the same time, think they serve a really great function by informing the player at all times where their ultimate goal's located. Ultimately, I'm glad the Colonel still gives guidance during these points, which are pretty much left entirely up to you. If you can't find Meryl here and don't know how to do it, you wouldn't be able to progress past this point by yourself. In that sense, Metal Gear Solid feels like quite a big step forward in terms of game design during this period, as the one thing I associate with most PS1 games is a sense of confusion, due to so many games leaving too much up to the player with hardly any guidance. Anyways, once you identify which guard Meryl is, all you have to do is walk up to her and let her spot you, in which you'll run away to the female toilets, and upon coming in after her, she seemingly disappears. Don't move. Our interaction with Meryl works well to develop her character here in a very short amount of time too. Despite already talking to her, meeting her in person reveals things like a paint tattoo of the Foxhound logo on her arm, likely feeding into why she's such a big fan of Snake. What's that mark? Huh? Oh, this? It's a paint tattoo. It's not real. I was a fan of Foxhound way back. 
and guys like The discussion of being a war hero is brought up once again here, with Snake shutting down Meryl's idea of him being a hero by claiming there's no heroes in war, only trained killers. It's a good point to ponder over. There's soldiers on both sides of a conflict that are painted out as heroes, when ultimately they're all doing the same thing, killing who they've been told is their enemy. The line between good and evil, right and wrong, becomes completely blurred once you're in the heart of a conflict. As Snake says, the only winners in war are the innocent bystanders who are spared as a result of these soldiers' killings. Taking a life is described as having the same weight on someone's mental state, regardless of who it is that's being killed. It's an idea that feeds into what Snake said about killing being something that becomes regular after a while. You do something so much that it becomes a process. You become disillusioned, merely because you've already taken so many lives. One of the more vital elements Snake mentions is his attachment to war and killing. He doesn't just claim he's not a hero, but describes being in the thrusts of war as the only time he feels truly alive. For some, war is something that certain people were born and bred to take part in. Doing anything else in life seems so abstract that they quite literally can't function in the societal norms which have been established. It of course has those real life parallels, but is also quite significant in terms of the literal plot here, as we'll eventually discover. We're given one of the three key cards to override the detonation, but Baker mentioned there being three, all of which were apparently given to Meryl. With Meryl looking into the bathroom mirror, we get another great moment where the best is yet to come fades back in, where Meryl begins describing how she transformed herself into a soldier to try and understand her father better, him also being a soldier who was killed in action. She says she hates women who look at themselves in the mirror putting on makeup, but doesn't even know if that's the kind of woman she would actually be if she didn't try to carry on her father's legacy. You wanted to follow in your father's footsteps? Not really. I thought that if I became a soldier I could understand him better. So are you a soldier yet? I thought I was until today, but now I understand. The truth is, I was just afraid of looking at myself, afraid of having to make my own decisions in life. But I'm not going to lie to myself anymore. It's time I took a long, hard look at myself. I want to know who I am, what I'm capable of. I want to know why I've lived the way I've lived until now. I want to know. Take a good look. You won't get another chance for a while. You should wash your face, too, while you're at it. Meryl gives us a level 5 keycard, and as we leave the room, things become immediately mysterious. There's no guards around, despite there previously being multiple on the floor, and the music which was playing before has now gone too. That doesn't last long, however, as entering the room to the north, the music re-emerges, with Meryl seemingly having some kind of head pains before reverting back to, well, a, a functional state again. Come on, Mr. Foxhound. The commander is waiting. It's quite a bizarre setup here. You know something's off immediately, and that's obviously the intention. I just think it could have been handled slightly better. When Meryl gets back up, she literally starts talking in a completely different manner than usual, and has the same kind of vocal effect on her dialogue that Psychomantis did. It somewhat already gives away the reveal that's about to occur before it even happens, with the weirdest thing being how Snake stays completely silent during the entire thing, despite oftentimes being inquisitive in relation to most things that happen around him. The encounter this eventually leads to, however, is what many perceive as the far and away highlight of the game, and that's our meeting with Psycho Mantis. The weirdness continues in the next room, with how Meryl appears to start coming onto us, while pointing her desert eagle at our head, with Psycho Mantis very quickly revealing his presence, now becoming very obvious that Mantis is in control of Meryl, making her a human puppet. You don't like girls? The fight essentially begins here, first being told we can't kill Meryl, instead having to knock her out. A nice detail here being how if we look closely, we can actually see Mantis with stealth camouflage controlling Meryl while floating in the air. When Meryl gets knocked out, Mantis reveals himself, in what I would say is the most meta moment in the game, tearing down the fourth wall in a way that's both charming, groundbreaking for the time, and doesn't quite get repeated in this way ever again with Metal Gear. Mantis is a very comical villain, and that fact becomes quite obvious after he begins talking to us deciding not to launch straight into a battle, but instead to prove how effective his telekinetic and mind-reading abilities are. He starts by reeling off things that could quite literally apply to anyone taking on the role of Snake, saying Snake's a highly skilled warrior who's methodical and careful of traps. You are a very methodical man, the type that always kicks his tires before he leaves. You are a highly skilled warrior, well suited to this stealth mission. 
But what you might not realize until playing a second or maybe even third time is that this is actually correlating to how you've been playing so far. For example, this is the dialogue that I got because I'd only had a few alert phases, a couple game overs, and had avoided all the pitfalls so far. Going over a certain threshold in relation to all of these, however, leads to some new dialogue, which I imagine will be immediately more striking to players who've struggled up to this point, as the characteristics he describes in those instances are more out of line with how Snake is usually described, and instead relate more to how the player themselves have been dealing with the game up to this point. After this though, things become even more blatant, with how Mantis says he'll read even deeper into your soul. What he's actually referring to here is your memory card, with what we see here being an ingenious tying in to several other Konami games, which you may have saved to your memory card. He'll list off games like Castlevania, Suikoden, and Azure Dreams. But remember, only if you've got save data from all of these games on the memory card you've been using for Metal Gear Solid. You like Azure Dreams? You like Castlevania, don't you? The best games to have saved, in my opinion, are Kojima's previous games, either Snatcher or Police Noughts, in which Kojima himself will make an audible cameo, saying, <laughs> Failing to have all this saved data leads to a slightly more underwhelming result, with Mantis saying your memory's completely clean, but I don't really mind to be honest. We see them implement yet another freaky moment that actually starts observing the player's actions outside the game, and that must be commended. Trying to bring up anything in relation to having a broader list of games be mentioned is pointless. It's a great moment, but I don't think going to other publishers to get permission to include their games here would have ultimately been worth it. The moment works, and that's all that matters. The final genius moment comes from when Mantis tells the player player to put their controller on the floor, in which he'll then move it using what he claims is his psychokinetic powers, when of course, if you follow his instructions, the controller only moves due to the DualShock's vibration function. What you witness here is Kojima taking full advantage of this brand new hardware he's working with, something that I don't see him pull off anywhere near as well ever again, despite trying a couple times down the line. It appears that breaking away from the MSX's constraints hasn't just led to a more accurate vision of what Kojima's been trying to create from the start, but has also led to brand new creative ideas, all centred around the technology itself. You might see through it all and claim it's gimmicky, but I think it's actually really clever, and a part of the game that uses meta to an extent that almost no other game had during this period, at least not a game that was anywhere near the scale of Metal Gear Solid. After all that is fight time, and from the second we gain control, we see immediately this is a boss fight which includes elements we've never experienced before in Metal Gear. This ain't your standard run of the mill boss fight where you point and shoot. The first of Mantis's attacks isn't to try and deal damage, but instead a mind trick where he shuts off your screen, leaving the message Hideo in the corner of it. Of course, being a reference to Hideo Kojima, as well as his name resembling a strong similarity to the video setting, which was very common for TVs to have during this period. The mind games don't end there though, as upon getting back in the game and trying to lay some shots off on Mantis, you'll notice not one of your bullets will ever hit him. I love this fight so much, as it's one where right from the very start you feel completely outmatched. You've got a guy in front of you who can read your mind, gauge all the actions you're about to make, and on top of that can levitate in the air and throw objects at you from around the room with his mind. Despite going up against a guy who can accurately ricochet his bullets, and also a full-on tank, Mantis feels like a whole level above everything we've experienced. However, using either your own intuitiveness, which I think can actually be done, despite the solution seeming very out there, or instead calling up the colonel, who eventually reveals the solution to you. The trick to this fight is all to do with your controller, fitting right in line with the other the fourth wall breaks here. The best way to beat Mantis in this fight is to switch your controller from port 1 to port 2, which ends up confusing Mantis, rendering him unable to read your actions for the endurance of the fight. Much like everything else here, it's just brilliant. No other game I've played has quite captured this effect in terms of how amazingly it works in tandem with the player's involvement in the game, as well as the hardware that's being used to take part in the game. Other games have definitely tried, but the Mantis fight and all these little mind games he plays with us in between is something that still holds up tremendously well today. Once again, it stems from some incredibly creative concepts in relation to a character that's already dripping with unique personality anyway. And Christ, I don't even want to know how long it took to program all these aspects. This is something that I imagine would be quite hard to pull off nowadays, let alone in 1998. Just fantastic stuff all round. When all the strange stuff is out the way, however, the fight is pretty standard when you boil it down. Things are made more interesting here with Mantis's telekinetic abilities, where we see the majority of his attacks involving picking 
picking up objects from around the environment and throwing them at us, as well as his use of mind control abilities on Meryl, once again requiring us to knock her out before continuing the fight. But ultimately, it's the same case of pointing and shooting until the enemy's dead. You could have asked for a more fitting process of elimination outside of the controller switch to port 2, but once you reach that point, you have to realise the amount of innovative and creative ideas we've been given already pretty much outweighs any further requests that could possibly be thrown at this encounter. Great fight, with a nice elevation in terms of the extremity and frequency of Mantis's attacks, and also a great setup and a great solution. After this encounter, I feel like our bonds with both the Colonel and Meryl are significantly stronger compared to how they were before. We've not only just saved Meryl from a life or death situation, one where Mantis was literally attempting to have Meryl shoot herself in the head, but as she's the Colonel's niece, it introduces a more personal element to both the Colonel himself and what our objective was. The entire time, we've been made to solely focus on these devastating, world-altering operations, like the launching of all the Metal Gears throughout the series, so I think introducing elements which more correlate to other characters' motivations and emotions is only a positive. It makes the characters you interact with feel more fleshed out and human, and the story itself more varied in terms of what we're made to do throughout the game's runtime. While Mantis slowly dies on the floor, he gives us directions to the underground base Rex is being stored in, before explaining why he's actually helping us out. Snake removing his mask so he can talk easier, revealing his disfigured face beneath. He describes that the act of mindlessly passing on DNA makes him sick, recounting his experiences of peering into other people's minds, and seeing these things be the sole focus in relation to their thought processes. Although during this, he finds Snake to be an apt comparison to himself and the rest of the Foxhound unit, something he genuinely describes in a positive light, despite making Snake seem completely hollow. You are different. You're the same as us. We have no past, no future. We live in the moment. That's our only purpose. Having a past which is almost non-existent, and a future that will have him performing missions and actions which are interchangeable from the ones we're doing right now. The storytelling starts to become downright brilliant here, when Mantis starts divulging into his rough childhood, with a mother who died while giving birth, and a father that despised him because of that fact. The first person whose mind I dove into was my father's. I saw nothing but disgust and hatred for me in his heart. My mother died in childbirth, and he despised me for it. This childhood trauma translating quite obviously to the man he is today, someone who perceives the passing on of DNA as worthless, and thinks the idea of humans making each other happy an infuriating and illogical outcome in his mind. The more Mantis begins to relate to Snake, the more he appears to look like a character that has one of the deepest and most fleshed out backstories, which puts a lot of his actions into perspective. On the same merit, it also makes us think more about Snake's character here too, as Mantis explains that while looking into his mind, he now doesn't feel so bad about his actions, painting Snake out as a character with even more villainous intentions than himself. I've seen through evil. You, Snake, you're just like the boss. No, you're worse. Compared to you, I'm not so bad. And with all that wrapped up, Mantis opens up a secret passage behind a bookcase, and it's time for Snake and Meryl to keep heading forward. The upcoming area holds what Snake refers to as wolf dogs, and I'd say it's an area that I dread coming back to more than any other. A positive in that case is that it's an area that definitely sticks out in my mind, regardless of if I'm playing the game or not, but a negative in terms of when I'm actually experiencing it. Firstly, a couple things I enjoy about this area. One would be the soundtrack here, cutting out all the music, and instead having all the audio centered around the wolf's howls and your footsteps, creating quite an ominous effect. And in terms of the wolves themselves, they may not cause an alert phase after they spot you, but they definitely live up to their vicious description, not particularly giving you any kind of break, for better or for worse. The bad stuff, in my opinion, comes from aspects like the environment. The area we're travelling through is incredibly dark and dingy, which I get is obviously the intended effect, but having that paired up with the unvaried grey rocky walls doesn't make for the most eye-catching of areas. You've also got the annoyances like having your radar jam here, making the already difficult traversal due to the darker 
and more unconventional layout were even harder. While being a unique enemy here, the wolves oftentimes put me in a stun lock that I could only break after getting damaged consecutively a few times. And in terms of the navigation once again, they really add salt in the wound by making this dark area with no radar feature a path forward which requires you to crawl onto the ground and enter through a small crevice. A small crevice that you may have guessed is hardly visible when in the top down perspective. And because of how dark the area is, hardly noticeable when in the first person view as well. I know you could say use the night vision goggles, but then we've got the issue of having the entire area now appear bright green, which I think does take away from the atmosphere somewhat. Overall, this is an area that sticks out as being one out of the tons of other great areas that doesn't work so well in my opinion. I'll be honest though, it's such a small and short section that I recognise I am being a bit pedantic. It's not the worst thing in the world, but still noteworthy for me. After this though, we've almost reached the third and final area of the game, although as you could assume, reaching this is a lot harder than it may initially seem. This begins with a small area which is apparently filled with landmines, in which Meryl maps out a path forward using her footprints because she can apparently see them. No explanation given to why that is, but I do like the quirkiness of the moment overall, having Snake take a step back and actually appreciating some of the skills that Meryl's bringing to the table. Only thing is, the moment's destroyed by doing one of two things. Popping on thermal goggles reveals the placement of all the mines immediately, and once you've done that, you should also notice there's no mines placed on the right hand side of the area, meaning you don't have to follow Meryl's footsteps at all, and can instead just head up the right hand side and be perfectly fine. Cool moment, but having such an easy workaround destroys it to a certain degree for me. The moments which follow, however, introduce us to one of the final Foxhound members still standing, this being Sniper Wolf, with our first taste of her combat abilities being some devastating shots onto Meryl. Meryl, get down! Uh, ah! Meryl! I think this is another moment where Kojima proves how far ahead he was in terms of his writing capabilities compared to most others in the gaming landscape at the time. Even today I see games struggling with certain setups and payoffs, and how to construct particular scenes and tones without going too far in an over-exaggerated direction, making something which is meant to be emotional seem melodramatic, or having a character you're supposed to care about not be set up well enough to have us care whatsoever. If you remember, we actually experienced that exact same effect in the previous Metal Gear games, having characters crop up at the end of the game, talking to us like we're familiar with them, or have some kind of close romantic bond, despite hardly interacting with them the entire time. Someone like Meryl, on the other hand, has a fantastic character development, and most importantly, has all of this development delivered over a long period of time. We meet her right at the start of the game, where she's a complete rookie, quite literally witnessing her first few kills, while also being more antagonistic towards us. Then, over several calls and meetings with her, we learn even more about her character. She's a snake fanboy, she's the colonel's niece, she became a soldier because of her father who died during a conflict. All this information is delivered effortlessly. It doesn't feel forced at all, just so that we care about her character. We care about her because she's treated like a character, not merely something to further the overall plot progression and narrative beats like the sniper wolf moment. And coming back to that, the whole reason I went on that minor tangent is because the writing is the main thing that sticks out to me here. I've mentioned this idea already, but the fact that all of Meryl's development is strung out over a longer period of time not only makes her development feel more natural, as it'd be fairly unusual for a character to give you their life story in detail after only talking with them one or two times, but it also makes scenarios like this feel more unexpected. It's become such common practice in lazy writing to rush a character's backstory, merely so they can be used as a way to further the plot. So if you ever notice that in a film, TV show, or game nowadays, you pretty much know what's about to happen to that said character. In this case, there was no inclination this was about to happen to Meryl, only mere minutes ago were we talking with her about those wolf dogs, and saving her from another one of the foxhound members. So what I'm trying to say ultimately is that Kojima's writing abilities are not just excelling here when looking at his previous efforts, but also excelling far above many games that were at the same calibre of Metal Gear Solid at the time. The stakes are set brilliantly here, both from what appears to be Meryl's dying plea for Snake to shoot her, and yet again from the reintroduction of the best is yet to come, with every time it's been brought back being just as impactful as the last. As you get a call from your allies, it becomes increasingly obvious that saving Meryl at this time is out of the question, with Snake's adamance on rescuing her resulting in some confusion from characters like Naomi. What's wrong, Naomi? Nothing. I'm just surprised you're willing to sacrifice yourself. You got the genes of a soldier, not a savior. You trying to say that I'm only interested in saving my own skin? I wouldn't go that far, but... I don't know what the hell my genes look like and I don't care. I operate on instinct. Like an animal? I'm going to save Meryl. I don't need an excuse. 
it appears that due to her thoughts all being centered around science and gene therapy, she assumed the possibility of Snake having any attachment to another human, especially to the degree that he'd put his life on the line, was out of the question. A core theme of this game, as we'll come to find, with Snake showing that genes aren't necessarily what entirely make up a person, actively surpassing the restraints which himself and others have assumed his genes have put onto him, by showing more humanity and breaking away from his stone-cold soldier mindset. This leads into what is one of the largest backtracking moments in the game, having to go all the way back to basement 2 of the first building to acquire the PSG-1 sniper rifle. You'll be surprised to hear though, considering my thoughts of backtracking in the previous games, that I think this is actually quite superb. Going all the way back to what's essentially the start of the game isn't the most convenient thing in the world, I'll admit, but it's the fact that it now feels we've travelled so far and experienced so much, that going right back to the beginning feels like an even more daunting task. The main thing which should of course be circling around players minds is Meryl, and the limited amount of time she has to survive, where we can see pairing that prospect up with the large distance we've now got to travel, raises the intensity even more. Even though there are no actual time restraints here, something I'm actually thankful for considering I think it could have made this section a bit too restrictive, mentally it still feels like we need to do everything at a breakneck pace to save Meryl. Something else I'm happy about here is the variation we see when entering back into these areas, Basement 2 being a good example, as it appears the level of security has now risen, with guards that appear to be wearing more protective armour, and also a larger number of guards patrolling the floor as well. There's also minor things that I really enjoy here, like how all of the doors which we previously couldn't open are now able to be unlocked, all of which hold things like ammo and grenades inside, and obviously having one hold the PSG-1 as well. So yeah, despite seeming like a patch of gameplay that would be fairly strenuous and somewhat repetitive in terms of presenting old ideas and threats to players who've already tackled them, the stakes prevent the backtracking from feeling downright boring, and the variation in terms of guards and the new rooms we can access, shows there's genuinely new things to discover in these areas we've already been through. I can still understand people disliking this however, although it is still a 10-15 to 15 minute diversion depending on how well you're playing. I can't particularly defend a criticism like, why didn't they just put the PSG-1 on the second basement of the second building? I personally enjoyed the backtracking to the first building's basement because of all the new rooms we can access, but I won't try and argue that it's not padding, because it definitely is. The PSG-1 could have been found in rooms way closer to Meryl, but when saying that, you can see why they did put it so far away. It's got to do with the stakes once again, and feeling like you're running out of time. If you like that aspect of it, great. If you don't, I completely understand. This isn't going to please everyone, but I'd be lying if I said the ultimate intention of the backtracking didn't work to max effect. Getting back to where Meryl's located, however, we see her bodies now disappeared, as we're thrown directly into a boss fight against Sniper Wolf. I'll be honest, this is a fight that has a great concept that gets dragged down by one key component, and that's the sniper itself. Unlike Mantis, who did genuinely boil down to the same point and shoot once all the mind games were out the way. The idea of a battle that can't be fought in any other way apart from a sniper is interesting. It's restrictive, yes, but it's a fresh idea in terms of Metal Gear, so it gets a pass from me. The concept of the fight is unique here, and that's what matters most in my view, as upon taking everything at face value once again, there isn't much to really say about this fight. Well, nothing outside of the PSG-1 sniper, the most annoying element here. The PSG-1 is a lot like the Nikita in many ways, a weapon that unlike the SOCOM or FAMAS is only really useful for a handful of encounters here, especially because of the oftentimes claustrophobic environments that we see featured throughout the game. A sniper is kind of the last thing you'd want to use in most scenarios. And then we've got how the sniper actually functions, which is incredibly clunky to say the least. One being the fact that the PSG-1 can only be used while lying on the ground, meaning that every time you pull it out, Snake will have to go into the prone position. Then, when putting it away, you have to manually get up yourself. Might not sound like too much of an issue, but this is where the other elements feed into how annoying this thing can be to use. The turning of the scope on the sniper is incredibly slow. So slow that if you want any chance of even getting a visual on Sniper Wolf when looking down the scope, you pretty much have to be looking right at her before even pulling out your sniper. And that takes us to the final annoyance here. The only reason the slow turning's a big issue here, aside from merely being a waste of time, is because every time Sniper Wolf lands a shot on you, your sniper scope throws itself all over the place, meaning you have to slowly readjust it once again to get your sights on Wolf. All these things added up can lead to a very tedious experience, which paired up with Wolf's fairly unrelenting rate of fire if you're out in the open, something that you pretty much need to be if you're aiming to actually get some shots off, can turn what's a fairly standard fight into somewhat of a nightmare. Everything else here I think is fine, or just bland. As you can hear, I think it's one of the most bog standard fights we witness here, which is a bit of a shame considering the setup for it was genuinely good. The environment we fight in for example is uninspired and downright bland. Ocelot had the intense scenario of a room filled with C4, grey 
Grey Fox had the computer room with high-tech equipment lying around, and Mantis had a room that, while being pretty standard, used numerous objects lying around the environment to great effect. Here, we literally get one long grey corridor, basically, that, while working functionally for a sniper battle, isn't striking in the slightest. The only real positives I pick out from this fight are the concept, as I've already said. A sniper battle was unique for the series, as it puts things like the first-person view and the 3D environment to great use, by having us look forward and actually having to identify a threat that's a large distance away from us, as well as one that's hiding behind different objects too. There's also things like the design of Sniper Wolf here, with her costume almost working as camouflage, due to its colours being very similar to the ones that are surrounding her position. And then there's very minor things that I personally like, that I know for a fact others would see as a negative. Things like the diazepam pill, which is effective during this fight, its main function being to stop Snake from trembling while using the sniper, something that you'll find gives you a large amount of trouble when aiming, due to how severe it can be. Nothing too big obviously, but I do appreciate this subtle realism, as opposed to having Snake be able to hold the sniper completely steady at all times. Although, I will say the shaking is the only part that's slightly extreme. I understand not being able to hold perfectly still, but I'll admit it's taken to a degree that's somewhat ridiculous when looking at it. That's about all there is to say here. Not as bad as the tank battle of course, but sort of sharing the same degree of blandness, something that's worsened by the fact that although we did have the stakes set appropriately by having Meryl get injured, Sniper Wolf herself has had no interaction with us, therefore it dampens the effect somewhat when it could have been amplified. What I'm saying is, it could have been any random soldier landing that fatal shot on Meryl, and none of the impact would actually be altered, which is kind of whatever, but could have bolstered the impact of the fight even more. It's also a strange fight in terms of how it ends. We land the killing shot on Wolf, Snake gets up and increases his max health, and that's it. No kind of cutscene, no codec call, you're made to run forward like nothing really happened. I do like this effect, however. It builds up the sense of mystery and unease really well. Calling Mei Ling to save your game, for example, has her telling us she's got some kind of bad feeling, a premonition that something's about to go wrong. Heading up to where Wolf was, we can also see that she's disappeared, apparently not being killed by the numerous sniper shots we laid onto her. This eventually all culminates in us getting caught while trying to enter a level 6 door, with us only holding a level 5 card. We were right, Wolf was in fact still still alive, ambushing us with a couple guards and knocking us out, awaking to a bright light pointed directly at our face, as well as being able to hear the voices of Wolf, Ocelot and Liquid. Can you hear me, Solid Snake? He's tougher than I thought. Do you know who I am? I always knew that one day I would meet you. The man who stole what was rightly mine. The man who stole my birthright. Their discussion revolves around a lot of information we aren't privy to yet, but throws a lot of ideas up in the air for the player to ponder over. Liquid continually refers to himself and Snake as brothers, wanting to collect Snake's DNA to cure the genome soldiers, with them apparently having mutations, assumedly ones that detract from their superior genes. When they discover Snake has awakened, Liquid continues this talk of brotherhood, describing him and Snake as the last remaining sons of Big Boss. This idea at this point once again appearing to either be a potential truth or all-out conjecture. As Liquid and Wolf get ready to depart, we learn exactly what happened to the DARPA chief, Donald Anderson, earlier on. Although due to how it's delivered in the dialogue, I can see why some people would still be confused. It becomes obvious that Snake's about to face some kind of torture method from Ocelot, in which Liquid warns him not to push too much like he did with Anderson. Still somewhat confusing, until he mentions how they need to find out what killed Baker and Octopus. And with Decoy Octopus being mentioned at the start of the game as a master of disguise, it becomes comes clear that who we were talking to wasn't Anderson, with the real Anderson facing the same torture sequence we're about to face and dying in the process. We've also got to find out what killed Baker and Octopus. We're short-handed, so make this little torture show of yours as short as possible. I like how all these pieces come together. As I said, it's not explained in the most explicit way imaginable, but I think that's Kojima's cinematic influences coming out once again. The idea of watching a film a few times to understand the meaning is very common, and although I don't think that actually applies to this game, playing it once more will make things like the vision we get after meeting Meryl for the first time much clearer. I do think the subtleness of Octopus's appearance is intentional, however, as you've got to realise that if it was abundantly clear the Anderson we talked to was actually Octopus, who, let's not forget, is a member of 
foxhound. It would obviously throw a lot of the information he told us up in the air, most likely having a few lies thrown in between his dialogue to fool Snake later on. For now, it's time to endure Ocelot's interrogation, with his main aim appearing to revolve around the keycard that Meryl handed to us, now being told there's some kind of trick to using the keycard, which for those who've played Metal Gear 2 should immediately have their minds gravitating to the idea of the brooch, which would morph into a key depending on what temperature it was being exposed to. Being sent back into the game, we're told that we're about to be electrocuted for a short period of time, Ocelot breaking the fourth wall once again by telling us the circle button will regain our life, and the select button will have us give up. The funniest inclusion is the mention of not being able to use auto fire, which if you've owned a second hand PlayStation controller featuring a turbo button will be very familiar to you, merely being a button that allows all the other buttons to automatically be pressed multiple times while only being held down. The torture sequence is excellent. As much like the Mantis sequence, I feel like this is a moment which is turning its gaze directly to the audience once again. The main reason I say this is due to how well the process of surviving the torture is translated to the real world via the circle button we have to rapidly press. You'll notice when the torture sequence begins, there's a time bar on screen, as well as your life bar. The main thing which should be apparent, however, once Snake actually starts getting electrocuted, is how rapidly the life bar starts going down, the amount of life that's taken away varying between the different difficulty modes. It's a fairly simple moment, of course, and one that much like I mentioned way back, is entirely context sensitive. It's the sheer fact of how we have to spam the circle button for increasing periods of time so we don't die, which is great to me though. Even on normal it's a bit of a workout, but on the hard and extreme difficulties, you're really going to have to give it your all to get through in one piece. One thing this sequence doesn't tell you, however, is that it's the only part of the game that leads to an alternate ending. Surviving the torture sequence and subsequently escaping will lead to one ending, and submitting will lead to another. It doesn't really matter to be honest, because as we'll discover, future games confirm only one of these endings to actually be canon, but I do appreciate the effort to give some alternate endings here. It's yet another aspect which should increase replay value somewhat. Once we're done with the torture sequence, we can start to see how this is actually another elaboration on a previous concept that we've seen before, this time coming from Metal Gear 1, in which I think this entire torture and imprisoning sequence is expanding on the idea where we got captured, and go on to save Grey Fox. This translates to a few things, first of which being how we are actually locked up in a prison cell, with no immediate way of getting out, the body of the real Donald Anderson also lying in your cell, which Snake continues to ponder over with his teammates, still attempting to give further clarity to the player about Decoy Octopus's impersonation of Anderson. In this same call, Snake starts taking the Colonel to task, about his lies and information that he's been covering up since the beginning of our mission, backing him into a corner and asking him why he never told us that Metal Gear was a government-developed nuclear war machine, a question the Colonel can hardly answer. Metal Gear was designed to launch a new type of nuclear warhead, wasn't it? You knew it all along, didn't you? Why did you try to hide it? I'm sorry. Can't tell the grunts, huh? This is a great mindset to put onto the player at this point. We're gradually starting to feel completely isolated, while still in the heart of the terrorist-run Shadow Moses complex. The people we've been relying on for updates and information are now revealed to actually be withholding information from us, so if we can't trust them, we've only got our own instincts to go off, making Snake feel even more like an underdog. Saying that though, what the Colonel says here about the US government and the President is quite interesting. The President is made to look like a total puppet, and merely a figurehead for America, not being no notified at all about Metal Gear Rex's development, while at the same time preparing to sign the START 3 Accord, a real-life treaty which was proposed in order to reduce the amount of nuclear weapons in Russia and the United States. It was formed around 1997, and was going to be signed by American President Bill Clinton and Russian President Boris Yeltsin, before negotiations broke down and they never reached the finish line. Well, the President and his Russian counterpart are scheduled to sign the START 3 Accord. I get it. That's the reason for the deadline. That's right, Snake. And that's why we can't let this terrorist attack go public. We still haven't even ratified START 2 or dealt with the issue of TMDs. This has to do with the president's reputation and America's place as the dominant superpower. So patriotism is your excuse for circumventing the Constitution? It's important we know this, as the game doesn't actually explain what the START 3 treaty was, making the whole prospect of America signing a treaty which would reduce their nuclear arsenal, while simultaneously developing one of the most devastating nuclear weapons mankind's ever seen, make America's actions overall look very shady. As I said, very interesting stuff that Kojima presents here. The disingenuousness of these powerful nations, the equipment and weaponry they're producing behind the scenes, the presidents which are held accountable for these sorts of operations, despite never actually being informed 
informed of what's going on, everything being done behind their back, behind closed doors. The actual escape from this prison cell was a lot more varied than you might expect. This is no case of finding a secret wall and busting through it. There's numerous unique interactions you can have here with your allies, some of which are fairly useless but charming, like Naomi telling us to hold the controller up to our arm while she increases the level of painkillers in your blood, putting the controller's vibration function to good use once again. Others are a bit more impactful, however, like calling up Otacon, who says he'll come and help you out, but not before you're called back into a second interrogation sequence. This can happen a number of times if you're unable to find a way to escape, being left in your cell for a few minutes before being called back into the interrogation room. Of course, each time we're sent back in, being even more tiring for us the player due to the button mashing, increasing the chance of us getting the alternate ending even more. There's also an important codec conversation we get here between Snake and Naomi, where Snake ends up divulging into what Big Boss said in Zanzibar Land about him being Snake's father. No, wait. There was a man who said he was my father. Where is he? Dead. By my own hand. Big Boss. What? Big Boss? I had no idea. This is kind of a wild revelation here, despite not seeming like it while I was playing. As much like myself, I'm sure a lot of people suffer a sort of Mandela effect with this moment. What Snake says here is true, himself and Big Boss are in fact related, and I think it's something that gets so ingrained into the player's head by the time you reach the later games, that I've always kind of assumed we actually see the conversation play out in front of our eyes. Fact is though, we don't. We never hear any mention of us being related to Big Boss in Metal Gear 1 or 2, and it's an aspect that I believe Kojima threw into the mix in Metal Gear Solid, because of how heavily he focuses on the idea of genes, and in Snake's case, how you can supersede and surpass them. So, it's true, Big Boss is Snake's father, making Liquid's claims that they're both brothers start to seem slightly more plausible. We're still not done with the prison section however, with some other aspects I'd like to mention being the number of ways we can escape, varying from waiting around until the guard needs a crap, and hiding under the bed so that he comes in to check where you are. You're also able to use a ketchup packet which Otacon gives to you while lying on the ground Ground, making it look like you've bled out on the floor, and once again having the guard open the door to come check on you. And also, if you just wait around long enough, Grey Fox will be the one who opens the door for you. Whatever you decide to do, it's a section that while appearing simple on the surface, and only being located in one single room, holds quite a lot of character development in terms of the conversations we have over our codec, and in a gameplay sense, a wider amount of options which all push towards the same goal. Otacon ends up giving us a level 6 keycard, now meaning that we're able to enter the door that previously previously ended up in us getting captured. During our conversation with Otacon, he also ends up expressing his interest in Sniper Wolf, who despite literally being out to kill Snake, he claims is nice to him and that she likes dogs. I don't know why, but she's nice to me. Sounds like Stockholm Syndrome to me. I was taking care of the dogs here. After the terrorists took over, they were planning to shoot all the dogs. But Sniper Wolf stopped them. She even let me feed them when I asked. Otacon appearing to be somewhat in denial due to some kind of lustful feelings he appears to have in relation to her. Snake describing it as Stockholm Syndrome. Once we're out of the cell, it's time to collect our equipment and head back to where we last got caught by Wolf. A journey that I feel was a tad more stretched out than I think it could have been. We quite literally travelled all the way back to the first building very recently to get the PSG1. I think having us essentially repeat this process again in what's a relatively short time span is somewhat pointless and overall meaningless considering there's no new things to discover in any of the areas in between. For example, getting the level 6 keycard to my knowledge doesn't particularly open up any doors that hold unique equipment or weaponry, whereas when we gained the level 5 keycard and had to go back to the start, we got a new weapon in return, making the journey feel worth it, as well as the other impactful facets which were put in place in that instance. Here, it's literally just a case of go back to where you left off. Not a huge issue once again, and there are certain differences in these older areas, like the new cameras which overlook the snowy plain in between the first and second building, but overall, I don't think it's as good a moment as the backtracking leading up to the Sniper Wolf boss. You remove this and you quite literally miss out on nothing in my opinion, at least nothing substantial. Getting back to the comms tower, we're presented with yet another moment which is a direct repeat from Metal Gear 2. However, unlike the prison cell, which got expanded on to quite a large degree, here it's almost one for one the exact same thing we saw before, that being the chase sequence up the flight of stairs. There's not much to really say about this to be honest, as it's literally the exact same thing translated to 3D. It's slightly more difficult 
difficult to get away from the enemies this time, considering they're a bit faster than you and obviously aren't working off the more finicky bullet-based weapons as they did before. But overall, it's a tense transitory moment that both pays homage to Metal Gear 2, while also making our long trek up the stairs a bit more interesting. Not to mention as well, it serves as somewhat of an introduction to the massively explosive events we're about to witness once we reach the top, with both our run up to the comms tower where the sniper wolf battle was located, and the brief moment of calm after the stair sequence working as a nice contrast to the intensity by turning everything down, not even having any music, and merely relying on the ambience for a short while to make the following moments feel even larger in scale. And it definitely lives up to expectations, as reaching the top presents us with destruction on a gigantic scale, with Liquid destroying a radar dish right in front of us with a hind. <laughs> Unlike all of our previous boss encounters, we have no other choice than to run away, using the rope we acquired at the bottom of the comms tower to rappel down the building. Despite looking great, with all the bullets, explosions, and broken pipes which are shooting out gas, I'm not actually a big fan of this segment in terms of the gameplay. It's another context-sensitive moment, getting a call from the colonel who tells us the specific controls that now apply to the rappelling sequence alone. My only issue really is that they don't feel tight to any degree. Make no mistake, I've played this game numerous times by this point, but I'll be completely honest and say there's never been any strategy to getting down this tower. I tend to play on the normal and hard difficulties primarily, so going up to extreme might make the navigation here more essential, considering the amount of threats that get thrown at us. But that's where everything falters for me. If you can get through this sequence untouched, good on you. But I've never liked how Snake controls here. He feels way too floaty when you try to position yourself while being pushed off the wall, making it nigh on impossible for me to position myself in a place I actually want to go. I can appreciate the level of threats here, as I said, you've got the bullets and missiles from the hind, as well as numerous broken pipes which also damage you. But in terms of the bullets, once the guns started firing up, it was basically a 50-50 as to if I was going to dodge them or not. Because of Snake's movement here, I never felt like I could jump down far enough to move out the way of them vertically. And because of the floaty horizontal movement I mentioned, it was very hard to move out the way of them that way either, considering the bullets are shot in all kinds of different directions as well. It's definitely a memorable moment in this game, but kind of for the wrong reasons. I think I would have genuinely preferred if this was solely a cutscene, because although the visual itself is great, the way Snake handles in it will always look goofy to me. As I said though, perhaps it's just me. I'm not going to deny the fact that I've always just tried to get out of this section as soon as possible. After we escape the hind and get to the bottom, we get that moment which I said earlier when talking about the PSG-1 and its limited usage. There's several guards waiting for us ahead, all of which are literally lined up like targets in a shooting range. Trying to just run forward and shoot them at a closer range doesn't particularly work well here. You'll most likely end up dying before you actually reach them. So I'd say this is the only other time outside of boss fights that the PSG-1 actually gets used for a purpose that actually suits it. Nothing too special, but I just wanted to point out these aspects considering how Metal Gear Solid will eventually come to be known for its equipment and weapons that have numerous purposes which can be taken advantage of at any time. Back here, we can see that's really not the case. You're never really going into a room with your first thought being, I think the Nikita and PSG-1 would be the most effective for this room. I'll be honest and say some of the section which follows our entrance into the second part of the comms tower feels a lot like padding unfortunately. It starts off fine as we get another interaction with Otacon, with him uttering what would soon be an iconic line for the series. Do you think love can bloom even on a battlefield? genuinely great writing in that case. There's such a poetry to how some of the lines here are written and delivered. I can see why fans have attached quite strongly to these lines of dialogue. It's after this though, where some of my problems start to crop up. First, being our ascent up yet another flight of stairs. Not only is it unimaginative, considering we're literally performing the exact same thing as we did 10 minutes ago, but removing the guards who were chasing us does expose the fact running up stairs just isn't that fun, especially when you've only got concrete walls and metal piping to look at. The only threat are the gun cameras, which I mean you can hardly call a threat really, due to them literally being a case of using chaff grenades to completely avoid them. The fact they spot you every time without using them, reinforcing how this was supposed to show off the chaff's functionality once again. Once we reach the top, it's time for a face-off against the hind being piloted by Liquid, the main way of taking it down being the new Stinger missile launcher that we got when entering this building. Much like the sniper, we're thrown into the first person view when utilising this thing. However, despite assumedly being a far heavier piece of 
equipment to carry compared to a sniper, the turning issues are completely gone here, which works very well for what's a pretty swift boss fight. Of course, the only thing I'd say in relation to the stinger is that despite functioning perfectly well, there's not many instances you're going to have to actually use this thing. In terms of stealth, it's sort of the last thing you want to be pulling out, but that's fine really. As you've most likely noticed, this game takes the approach of other games which I've played, which were released after Metal Gear Solid, like Max Payne, having each weapon serve an individual and unique function, with no real filler. It's somewhat of a personal choice when it comes to game development, although I've always somewhat preferred this approach to weapon implementation. For games like Grand Theft Auto, for example, you can understand having some overlap in terms of the weaponry, because the game itself is a lot more focused around player freedom, giving them the ability to choose and customise a broader range of weapons, that while having similar properties, rely on appearance as their main source of variation. In a game like Metal Gear Solid, however, the game doesn't only feel like it wouldn't cater to a wide arsenal of weaponry, due to the main point of the game being revolved around feeling vulnerable when avoiding the enemy, but also, having each weapon serve a particular function ends up making them all the more distinct. I think a game like Max Payne does pull this effect off better in my opinion, purely because the idea of stealth is not enforced at all in that game, meaning you're able to experiment around with all your weapons at any time. But Metal Gear Solid still does a great job of presenting a varied arsenal of weaponry that all needs to be used at certain points during the experience. One of those instances is here obviously, with the stinger being the only way to attack the hind which is flying around the air. This is the third fight now we've had against the hind, and I think although it's the best, I wouldn't say it's a great fight in itself. I really enjoy the scale of this fight, you genuinely feel like an ant in comparison to the hind. The fact it can literally fly around the air and shoot missiles and bullets at you from long range is genuinely quite daunting, and although you've now got the stinger to fight back, after shooting a few shots, you'll notice this thing isn't going to go down easily, feeling even more like the underdog here. The stinger works pretty much perfectly in this fight, finding a good balance due to the environment which oftentimes blocks off shots to the hind, and having that paired up with this very powerful auto lock ability, which hardly misses when you're able to get a clear shot off. Talking of the environment, while I do find it somewhat barren, it doesn't really matter due to most of your attention being drawn to the square structure in the middle of the arena, serving as our main form of cover. It's a fine solution to the hind's attacks, and due to the speed it moves at, as well as the wide angles it covers, it doesn't mean you'll be able to just stand behind it and dodge everything. You do still have to be actively aware of where the hind is, and prepare for where it's going to move next while it's firing. I do find the solution to be quite underwhelming however, and a bit goofy to be honest. Liquid spends so long just firing at the structure in the middle, when he's obviously got no chance of hitting you, and unlike some of the other encounters which present a nice back and forth, this feels more like a waiting game the majority of the time. You wait for Liquid to attack, then you attack, rinse and repeat. So yeah, I'm not a fan of how repetitive the fight can become quite early on, once you've figured out the middle was your main form of cover, and how Liquid repeats the same few attacks over and over again, you've pretty much got the fight sussed out. But that's not to say it loses any points in terms of its difficulty. It might be slightly bland in my eyes, but you're still having to stay totally engaged and alert, as failing to do so could possibly result in Liquid getting some damage off, where you'll find on normal difficulty at least, the hind deals out quite significant amounts of damage. And to be fair, although I mentioned Liquid performing the same attacks rinse and repeat, that's only the majority of the time. I will admit, this fight was impressive to me in terms of the different types of attacks that worked as one-offs, and even changed the arena to a certain degree. The one I'm referring to right now being his missile attack, where he fires a missile at the building, and in turn makes the debris towards the bottom right of the arena collapse. It's a pretty memorable and great fight to be honest, putting aside my criticisms of the repetitive attacks. I think the hind fight is pulled off about the best I could possibly expect. It's not overcomplicated or too tricky, the rules are laid out very clearly from the start, and all it takes to beat it is for you to be alert, patient, and send out those stinger missiles when you get the chance. I will say though, the part where the hind ducks down and tries to be stealthy is just downright ridiculous. Out of all the battles to introduce a sort of stealth element, the massive, deafening hind wasn't the right one to be honest. With Liquid down, and the path to Metal Gear being unlocked via the elevator we previously couldn't access, it's time to head back down, get in, and face yet another encounter we've seen in the past. The setup here is good, with Snake and Otacon slowly realising there's possibly a group of enemies held up in the very same elevator. The warning went off, and I know I couldn't be over the limit. How much do you weigh? About 135, but that elevator had a weight limit of 650 pounds. It would take at least five people to go over that limit. Look out, Snake! The guys who stole my stealth prototypes are in there with you! 
And wouldn't you know, they're exactly right. As you can tell, this is a repeat of the same elevator sequence in Metal Gear 2. And just like back then, it's fine, but nothing to write home about. The one thing I'll say is that it definitely isn't as rudimentary as the encounter we saw before. But it was this fight which led me to question what the intention of all this repetition is. It's something that when going back to the Metal Gear games, I think I forgot how prevalent it was. I forgot how defined these game structures actually are. Think of it in this context. Every time you pick up a Mario game, you expect the same kinds of jumping on enemies, picking up coins, and hitting blocks. When you play the Elder Scrolls, you expect an open world fantasy adventure. It's similar with Metal Gear, but the difference I think comes in the story. There's certain narrative beats which are pulled off verbatim across the entire franchise. Something that you might have seen crop up in Metal Gear 1 now ends up being directly translated and merely fitted with a new context in Metal Gear Solid 2. The only game I think is actively aware of the repetition is the one I just mentioned, to MGS2. But I only realised recently how these games are structured. It's the kind of series where if you look at things like when certain cutscenes happen and when boss fights occur, you'll start to see quite a bit of overlap. This isn't really a negative or a positive in my eyes, although due to it being primarily revolved around the repetition of a general concept, with only the new ideas livening up what could be quite a similar feeling experience, I could see some people describing these game structures as stale after a while. And don't get me wrong, I can totally understand that stance as well. Once that fight's over, it seems the unique combat encounters just keep rolling in, with Sniper Wolf making her presence known immediately when heading outside by shooting Snake to the ground, with Otacon begging us not to kill her, we have to pull out our sniper and try kill her, in a boss fight that while still suffering the same constraints from the almost mandatory usage of the PSG-1, feels a lot more intense and like an actual fight for a few reasons, stepping away from the fairly lifeless and drab hallway from before, and instead taking us to this broader, snowy landscape. With the area being larger, you now have to pay a lot more attention to aspects like your positioning, due to the environment being a lot more open, with less cover, as well as also Wolf's positioning, considering she continually moves around her side of the arena. It's still the same general concept as last time, get your eyes on the target and pull the trigger, but more elements are introduced which feed into the stealthy nature of what a sniper is generally thought of as. Things like the jet white uniform Wolf is now wearing to blend into the snowy environment, frequently finding cover behind different trees. When you break it down, it is very similar to the previous fight we had with her, however I do think this is easily the superior fight. The stakes are even higher than before, due to our previous hatred of Wolf for shooting Meryl, and now is elevated even higher because of how she captured us, resulting in us being tortured. As I've already said, I think the environment is much better compared to the first fight, both in terms of the actual visuals, how you and Wolf interact within this environment, and also the more obscured view we now have compared to before, not even being able to see across the arena when entering first person mode. And overall, that's the only aspect which can really be talked about as having any difference here, which ultimately makes the fight a fine encounter, but admittedly very similar to the first. Her death is quite similar to Mantis's, giving some final words about about her childhood, which was stricken with war, violence, and a constant fear of dying, yet again using this to give some perspective of how she ended up working for a villain like Liquid, while also mentioning how she's another victim of Big Boss's child soldier regime. Well, only a victim depending on what side you're on. Saladin. He took me away from all that. Saladin? You mean Big Boss? Like we saw with other child soldiers that were being held in Zanzibar land, just because he saved them doesn't make him a good person. The children were a means to an end to create brand new youthful soldiers like Wolf, who would grow up with their only motivation being to fight. The music in particular during this cutscene is great. It's definitely trying to pull at your heartstrings, and for many people, I think that works successfully. It's never affected me all that much, to be honest, although I think we're entering the territory of complete subjectivity, about what kind of things makes one person cry and another not feel anything at all. I've got a feeling it's mainly to do with the graphical drawbacks and the slight melodrama of the situation. On top of the fact, in reality, this is all happening quite suddenly. Even in Mantis's case, it did take a second for him to start opening up about his troubled childhood, whereas Wolf seems to do that almost immediately. Snake once again shows how unbiased he is when it comes to these people which are described as evil and villainous by everyone around us, using her nickname Wolf to describe her as noble and honourable. Wolves are noble animals. They're not like dogs. 
However, the following lines, where he calls both him and Wolf mercenaries, makes it clear that Snake always seems to be on the border of total hero and complete villain. Unlike those around him, Snake completely understands where these people are coming from, and there's likely urges inside of him at points to give in to his violent and animalistic tendencies like them. After all, it's quite literally been programmed into his genes. It's an interesting thing to think about, the fact he continually claims he's a mercenary, with no actual ties to the organisation he's working for. Snake can clearly see right from wrong, but he also seems to be considerate to the mercenaries on both sides of a conflict. Much like we saw earlier, it seems that Snake resists from any kind of bias because of the act of war itself, and how when stepping back from the motivations from all the parties involved, it's an all-out bloodbath, with the people who are actually fighting on the ground being thought of as expendable, and those who aren't fighting, but instead commanding these troops being thought of as powerful leaders. As Snake prepares to put Wolf down, Otacon makes a reappearance, which just makes me think his attachment to Wolf is bizarre. I'm not even sure if this is intentional or not, Snake talked about Otacon having Stockholm Syndrome, an idea which relates to one person having a very strong attachment to someone else who treats them badly basically, some cases being more extreme than others. For as much as I think it's a relationship that's just not developed that well, there is also other things we witness which makes me think it's intentional. The shot where Wolf seemingly reaches her hand out to Otacon before claiming she actually wants her gun is a very clear example in my eyes, almost comical. You think she'd have some kind of attachment to Otacon, considering how he talks about her, but she hardly acknowledges him the entire time. In fact, I think it would have been fine if Otacon didn't bring up love blooming on the battlefield after Snake shoots Wolf. I probably would have just assumed Otacon having this full on unrequited love for Wolf, and in a way, that could still be the case. It's just the fact that Snake doesn't bring him up on it at all. It's made to seem like Wolf and Otacon actually had a chance of a relationship, despite not showing any signs of having any connection whatsoever. I don't know, I've always just found it quite weird in terms of how it's presented. And ultimately, it doesn't really matter, does it? She's dead. <laughs> We're now at the final few sections of the game, starting with the what what the what's going on? Alright then, we're now at the final few sections of the game after switching over to disc 2, which I find to be incredibly nostalgic nowadays. Now, despite not minding these final few areas, I do find them to be a lot more surface level compared to most of the areas at the start of the game. There is a very clear reason for this I will add, which will eventually reveal itself, but going through these for the first time just felt fine and nothing else. The one thing I felt was almost absent at this point is the actual stealth gameplay, which is something else I could reasonably be seen to be intentional. The first room we enter for example, this being being the furnace, features a multi-layered design, which uses verticality very well. There's warm and vibrant colours from the fire, which takes up a large part of the floor. The tones in particular being a very clever mental note the player will make without even realising. But there's very few actual guards wandering around the room, and even then there was something about the earlier areas of the game which felt a lot more difficult to get through. This is where the intentionality might rear its head however, as although I have these feelings towards most of the areas in the latter part of the game, perhaps this was done purposely to show how our skills have improved as we've played the game. That does imply the difficulty of these sections are somewhat false, considering the typical kind of progression you see is having a game ramp up the difficulty towards the end, as the player is entirely familiar with the game's mechanics. But as I said, I might be wrong. Some games go for the approach I'm talking about, and some don't. But if we're looking at my personal opinion of this initial furnace area, I think it's fine. I really like the design and atmosphere of it. I like the more unique and tense ways we can traverse the room, like the tight pathway on the top floor, where we need to press up against the wall and walk across the fire below. I do think there could have been just a few more obstacles in our way however, which in my playthrough somewhat coincided with my discovery of how effective the suppressor on the SOCOM is. There's enough distance and hidey holes where we can take out a large amount of the enemies in the room without much concern. A positive in terms of putting our weaponry to good use, but once again, you've got to think about how this affects the stealth gameplay as a whole. I'm not saying this game does this, but if you reach a point in a stealth video game where you're able to breeze past most situations without much care towards your actions, you've somewhat lost the vision on what a good stealth video game should be aiming to achieve. Past this area, we head down another elevator, this one being less enclosed and basically begging to have a fight on it, which, wouldn't you know, happens almost immediately. I haven't got much to say about this, you're killing guards with additional health on a moving platform again. I think there should have at least been something a tad more unique to make this fight feel like a necessary inclusion. I don't know if you've noticed by this point, but the game's structure has now dramatically changed from how it was at the start of the game. It's more about investigation at the beginning 
getting new key cards to search rooms for equipment, finding hostages, avoiding enemies. But ever since the chase sequence up the stairs, you should have noticed there's no real gameplay outside of the set pieces at this point, only transitory moments, and even then, the transitory moments sometimes are set pieces in themselves. From the stair sequence, we get the moment where we jump off the roof, a short interlude where we go to the top of the second building, and we fight the hind. From the hind, we get the four guards in the elevator, directly leading to Wolf, then another elevator fight, and then a Vulcan Raven fight in a second. It's something else that I'm merely clarifying. I'm not sure if I'd consider it a positive or negative personally, as the sequences that we do see are all good to be fair. But on the same merit, I do feel like the experience becomes even more linear and restrictive than it already somewhat is. The explorative elements appear to get toned down quite a lot. There's hardly any moments in between all these set pieces where we're given a chance to discover things for ourselves. The elevator to the wolf fight being the clearest example of this in my opinion. You literally get funneled from one set piece directly into another one. You might think it's a good thing considering there's no padding in between, and I can understand that viewpoint. But as I said, I also think there's a place for areas like the furnace, which contain more optional exploration and aren't just boss fights the player's locked into. I love the ice cold atmosphere we can feel immediately when reaching the bottom of the two elevators. The ravens which get introduced on the second one being a clever indication a raven is most likely up ahead, and the colour of the scene turning to an icy blue, which much like the furnace is also a brilliantly subtle element to present the player with. Up ahead, we see the reappearance of Vulcan Raven, messing with Snake's mind and giving him a weird talk featuring the mention of the event Earpool. There is another event that I excel at. It is called the Earpool. It is an event where two opponents pull each other's ears while enduring the harsh cold. It tests spiritual as well as physical strength. I don't have many complaints about this fight overall. The arena's more confined compared to the last few bosses we've gone up against, taking us back to the tight interiors which we experienced when fighting Ocelot and Grey Fox. The room itself isn't small, but instead is filled with numerous crates that are stacked on top of each other, this working as your main form of cover here. Raven is a beast, lugging around a minigun in which getting caught by him results in him raining hellfire towards your position. It's arguably the boss that toys around with stealth elements more than any other. The whole aim is to keep out of sight basically creeping up on Raven while he's unaware of your presence and getting some damage off. I appreciate the variety of approaches we can take here as well, all being centred around explosives due to bullets not being good enough to put down this beast. Of course, the most effective weapon you'll likely find yourself going to is the Stinger, dealing a high amount of damage while still being swift to use. But on the other hand, if you're looking for an even more covert and sneaky approach, you can do things like use the Nikita missiles so you're completely out the line of fire. These do work, however you're going to have to be a lot more skillful when guiding them to Raven, as he's able to shoot them out the air very easily. You can also set up traps like claymores and C4 around the arena and lead Raven into them. For a boss that has a particularly visceral energy to it, it's surprising that it's also a fight which promotes a bit more creativity and freedom from the player. There is an elevation to this fight, however there's no different phases. After you damage Raven enough, you'll find that he'll start stepping on the gas a bit more, speeding up in terms of his attacks and movement speed, a great addition in terms of keeping you even more alert. Not to mention, the destruction of the environment is also great having pathways blocked off due to several of the crates collapsing, and many of the crates being filled with bullet holes after Raven lets loose. I wouldn't say it's a particularly hard boss, as long as you're keeping your eye on the Soliton radar and waiting for a good chance to attack, Raven shouldn't give you too many problems. He is definitely dangerous though, so still shouldn't be taken lightly. The main word I'd use in relation to this fight is satisfying. It felt like a fight where once again we were the underdog, but unlike other times, it wasn't merely a case of brute forcing our way to victory. There's a bit more strategy and planning which has to go into defeating Raven here, which I really liked. As expected by this point, Raven gives a closing message while he dies. <laughs> Which does include some interesting developments here. He says that Snake and his apparent actual brother Liquid were not created by nature. It's unsure at this time if he's merely referring to their personalities, or perhaps something a bit more literal. We also get a full-on confirmation that the Anderson we spoke to was Decoy Octopus, although I'd say if you were paying attention, you would have been able to figure it out quite a while ago. What would have been helpful was an explanation on why he actually disguised himself as Anderson, but with Raven getting swiftly devoured by the actual Raven surrounding him, it's time to go find Liquid. Conveniently, we get a call from Master Miller right after the fight, telling you and the Colonel that he believes Naomi is actually a spy. It appears to all be guesswork for the most part. We're going off Miller's speculation and a claim that the real Naomi Hunter disappeared in the Middle East, with no actual evidence. What it does expose, however, is how the Colonel was once again up to something shady. If she's one of their spies, then we're in big trouble. What do you mean? Oh, nothing. Have you let her in on some kind of vital secret or something? 
the pauses in his dialogue, and the constant repetition to Snake about needing more time, being great, and turning us against him. Whatever it is the colonel's up to at this point, Snake wants no part in it. Heading past a connecting bridge, which has tons of gun cameras placed around, we finally discover Metal Gear. Much like what Metal Gear 2 effectively achieved, the mech feels absolutely massive, with it taking up the majority of the area we're about to make our way through, even having to climb on top of it at points to reach another side. The codec calls we get from Otacon in this area truly solidify him as our closest ally at this point. Everyone else we've interacted with has either died, or in the case of someone like the Colonel, isn't being completely honest with us. The friendship we see between these two is one of my favourites in gaming history, although I'd say it reaches its peak in either Metal Gear Solid 2 or 4, but that's somewhat a given due to us spending a larger amount of time with both characters. As we make our way towards the control room, in which Snake also notices there's mysteriously no guards around, Otacon begins hacking into Baker's private files to try and discover a way to override the launch sequence for Metal Gear. I like how the codec conversations are interspersed between each gradual piece of progression towards our goal, eventually with Otacon successfully hacking in. Unfortunately for us, he can't yet find the override process, but does divulge more into Metal Gear's technical capabilities, and also how it was created in a way where it could couldn't technically be defined as a nuclear weapon. Yet again, Kojima's making us look at the sneaky goings-on of these so-called proper governments, the kind of ones who claim their ultimate goal was peace and freedom, while secretly developing weapons like this, which are going to cause the polar opposite. Inside the control room, a liquid and ocelot, where listening into their discussion reveals much more about Liquid's ultimate plans here. We start to see that it's not a simple case of wanting all-out nuclear war, launching this first nuke so it will cause a chain reaction for other nations around the world. Instead, it's got more to do with these nations' reputations, the one he's primarily aiming to destroy being America. Ocelot appears confused when Liquid reroutes the nuke's target to Lopnor in China, instead of the original destination which was in Russia, with that actually making perfect sense in terms of motives. It still basically boils down to the idea of a villain wanting to be in full control so they can get a huge monetary profit in return. But yet again, due to all the real world talk that gets introduced here, it immediately seems more interesting, and in my mind, almost mapping out these kinds of possibilities in terms of the world I'm personally experiencing. Liquid plans to nuke an area that doesn't actually have any people in it, instead aiming for a nuclear test site in China to merely let nations around the world know America has its hands on nuclear weapons and could still potentially use them. The goal was to essentially avoid a nuclear war, while at the same time crippling other nations' trust in America to the point where they'll want to start rearming themselves with their own nuclear weapons, all culminating in Liquid making deals with nations that would surely get in contact with him for Metal Gear Rex, selling America's shady an illegal system off to the highest bidder. Washington won't be very happy when we start selling their own system to the highest bidders. Yes, the president will break. He will give in to our demands. What he's describing is a full-on dismantling of America in particular. He doesn't appear to care about how other nations run their countries. He even acknowledges Russia being a bad spot to nuke because of Ocelot's heritage stemming from there. Liquid wants to see America fall to its knees, hopefully, so they can eventually give in to all of their requests. Those being a billion dollars, Big Boss's DNA, and also a vaccine to something referred to as Fox Dye. I'm also including the Fox Dye vaccine in our demands. Fox Dye. It killed Octopus and the arms tech president. They run on this idea of Fox Dye for a minute, claiming that it's what caused Decoy Octopus and Baker to suddenly die, although it's still uncertain how these guys would have actually gotten infected by what's sounding increasingly like some kind of virus. Mantis is speculated to not have been infected because of his mask, and the same with Wolf because of the tranquilizers she apparently would take, describing Fox Dye as something which sounds man-made, saying, Maybe it's just because this Fox Dye was still experimental and they haven't worked out all the bugs yet. The aforementioned they being unclear at this time, but definitely referring to an actual person or team of people working on a virus which can kill people, much like we saw with our own eyes. A man going by Sergei Galukovich gets brought up here, who we previously saw be mentioned during the interrogation sequence. This is the man that's most likely going to try outbid every other nation to acquire Metal Gear, having a good relationship with Ocelot due to his ties with his home country, that being Russia of course. The ongoing rivalry which has been painted out between America and Russia across the 
game only gets reinforced even further here, with Ocelot saying he's almost certain Galukovic will buy Metal Gear from them, as it's one of his last shots to make Russia a powerful force once again. The Cold War is something which Kojima heavily focuses on throughout almost every entry of the Metal Gear franchise, and it's something that as a kid I wasn't particularly aware of, but has only become increasingly blatant as time's gone on. The conversation wraps up with a few things of note, first of which being the fact that Galukovic appears to have invested a lot more into Liquid's operation than we might have first suspected, apparently giving them the hind and the majority of their heavy firepower. Second is how the genome soldiers have all actually been brainwashed by Psycho Mantis, something which Liquid feels is starting to wear off. This being interesting, as it makes their operation feel even more self-serving, as opposed to a collective revolution from the Foxhound unit. And finally, Liquid's main aim is revealed to be a revival of Big Boss's dream, renaming Shadow Moses to Outer Heaven. From today, call this place Outer Heaven. Big Boss's dream. Despite being three games in, we're still pretty much in the dark in relation to what Big Boss's dream actually is, however. It ultimately could be anything from world domination to just being recognised as a nation, although this is obviously something which gets expanded on to great lengths later on. A call with Otacon after all this reveals the way to deactivate the launch sequence, that being an almost identical process to the brooch in Metal Gear 2, where the single keycard actually holds all three cards inside of it, being made out of a shape memory alloy which reacts to different temperatures, changing shape in accordance with them. It's still a very good idea, so I don't mind the almost identical reappearance of it here, but it's actually the thing surrounding this mechanic which I find even better this time round. We get caught by Liquid and Ocelot, dropping the keycard down below, in which we need to make our way down there and find it. The key fell in the drainage ditch. Some clever usage from the mind detector here allows us to find the keycard amongst the sewage pretty easily. And now it's time for my favourite part, activating all three keycards. As Otacon told us, there's three separate terminals we need to activate. The room temperature, the cold temperature, and the high temperature. Room temperature is what the keycard is set to from the get-go, so all we have to do is head back up and activate it. Things might become a bit more difficult from this point on, however, especially if you decide to not get in contact with Otacon or the Colonel for a hint. You can naturally assume cold and warm temperature temperatures come from a lot of places. For example, the sewage below is most likely quite chilly, however you'll find that staying in it for a while doesn't change the keycard. Instead, they use backtracking and visual telegraphing to max effect here, and as you might have already assumed when I talked about them earlier, it's all got to do with the furnace room and Raven's boss arena. Heading back to these areas, it becomes very obvious how the atmospheres of the rooms were purposely set up to instill thoughts of hot and cold. As I mentioned when we visited them for the first time, Raven's arena has a very distinct blue hue filling up the screen, whereas the furnace room has this same strong filter, but instead is a shade of red. I love subtle elements like that in games, having something be completely unsaid, yet distinct enough to when it comes to moments like this, we can naturally piece together exactly what to do merely from how the world has been set up doing it in a way that seems natural, yet also functional when it comes to the mechanics of this keycard, and how we're going to go about progressing. Backtracking's not an issue here at all in my opinion, because of how strong the sense of progression feels. Heading back to Raven's Arena for example, is not only a very short distance, but the aha moment you feel when seeing the orange keycard turn into a blue one is so satisfying for me, even more so if you figured it out by yourself. The only somewhat issue I have is going all the way back to the control room and then heading back down to the furnace. That does feel somewhat prolonged and I would have ultimately preferred some kind of workaround which let you input the cold and hot temperatures at the same time. Not too big of an issue though, and I think it's clear they must have been somewhat aware of this, due to them throwing in some additional codec calls on the way back to the furnace. The call we get is another one from Miller, telling us to switch off our monitor so the colonel can't hear, before divulging more into fox dye, confirming it to be a virus, but one that only targets specific people, basically turning it into a type of bioweapon. There's one big issue however which Miller reveals to us, seeing how octopus and Baker's deaths were so similar, he turns his attention to Naomi, and the possibility that along with the nanomachines she injected into our blood, Fox Dye could have potentially been placed inside a snake as well. Snake, try to remember. Did Naomi give you some kind of injection? The nanomachines. She was in the best position to have done it, but I don't know what her motive was. Snake doesn't appear to be that phased, however. We're told by the Colonel that Naomi's been placed under arrest, after it's discovered she was more than likely sending coded messages to the terrorists, and when reminded he might possibly suffer the same fate as Baker and Octopus, Snake merely focuses on his mission, his life once again seeming like something he has no care in actually preserving. It's all focused around completing his mission. If he dies in the process, so be it. But Snake, you might be infected too, you know. 
All I can do is leave it up to the Colonel. Repeating the process from before in the furnace room gives us the red card. We're taking the two elevators back down, makes us realise these really do go on for an unnecessarily long amount of time. We do eventually get a call from Naomi, however, tying up a few loose ends and clarifying Naomi's ultimate motivations. For people who've played Metal Gear 1 and 2, there's something that's odd from the very first moment we meet Naomi. That being her name, Naomi Hunter, which, if you remember, was also Grey Fox's last name. This is something which finally gets confirmed here, where Naomi talks about her past, describing how her brother, Frank Yeager, and herself were saved by him. I was alone for so long, until I met my big brother, and him. Him obviously being Big Boss, with the continuous claim that Big Boss would save these people who had nowhere else to go, reinforcing both his power and force on a global scale, while at the same time showing how blind a lot of these people are. They claim they were saved, but they're not realising the reason behind why they were saved. The closest person to a saviour in their case is Solid Snake himself. There's not a chance someone growing up inside of Big Boss's Outer Heaven or Zanzibar Land operations would ever just be allowed to leave and experience life for themselves. That may very well lead to a potential leak of information, which Big Boss doesn't want to come out. So it all comes back to Control once again. He may have saved these people from imminent death, but possibly handed them a fate which many would consider worse. A life without freedom. A life where you're forced down a path you don't actually want to go down. That's what Big Boss presented these people. He's a hero and a villain at the same time. Back to our conversation with Naomi, however. It starts to become clearer that Naomi's channeling all her emotions into a revenge mission against the man who killed her brother. As she says, Frank was so important to her that she doesn't particularly care if what she's doing is right or wrong. Ever since Snake took him down, her goal has been to take Snake down too. I waited two long years. To kill me? Is that all you cared about? Yes. That's right. Two years. You were all I thought about for two long years. Like some kind of twisted obsession. Do you still hate me? The storytelling here is just fantastic. In such a short amount of time, we understand so many more elements of Naomi's character without it feeling forced. Not to mention that within the things she says, we learn new things outside of solely her character, and are given even more things to ponder over. Much like we've already suspected, Grey Fox is basically an empty vessel at this point, having everything about him be so distorted by the genome experiments from Dr. Clark that his only motivation at this point seems to be revolved around fighting Snake, seeming somewhat appropriate considering it's one of the only times he was bested in conflict. Naomi finally begins talking about Fox Die, describing the intricate process of how it kills a target. First, infecting the target's macrophages, these being a type of cell which actively detects harmful bacteria and destroys them, obviously with the destruction of them leaving the target open to potential viruses. Then, by creating TNF Epsilon, Fox Die begins killing cells within the body, eventually reaching the heart where the victim ends up dying from a heart attack, with the heart cells essentially killing themselves. Everything Everything becomes a lot more suspicious, however, when Naomi mentions that killing Snake with Fox Die wasn't actually part of the plan. Listen, Snake. I'm not the one who made the decision to use Fox Die. Huh? You weren't? No. You were injected with Fox Die as a part of this operation. I just wanted to let you know that. Getting injected with Fox Die was apparently all part of the operation to begin with. Conveniently, she ends up getting discovered and put under arrest again, making the Colonel at this point appear like a double-crossing liar who knew we'd been injected with Fox Die, so there'd be no loose ends in relation to this potentially world-shaking operation. It's definite that Snake's been injected with the virus, introducing some pretty high stakes considering how the player most likely has attached to Snake's character, as well as his mission, which may possibly be left incomplete if he were to die before he can stop Liquid. The way the Colonel talks to us at this point couldn't show any more how we're just an asset to the government. The only reason they care so much about Snake's survival was because it's in their best interest. Any bond which we might have had with the Colonel at this point begins to weaken. Snake's just a puppet, and he's talking to him exactly as you'd expect in that regard. Inserting the final keycard into the machine reveals a dubious lie which has been set up ever since we met Decoy Octopus. It's something I think is quite strange when further analysing Snake's character up to this point, but works brilliantly in terms of a singular moment. Snake's proven himself 
yourself over the course of the game to be knowledgeable, a skilled soldier, but most of all, inquisitive. You'll notice that not many cutscenes or codec calls go by where he isn't asking some kind of question, which I think works well in making Snake more interchangeable with the actual player who's controlling him. It's playing into a technique which many writers use where they make one of their characters a vessel for the audience. This can be done to good and bad effect. Snake, for example, was good in my opinion. I think he strikes a good balance between what I'd perceive as a bad example of this by essentially giving out exposition, but in a natural way. I've always thought exposition has been a lazy technique in films and games, but when done right, it can give a necessary amount of backstory and information to the audience, which they haven't seen for themselves. Kojima oversteps the mark in certain areas, but I find Metal Gear Solid to actually be fairly concise when revisiting it. When it came out, it was renowned for its long cutscenes and long-winded dialogue, but it really didn't seem all that bad to me. Although I will admit, this could be the signs of someone being jaded by the later entries of the series. I might not think these cutscenes are long because I damn well know the ones in future games are. Anyways, as we saw, it turns out that inputting all three key cards actually activates the detonation sequence. Despite knowing we'd been fooled by Decoy Octopus earlier in the game, we still took his information at face value, with everyone else throughout the game only reinforcing what we've just done as the only way to stop the launch. It's something that on your first playthrough should be genuinely surprising, and on subsequent playthroughs be satisfying to see play out with your pre-existing knowledge. Although I will say, Snake's not an idiot. It will always be a bit strange that he never questions inputting the key cards, despite knowing full well that Decoy Octopus, a guy who's working for Liquid, told him this is the way to stop the launch. The twists don't end here though, immediately getting a call from Miller, who thanks us for activating Metal Gear, laying out his master plan, which was all made possible due to Snake's contribution, and failure to realise he was feeding into a trap, pulling a downright genius switcheroo on us. Snake, that's not Master Miller. Campbell, you're too late. Master Miller's body was just discovered at his home. He's been dead for at least three days. I didn't know because my codec link with Master was cut off, but Mei Ling said his transmission signal was coming from inside the base. So who is it? Snake, you've been talking to me, dear brother. Liquid, how the... You've served your purpose. You may die now. That's right, Miller has been liquid in disguise the entire time, with the real Master Miller being found dead in his house. I love that reveal so much, it's something which still works so well despite obviously being aware of it today. The only thing I think could have worked even more to its benefit is if we interacted with Miller to the same level as someone like the Colonel. I'm talking about the mandatory codec calls. You can call up Miller whenever you want during the game, but as he never actually proves himself to give any useful game related advice typically, I could imagine a lot of people just skipping over him to get on with the game fast. And despite them kind of doing that thing where they all of a sudden focus heavily on a certain character which hasn't had that much development, with Miller being given the most amount of codec calls solely in this final segment where he's revealed to be Liquid, I think it's primarily because of how compelling Liquid already is that it still feels natural. We end up getting locked in the control room for a second until Otacon opens up the door, and when getting outside, we finally have our long-awaited confrontation with Liquid. He proves himself to be a multifaceted villain here, being both outright mocking and maniacal at points, while also making making Snake question himself and the organization that he's working for. Why did you disguise yourself as Master? So I could manipulate you more easily. And you performed quite well, I must say. Although the boys at the Pentagon are probably saying the same thing. What the hell are you talking about? Following orders blindly with no questions asked, you've lost your warrior's pride and become nothing more than a pawn snake. Liquid's definitely right about a lot of things here. Snake's mercenary mindset of get the job done at all costs led him to blindly following orders from people like the Colonel, resulting in Snake potentially being the one to ironically launch Metal Gear. Liquid's right when he claims Snake has become nothing more than a pawn, revealing his mission the entire time has merely been a diversion, so that Snake would go around spreading the virus to all the Foxhound members, in turn killing them and then succumbing to the virus himself. From the beginning, the Pentagon was just using you as a vector to spread Fox Die. Fox Die? It can't be. 
The Pentagon wanted everyone involved in this mission, even Snake, to die. No loose ends, which means no possible leaks, and also a much easier process when coming in to collect Rex, the dummy warhead data, and the bodies of the genome soldiers. Once again, this is something we should have almost suspected earlier on, but was introduced subtly enough to where we would have only raised an eyebrow at the time, before immediately going back to what we thought was the greater task at hand. The real interesting stuff begins being presented when Liquid starts talking about how him and Snake are linked, fully confirming that when he refers to them as brothers, it's not a figure of speech or bravado. They are genuinely twins, sharing the same genetic code and similar likeness to one another. In any case, if it doesn't kill you, then I'm not worried either. After all, our genetic code is identical. So it's true, you and I are... Yes, twins. But we're not ordinary twins. We're twins linked by cursed genes. Les enfants terribles. You're fine. You got all the old man's dominant genes. I got the flawed recessive gene. Everything was done so that you would be the greatest of his children. The only reason I exist is so they could create you. As you may have seen in the briefing sequence, before Snake was deployed on this mission where he would shave most of his hair off, he shared an even more striking resemblance to Liquid. We get onto this topic when talking about the effectiveness of Fox Die. It's now up in the air how long Snake, Liquid, and Ocelot have got to live. It appears that whereas Octopus and Baker were affected pretty much instantly, you three don't show any sign that anything's wrong. Liquid refers to something known as Les Enfants Terribles, which in English means the terrible children. And the more he talks about this project, it becomes clear that both him and Snake weren't born like any other regular child. In fact, with the way Liquid starts talking about genes, it sounds like the brother's creation isn't too dissimilar to the Human Genome Project. It's important to realise that Liquid isn't talking in riddles like we might have once suspected. When he claims Snake was given Big Boss's dominant genes and he was given the flawed recessive genes, he is genuinely referring to the intentionality of these actions. It's not about them being born and their genes merely being that way. This was something which was programmed to occur from their conception. It's here where Liquid motivations start to become a bit clearer, harbouring a very strong resentment to the idea that unlike Snake, who was made to be the perfect soldier, Liquid was almost like a first draft, a leftover, something to be thrown to the wayside so that Snake could be marvelled at. Liquid's motivations at this point all seem to be revolved around legacy, his hatred towards Big Boss for claiming he was the inferior child, and his hatred towards Snake for stealing his chance for revenge. It's a somewhat meta element for me. Liquid pretty much says in this moment that he's carrying out the destiny which is within his genes, which in my eyes literally refers to the idea of being the final big bad boss, which was a role in the previous two games that was taken on by his father. With Metal Gear now active, Liquid hops in and we launch directly into a battle with it. I have mixed feelings about this boss fight, but starting with the good stuff, what a spectacle this fight is. This is the type of thing where you can really tell they were pushing the PlayStation to its limits. Rex is a goliath of a weapon, and although its design might not truly be as intricate compared to Metal Gear D, it makes up for it in spades when taking into account the scale of this thing. Rex is a damn intimidating foe from the outset, not just because of its size, but also the quite rapid speed it can move at, which obviously paired up with the length of its strides means that it can reach your position in about 3 or 4 steps. The arena is one of the biggest in the game, where the scale was the only impressive thing visually. Ultimately, we're still fighting in the same grey metallic environment as we have for the majority of the game. I also think Rex's attacks, how they're choreographed, and how they interact with the environment is all great too. Leaning back and launching out homing rockets, which can only be dodged effectively when using chaff grenades. When we're at a closer distance, firing up the two machine guns on its head. And when we're really close, either trying to step on us, or firing up its huge laser from beneath. The attacks are great, but getting onto some of the more mixed things. I'm not really a fan of how we take this thing out. There is actually a couple ways we can approach this fight, the first of which is heavily reliant on the chaff grenades which I mentioned, with the homing missiles being one of the most frequent attacks from Rex. The chaffs become pretty much essential, as it's almost impossible to continually dodge each of the homing missiles while they're actively tracking you. You need almost perfect timing in that regard. That process of elimination I found to be slightly boring in my opinion, as it boils down to throw chaff, move out the way of the missile, fire with a stinger. 
Ringer. The second approach is slightly more interesting, but one that I actually see as inferior to just using the chaff grenades, making it somewhat pointless. You're able to actually hide from Rex in this fight. Doing things like hiding behind objects for a while or going directly under Rex can cause Liquid to lose track of you, giving you a much easier time when getting shots off. But as I said, despite actually liking the implementation of a stealth element in this fight, something I think a lot more of the fights in this game should have taken advantage of too. It's just not as effective as taking it head on realistically. It's more of a personal choice on how you want to take it out. And that's really where most of my issues lie with Rex to be honest. When you don't know what you're doing, aka when you're not using chaff grenades, it can be a very tedious fight. Missiles knocking you over every five seconds, not being able to position your stinger correctly because you're getting shot at. Just annoying. But when you do know how to beat this thing, the fight boils down to something a lot more repetitive and genuinely quite easy, despite the overwhelming size of it. I think I'll always have mixed feelings about this fight to be honest. I did beforehand and feel that even more so when replaying it. I think the highest amount of praise I can give to this fight is that it's not overly difficult and actually works well, considering the fights on a much larger scale compared to anything else, both in terms of the boss itself as well as the area you're fighting in. You could have naturally assumed they wouldn't know how to handle this scenario properly, but despite my criticisms, it's undeniable they actually pull it off, and pretty damn well when putting it back into the context of a PlayStation 1 game. A genuinely brilliant design from Rex, with fluid animations, all being played out in-game, and a fight against a Metal Gear which has had hands down the best and most intimidating setup out of all three games we've touched on up to this point. The biggest surprise comes when we actually defeat Rex, or at least that's what we initially think. Just as we think we've bested it, Rex comes back online, with Grey Fox coming in just as Snake's about to be stepped on and saving his life. Great Fox, the name from long ago. It sounds better than Deep Throat. The cutscene which plays out past this point features some fantastic action between Grey Fox and Metal Gear, as well as some lines of dialogue which give some clarity on Naomi and Fox's relationship, and also a very subtle but important foreshadowing to what Snake's going to be like in the following games. That comes in the form of a single line delivered by Fox, one which sounds fairly insignificant at the time. The terrible Snake, you haven't aged well. We'll eventually find this isn't a figure of speech. Fox is one of the first people in the entire series we come face to face with, and by the time we reach Metal Gear Solid, this being a game that's set only 10 years after Metal Gear 1, he's saying that Snake's aged badly. Bearing in mind too that Snake at this point is supposed to be 33, there shouldn't really be any signs that he's getting old. That's an aspect we'll save for later however, here it's just an offhand comment. Instead, putting more focus on Fox's upbringing of Naomi, not in fact being her actual brother, but instead living out a life due to a guilty conscience, with Fox being the one who killed her parents. I'm the one who killed her parents. I was young then, and couldn't bring myself to kill her too. I felt so bad that I decided to take her with me. I raised her like she was my own blood, to soothe my guilty conscience. Even now she thinks of me as her brother. Fox. From the outside, we might have seemed like a happy brother and sister, but every time I looked at her, I saw her parents' eyes staring back at me. Tell her for me. Tell her that I was the one who did it. Fox sacrifices himself to distract Liquid, getting a great moment in between where we're given back control for a second to try and launch a stinger missile at Metal Gear, with Snake outright refusing to bow down to the player's commands, saying he can't do it. Snake has done a full 180 by this point, being almost emotionless when the game began, and now feeling so strongly attached to someone like Grey Fox that he refuses the player's inputs and misses out on a great opportunity to take out Rex and Liquid. The only thing I will say about this is that unlike the cutscenes before and after it, this part is actually unskippable, which can be really annoying if you end up dying and have to restart the boss again. With Fox being well and truly killed for good this time, it makes the prospect of destroying Rex even more unfathomable. If the cyborg ninja can't take this thing, down, how the hell are we supposed to? The sense of dread that's being employed here being backed up well by the downright bizarre animalistic screams which Rex begins making. Fox! 
There's not much to really say about the second part of this fight, however. We're going up against the same attacks from before, with the only real difference being the target we're aiming at, now being switched to Liquid, who presents himself in the open mouth of Rex. After that, Rex is down, collapsing and letting out a huge explosion, resulting in Snake being knocked out and subsequently being dragged on top of Rex by Liquid. I think the cutscenes we get from this point on are about the most long-winded we see in the game. But yet again, I think it's actually appropriate here compared to many other moments in the future, which has almost every cutscene be this exact same length. This is a string of cutscenes which play at the end of the game to tie up loose ends, and give more clarity to elements which may have only been briefly touched on. You need to give this stuff some time. Liquid continues to show how his ultimate goals are to basically carry on Big Boss's dying wishes, a world which promotes a perpetual cycle of war, wanting fighters to be acknowledged as important and as heroes, instead of having no kinds of fighter at all, as opposed to wiping out war in its entirety, something which sounded like the world was on the brink of doing in Metal Gear 2. Big Boss, and in this case, Liquid, only think of the minority, which are just like them. The motivations are quite selfish and self-centered when you think about them, people with no other reason to live than fighting. A rehabilitation process which could attempt to integrate these fighters back into a life without fighting seems completely abstract to someone like Liquid. It's either they're valued as a soldier or thrown to the wayside. Liquid wants accolades, he wants to be recognized as a valuable member of society. In a way, you could say his genes are outright preventing him from living a normal life. He was programmed to be this way. Yet again, he could be recognized as useful for something outside of merely fighting, but that just doesn't seem like a possibility in his mind. Liquid exposes an undeniable truth about Snake, which he has no choice but to accept. That being the fact that despite claiming he doesn't want to live in a world of endless war, his actions don't match up with those claims. You enjoy all the killing. That's why. What? Are you denying it? Haven't you already killed most of my comrades? That was... <laughs> I watched your face when you did it. It was filled with the joy of battle. You're wrong. There's a killer inside you. You don't have to deny it. We were created to be that way. He actively enjoys his time out on the battlefield, and worst of all, he enjoys the killing. There's a slight meta aspect to this moment as well. Just like we've enjoyed our time killing enemies and bosses, these feelings translate to Snake as well. The combat high appears to be just as addictive as any type of actual drug. For as much as you can pass this stuff off as being in Snake's genes, much like Liquid does, it doesn't really matter. This is just the type of person he is. As Liquid points out, despite being lied to at every turn by his superiors, with Snake knowing full well early on, they were actually the ones behind Rex's development, he continues to fight for them. This is where prior speculation becomes full-on fact, when Liquid begins divulging even deeper into Les Enfants Terribles, now being confirmed as a project, not just a turn of phrase. The project itself is very similar to the plan Liquid was trying to replicate with the Genome Soldiers, wanting Big Boss's DNA to enhance the soldiers through gene therapy. The difference here, of course, is that these soldiers were already alive, whereas Snake and Liquid were being created from birth to be the world's most powerful soldiers. And what better model to use than Big Boss, the world's greatest living soldier, becoming a lot more obvious now that although Liquid refers to Big Boss as father, both him and Snake are more like outright clones of Big Boss, as opposed to sons. But as they were produced via the Super Baby method, a technique which allowed eight clones of Big Boss to develop by merging one of his cells with a female egg, they were still born like any regular child. You and I were originally octuplets. Octuplets? Yes. The other six of our brothers were sacrificed to make us. We were accomplices in murder before the day we were even born. Liquid harbors a hatred for both the project itself and a resentment for Snake, because as he said earlier, there was further experimentation which made it so Liquid had Big Boss's recessive genes and Snake had his dominant ones. Liquid was the experiment and Snake was the ultimate soldier. Kojima toys around with another real world conflict, this time being the Gulf War, focusing on a strange phenomena that came out of this conflict known as Gulf War Syndrome. This is something which is still discussed to this day and much like Liquid explains, revolves around soldiers coming back from the Gulf War with unexplainable illnesses. Numerous causes have been thrown out, which Liquid actually mentions here, possibly being a side effect from chemical weapons like nerve gas which were being used. Or, as Snake says, the depleted uranium which was used in anti-tank rounds, this also being a real-world fact. Tying it into the fictional events of Metal Gear, however, Liquid explains the syndrome was a byproduct of the soldier genes which had been put into the soldiers, this being the first wide-scale experiment to create a genome soldier. Liquid begins wrapping up his monologue by recognizing 
how important his genes are to him, claiming that you can't fight them, and it's fate to follow what your genes signify you to be, something which Snake obviously disagrees with, proving this straight away when Meryl gets thrown into the mix, showing care immediately, as he always has. When his genes should make it so, he has no interest in saving her at all. Liquid informs us the Pentagon already knows their prize machine, that being Rex, is destroyed, telling us to call up the Colonel for more details. This is something that I've always found strange in the Metal Gear games. Despite being fairly grounded, I'd say Metal Gear Solid 1 more than any other. There's a weird immersion break when it comes to these codecs sometimes. This one isn't that bad, considering Liquid has literally told us to call him up. But later on, you'll eventually see us having codec calls which last upwards of 5 minutes, when in the midst of a battle, or a conversation with someone who's physically in front of us. It's another part which is very gamey, something I don't have a massive issue with, but one that when analysing it, reveals how strange it actually is. The codec is the equivalent of a pause button basically. The fact you can use it in the middle of a boss fight, which in reality would mean putting your finger up to your ear and talking for a while, just shows it's an element which isn't supposed to be wholly realistic. There's no explanation in terms of why this happens of course. As a kid, I always assumed the codec was some kind of technological revolution, which made it so full-blown conversations could happen in only a matter of seconds in real time. But that's not the case. Anyways, the colonel tells us the Secretary of Defense has now taken over the operation, planning to nuke Shadow Moses to remove all risk of any information involved in our operation being leaked into the public. The colonel redeems himself here, after telling us all the lies he's been feeding us throughout the game were all in exchange for Meryl's life, with her purposely being placed on Shadow Moses just before the Foxhound takeover, so he'd order Snake to do things without giving any answers to his pertinent questions. However, the colonel doesn't have time to call off the bombing run, being taken away and replaced with the defense secretary. Roy Campbell has been relieved of duty. This is the Secretary of Defense, Jim Houseman. Put the colonel back on. Moments like this make me realize how well everything gets set up in this game compared to the previous two, a lot of it being born from the better technology we're working with. The voice acting draws us closer to the characters, the artwork and the codec calls is far more stylized, and small details like seeing the characters actually move their mouths and talk makes them feel like more than just cardboard cutouts. It made me think while playing about the emotional beats they tried to pull towards the end of Metal Gear 1 and 2 and how they failed miserably both times. In Metal Gear Solid, they excel in that regard. Every element I just mentioned feeds into making all the intentional narrative beats feel impactful. There's not particularly anything I can pick out in this game as feeling awkward or clunky. Whenever a desired effect is aiming to be achieved, they knock it out of the park every time. For example, just like here, we've been talking to the Colonel from start to finish, so naturally we already have a much closer bond with him, but hearing about his selfless act of trying to stop the bomb run, and opening up about the reason behind his lies throughout the game, while it may be sudden, makes total sense, giving us an immediate sense of sympathy for the Colonel, which is only enhanced by how likeable Meryl is too. In a way, because we personally want to save Meryl, it makes more sense to us why the Colonel did what he did to save her as well. With the Secretary of Defense being painted out as a figure on the same level as evil and corrupt as Liquid, it reinforces the idea of there being no heroes or villains in war. Snake is about as isolated as he's ever been at this point, a brother standing in front of him wanting his blood, and his own country attempting to drop a nuke on him. I love how maniacal Liquid proves himself to be at this point, his mind so focused on fate and destiny that he appears to be reveling in everything that's happening. He's aware of everything the defense secretary just told us. We're gonna get nuked, the media will be told it was a terrorist force which did it, and everything will soon be forgotten. But Liquid doesn't seem to care, untying Snake, and instead deciding that he wants to settle their sibling rivalry once and for all. Do you see this? It will be the time limit for our final battle. This nuclear module is set to detonate at the precise moment of her death. This takes us to a one-on-one -on -one brawl on top of Metal Gear Rex, the arena here being one of my favourites in the game. The tight, cramped environment works perfectly for the close quarters encounter this is, and you'll discover quickly this is pretty much the Grey Fox fight from Metal Gear 2 done to much greater effect. First off, there's a brilliant sense of urgency here from the nuclear device which Liquid activates, giving us a 3 minute time limit to finish the battle. On your first attempt, this timer is actually even shorter, being 2 minutes and 30 seconds, but if you end up failing, the timer's reset to 3 minutes 
units by default. I think this is a much fairer encounter than the Grey Fox Brawl, and one that's also a lot more satisfying to win. I like the stakes a lot more here anyway. The potential nuke being set off if we don't win in time is already tense, but obviously, I think the cutscenes which preceded this also make the target of Liquid a more personal threat, while also not wanting to fall at the hands of the American government either. It once again has that major underdog mentality, which makes us want to root for Snake even more. The fight itself is simplistic, but about the best the hand-to-hand -hand combat gets across the game. It's definitely not too difficult in my opinion. You'll find starting off, the Liquid tends to run to the corners of Rex, and basically just wait for you to punch him. As the fight goes on, however, he starts throwing in new moves, dodging out the way of your shots and countering. Despite starting slow, it develops into a pretty balanced encounter, and I think that in itself is a very balanced decision in the first place, considering the short time limit we've got here. It lets players deal quite a bit of damage off the bat, before making things a bit harder as the fight goes on. I haven't really got any complaints about this fight, outside of things we're already aware of. Yes, the hand-to-hand -hand combat here isn't the deepest or most satisfying thing to use, but it's functional, and that's all that I think matters here. My favourite part of this fight is how it genuinely is more of a fight against the clock compared to anything else. Liquid is very durable and takes a lot of hits to put down, and although Snake's a bit more fragile, it's not Liquid's damage output that should really concern the player here. More so, it should be the time they're wasting whenever Liquid gets a hit off, with every hit either knocking us to the ground, in which it takes us a few seconds to get back up. Or, if you're really unlucky, you'll be knocked over the side of Rex, taking an even longer time to pull yourself back up. Overall, it's a pretty epic showdown. I don't really have anything negative to say about it. The only thing I will say is something I don't personally feel, but I imagine some people do, which is the somewhat sudden nature of all these events that are transpiring. I think Liquid is set up brilliantly throughout the game, and this final section, where we learn about his true motives and how he's tied to us, is delivered really well in my opinion. But I won't deny the fact, it's somewhat feeding into what I said about a lot of information getting thrown at the player in one large go. As I've already said, I think the stakes are set up well because of all the information we're given prior to the fight, but the majority of that information has come about in the last 30 minutes. In reality, we don't actually interact with Liquid for most of the game's runtime. Again, I don't perceive this as an issue personally because of how it's all delivered in the context of the game overall, but I could see other people having issues with it. You're out of With Liquid down, Meryl's shown to be alive and well, where both hers and Snake's relationship is revealed to be a romantic one, which I mean we could have pretty much guessed to begin with anyways. A call with Otacon shows that he's willing to potentially sacrifice himself to help Snake and Meryl escape. I'll take care of security along your escape route too. What are you going to do? Me? I... I'll stay here. Are you crazy? I need a little more time to take care of your escape route. In which I have to say again, after everything we've been through, having Otacon as this incredibly likeable and helpful ally just proves to be so satisfying in a narrative sense. He may not be the powerful mercenary like we are, but every opportunity where he's able to help out, he always does. There's no lies or double crossing from someone like Otacon. He's a genuine soul in the midst of a nightmare. With no time for any more romance, Snake and Meryl make a dash for the exit, leading into a somewhat awesome ending, but I'd have a hard time saying that I think the ending car sequence is flawless. You both hop into a car and go full speed towards the exit, with Meryl driving and Snake on the back manning the machine gun. Visually once again, I think everything is brilliant, something which as we reach the end of the game is one of the many consistent qualities which the game never lets up on. I love the speed in which we're travelling here, with the environment moving past us at such a high speed, it's almost a blur. The devastating impact of the machine gun we're using is primarily conveyed through the guards we fire at, with blood bursting out of them, while also being able to take them out very efficiently. It's it's a large pool of ammo we've got here, something we've not been privy to over the course of the game, as well as the bassy, almost ground-shaking sound it makes when firing. We're not out of the woods yet. There is one thing I'll say though, I'm not a fan of the controls here. For as much as I love mowing down guards and blowing up explosive barrels to destroy barriers, this gun turns slow as hell, pairing that up with the fact Snake flings his entire body backwards when taking any damage, and you're having to do things like continually looking to the right hand side, as when Meryl sweeps in for you to clear a path, she always does it that way. That's not a huge issue, and none of this really is. The turning's always something that's bugged me though, especially when you get situations like this, where it's almost impossible to avoid taking 
damage because the guards spread themselves so far out. Everything gets extra awesome when Liquid is revealed to not be dead, charging at you from behind. This is just a full-on set piece. In no way does it even feel like a fight, but that's never bothered me. Unloading huge amounts of lead on Liquid is just about the most appropriate way I could see this game wrapping up, but things are made quite a bit more interesting due to Liquid actively retaliating with a machine gun of his own, as well as swerving his car all over the place. And Jesus Christ, some of the shots we get here are brilliant. Some wonderfully cinematic shots are shown off here, and they're all played out in-game, like when Liquid positions himself on the other side of the road, while several pillars continually cloud both of your visions. Just great stuff. Both cars end up crashing, and just as it seems the almost unstoppable Liquid is about to murder both Snake and Meryl, the Fox Die virus appears to strike at the perfect time, giving us the straight-up iconic Fox Die line delivered by both brothers. <sighs> Despite being such a grounded game when you break it down, focusing on real-world issues with fantastical elements scattered in to not make the game utterly dull, we appear to have a happy ending. The Colonel managed to get in contact with the President, having the Secretary of Defense put under arrest and the bombing run on Shadow Moses cancelled. There are still some loose ends hanging in the balance, however, which we end up finding out when switching over to Naomi. Snake shows compassion towards Naomi by not telling her about Grey Fox murdering her parents. But he had one last message he wanted to say to you. He told me to tell you to forget about him, and to go on with your own life. Frankie said that? Yeah. He also said he'll always love you. As she told us, Fox is the only family she'd ever known. Even with her injecting Snake with the Fox Die virus and wanting him dead, he decides to let her feel as if there was someone in her life who truly cared for her, and just someone who she knew was related to her. It's a different point to whether you think this is the right call or not, but I've got a feeling that now Snake knows a lot more about his own origins, and also feels like he's got a sudden, impending heart attack coming his way. He's doing more for the people around him, Snake by this point fully surpassing any expectations of directly following his genes, choosing to break away from his father and brother, and not choosing conflict and war over all else. As for the fox die itself, Snake's told by Naomi to simply live his life with the remaining time he's got left, not giving him any estimation on when the fox die has been programmed to kill him. That being quite a standard message of living your life to the fullest, but having more of an impact considering it's being told to Snake specifically, someone who before this game appeared to have no other motivations outside of getting a job done, and killing anyone who tries to get in his way. Liquid was right in a way, Snake enjoyed the killing, he enjoyed wiping out targets with ease, but throughout the game, we've seen him develop into something more than a mindless army grunt. His human side is starting to emerge, and that's what's sort of summed up in the final cutscenes we see here. The first of which has Naomi talking about genes once again, reaffirming the stance that despite genes supposedly having a human's fate written into them, it's not as simple as that. I told you before, the reason that I was interested in genes and DNA, because I wanted to know who I was, where I came from. Her personal mission was to find out about her past through her genes and DNA, and yet, when doing so, learned absolutely nothing which could apply to how she lived her life from that point on. Naomi's speech is one all about freedom and choosing your own path in life. Just because Snake has the same genetic code as Big Boss doesn't mean he has to repeat the same mistakes he did. A prime example obviously being Liquid, who after attempting to make his own out of heaven, lies dead in the snow. It's not a message that I find to be complex in any way, but it doesn't have to be. It's all about spending your time on Earth Earth, doing what you personally think is worthwhile. It's being kind to one another, sharing, loving, and passing these things down to the next generation. With Snake and Meryl prepared to set off into the unknown together, Snake says it's time to stop living only for himself, but instead to live for someone else, someone like Meryl. Until today, I've lived only for myself. Survival has been the only thing I cared about in my life. That's not just you, that's how everyone is. I only felt truly alive when I was staring death in the face. I don't know. Maybe it's written into my genes. What about now? What do your genes say about your future now? Maybe it's time I live for someone else. Someone else? Yeah. Someone like you. Maybe that's the real way to live. 
reflecting this transformation immediately, Snake breaks out of his disgruntled, objective-focused mindset and tells Meryl to call him David. The mission's over, there's no need to use code names anymore, and with that, David and Meryl ride off into the sunset. Let's enjoy life. Kojima just couldn't let you go that easy though, putting up some genuinely scary final messages on screen. In the 1980s, there were more than 60,000 nuclear warheads in the world at all times. The total destructive power amounted to 1 million times that of the Hiroshima A-bomb, enough to destroy the world 10 times over basically. Start 2 was signed, and the United States and Russia agreed to reduce the number of deployed strategic nuclear warheads, somewhere in the range of 3 to 3,500 in each nation. But as of 1990, there still exist 26,000 nuclear warheads in the world. Damn scary in my opinion, because as you might imagine with this figure being placed in 1998, the chance of these decreasing seems like a very far out concept. The figures were given shows they reduced them, yes, but nothing is stopping them from creating more. That's the issue, but even with the removal of all these nuclear weapons, the mindsets and ideologies haven't changed. They know how to make them, and that's all that matters when a nation finds itself in a tight spot. A quick search online reveals that in 2020, there's apparently around 12,500 currently in the world, although that figure varies quite significantly depending on where you look. I will say though, Kojima did a very good job over the course of the game to not trust this kind of information anyway. Even the devastating number of 26,000 nuclear warheads most likely pales in comparison to the ones which aren't accounted for. I find Metal Gear Rex almost as a symbol of this idea. You have weapons which are held publicly, ones that appear to be weapons of mass destruction, which seem to be completely outmatched and overshadowed by the ones we don't hear about, the ones which are branded as conspiracy by media organisations which are told to keep the public in check. All this talk leads perfectly into MGS2, as we'll come to find. But wrapping up our time with Metal Gear Solid 1, we end the main game off with a post credit sequence, being reminded that although Liquid's dead, Ocelot is still alive. And these final pieces of dialogue prove his character to be one of the most unpredictable oddballs in the franchise. After all he's done over the course of the game, staying loyal to Liquid and attempting to carry through his plan to the best of his ability. It turns out that he was in the pocket of another party this entire time. Some wild things get thrown out here. Snake is said to be the one who actually has Big Boss's recessive genes, with Liquid being fed a lie the entire time. Perhaps so the dominant genes would be far more effective, in the case that Liquid tries with all his might to complete his objectives, thinking that he's got a handicap as opposed to the upper hand. The final insane thing we hear is that not only is Ocelot working for someone called Solidus, who by his name and how Ocelot refers to him as the third one, lets us know there's a third child of Big Boss in the mix. But even more concerning, Solidus is revealed to be the President of the United States. Thank you. Goodbye, Mr. President making his decision to call off the nuclear strikes and arresting of the defense secretary even more questionable. There's some grand plan at work here, but we won't find that out until MGS2. Anyways, that wraps up Metal Gear Solid. And overall, if you wanted to call this game a masterpiece, I'd have quite a hard time arguing with you. Over the course of the game, it proves itself to still hold up incredibly well, primarily down to its gameplay. The obvious thing you could pick out as being outdated is the graphics. They're pixely and give the player a hard time when trying to identify some of the more minute details in the environment. But but it's that environment itself which I think makes up for it. The art direction here is just unbelievable. From the settings, the scenery, the weaponry and the items, Metal Gear Solid has a distinct style from start to finish. The story I still find to be captivating, touching on some very heavy subjects while at the same time not getting too bogged down in them. Unlike many people criticise some of the future games for, but MGS1 is first and foremost a game. A game with a heavy emphasis on its story, but one that utilises its format to max potential. The music and sound is brilliant across the board, with the music in particular being even more varied compared to Metal Gear 1 and 2, while at the same time using the idea of themes incredibly well to solidify certain areas and scenarios with particular music. You hear the music out of context and you can immediately apply the context yourself solely because of your previous association with it. Metal Gear Solid is a fantastic experience from start to finish. It presents brand new innovations to the stealth game format the series already helped popularise, has a story that's striking and relates to real world events, which will make you stop and 
and think about your life outside of the game. And it has the Psycho Mantis vibe. That alone puts this game far and above many others in my eyes. Before we move on though, there is still some other unlocks we can take advantage of here. One of the main ones being that alternate ending I talked about way back, where if you submit during the torture sequence, Meryl actually does die, and is replaced with Otacon in the final moments of the game. I appreciate the inclusion of this, and it's definitely an impactful switch when looking at this game outside of the series. However, as we'll eventually come to find, this is actually the non-canon ending of the game. As way down the line in MGS4, characters like Meryl were still revealed to be alive. A nice alternate ending, but one that doesn't really hold up that well. There's also several completion bonuses here when deciding to start a new game on an old save file. Completing the game once with Meryl gives you the bandana, allowing you to have infinite ammo for any weapon when it's equipped, and completing it with Otacon gives you the stealth camouflage, pretty much letting you run through the entire game without ever being seen. Doing both endings results in you being given the tuxedo, a charming little well done for experiencing the game to its max potential basically, while obviously being a callback to the suave James Bond character which clearly inspired this game's direction to quite a large degree. Much like Metal Gear 1 and 2, you're also given a number of rankings at the end of the game, the highest accolade being the big boss rank that you might want to aim for if you're looking to be a true master of stealth. For me, completing the game with hardly any alerts, kills and under 3 hours on extreme seems borderline insane, but it's there if you want to go for it. You've also got the VR missions, which I mean extra content sure, but I've pretty much always hated these. They lack any of the atmosphere from the main game. You're in this random patch of land in the middle of a void. It's just so boring to me. Not to mention that although these do get a tad more interesting the more missions you complete, the fact you're locked into doing ones like walk to this objective with one enemy on screen just doesn't encourage me to keep on playing. There was even a full-blown expansion pack solely focused on VR missions, featuring 300 missions, which I'll admit do have a bit more variation to them, not just having basic objectives revolved around reaching a goal or killing enemies, but ones like the mystery section, which has us apprehending guards who've stolen someone's mask. Or how about the Revenge of Janola, where we're made to shoot down two giant guards. It's a bit of a shame to be honest. I won't deny, there's a lot of good stuff to find here. It's just the fact you've got to wade through so much lifeless crap to get to it. Being able to play as Grey Fox, for example, amazing idea. But everything is still so lifeless that it doesn't interest me personally. For someone else though, who wants to experience more gameplay without being hamstrung by the story, and especially for those who want scenarios that are curated for particular weaponry, like the Nikita and PSG-1, which don't get used that much during the main game, the VR missions might just scratch that itch. So, MGS1, a landmark moment in gaming history, a game that was not only popular, but critically acclaimed too, setting itself up perfectly for a sequel, and one that we'd see only three years later. Just another reminder that much like I haven't touched on the NES versions of Metal Gear 1 and 2, I'm not particularly going to focus on any other ports of future Metal Gear games either. What I'm aiming to mainly focus on are games that are both important to the Metal Gear franchise in terms of story, gameplay, and technological developments, and ultimately just focusing on what the intended experience is for whatever Metal Gear entry I'm talking about. The one I'm classing as the intended experience in my case being the one that Kojima had his hands on. Make no mistake, Kojima isn't everything when it comes to the creation of the Metal Gear games, but as I've said, he's the closest the game industry has to an auteur. You can actively feel when he's not involved in a Metal Gear project, taking me nicely to a small diversion related to a spin-off Metal Gear game released a year prior to MGS2, on the Game Boy Color of all devices, this being Metal Gear Solid Ghost Babble, a non-canon game that while only having Kojima involved as a producer, not a designer or writer, I still want to touch on for a second, due to it not just being a port of Metal Gear Solid, but an original game made specifically for the Game Boy, and this is a game that unlike I initially thought, clearly has a substantial amount of care put into it. This isn't some lame spin-off made with zero effort. From the opening cutscene, we can already see the games taking several notes from the innovations found in Metal Gear Solid, while obviously catering to the technological drawbacks the Game Boy presents. The pixel art we see for the character models is great, being essentially identical to what we see in Metal Gear 2, and that's ultimately the game I compare this to most. It's like a more refined Metal Gear 2 that, let's not forget, is now portable. When getting into the gameplay, I think the developers really excel when transporting the stealth gameplay back to the top-down, screen-by-screen environments of Metal Gear 1 and 2. First off, the bright colours which are present here look excellent. There's a very clear focus on the colour aspect of the Game Boy Colour, being what I'd say is the most vibrant a Metal Gear games appeared as of yet. Snake himself is so much nicer to control compared to the first two Metal Gears. His animations are smooth, bullets are shot out rapidly from his weapons now, he can turn diagonally, that being the most wanted inclusion for me in the first two Metal Gears. You haven't got any voice acting of course, but that's obviously fine, because once again, we're working with very limited hardware. The story, for me, is not really a priority, so 
something which might sound like it would destroy any Metal Gear related project, but it's not an issue for me personally. It's nothing we're not accustomed to when playing the previous games, basically. You swap out the new characters, like Chris and Weasel, for Meryl and Master Miller, or the Galluade base we infiltrate without a Heaven or Shadow Moses, and you've ultimately got the same exact kind of plot from before. Terrorists have stolen Metal Gear, guards and bosses stand in our way. The experience rests on the gameplay for me. Something you've got to think about is the portability here, and how the game's been crafted to cater to that aspect. Now, a lot of people may disagree with me on this, but I've developed the mindset that if you're looking to achieve the full intended experience from a game, as long as it's not one that solely relies on you going out and about while playing, like Pokemon Go, you simply won't get its full potential if you're playing on a handheld. There's something about the idea of playing it while outside, which has always been so distracting. The way portable consoles are advertised is a sort of 10 minutes of fun before you reach a destination, sort of the equivalent of reading a book while on the subway, or playing Angry Birds while on the bus. What I'm saying is, I don't think I've ever experienced anything on a handheld console, which couldn't have been further enhanced by getting made on a regular console or PC. That's the thing though, as I said at the start, that's primarily because of aspects like the story. I can't truly get sucked into an experience when I know I'm going to have to put the game down in a second, and that's one of Ghost Babble's really strong aspects. The different areas of the game are segmented into stages, giving you the perfect opportunity to stop, save, and pick the game back up later on. And ultimately, when it does try to go for something a bit more ambitious, it genuinely exceeds my expectations. Overall, I think Ghost Babble was a pretty great experience all round. I can understand why there's somewhat of a cult following behind this game, claiming it's one of the best Metal Gear games ever made. I wouldn't necessarily agree, but I'd say gameplay-wise, it's hands down the best 2D Metal Gear. The visuals are fantastic, the gameplay is damn smooth and carries the Metal Gear formula over quite faithfully, while also streamlining some elements to better suit the device it's playing on. And ultimately, if you want some Metal Gear stealth action on the go, Ghost Babble is still the best option to go for in my opinion. Just don't expect to be mind blown by the story or anything. <laughs>